The History of the Standard Oil Company by Ida M. Tarbell, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Weiss. Preface this work is the outgrowth of an effort on the part of the editors of McClure's magazine to deal concretely in their pages with the trust question. In order that their readers might have a clear and succinct notion of the processes by which a particular industry passes from the control of the many to that of the few, they decided a few years ago to publish a detailed narrative of the history of the growth of a particular trust. The Standard Oil Trust was chosen for obvious reasons. It was the first in the field, and it has furnished the methods, the charter, and the traditions for its followers. It is the most perfectly developed trust in existence, that is, it satisfies most nearly the trust ideal of entire control of the commodity in which it deals. Its vast profits have led its officers into various allied interests, such as railroads, shipping, gas, copper, iron, steel, as well as into banks and trust companies, and to the acquiring and solidifying of these interests it has applied the methods used in building up the oil trust. It has led in the struggle against legislation directed against combinations, its power in state and federal government, in the press, in the college, in the pulpit, is generally recognized. The perfection of the organization of the standard, the ability and daring with which it has carried out its projects, make it the preeminent trust of the world the one whose story is best fitted to illuminate the subject of combinations of capital. Another important consideration with the editors in deciding that the Standard Oil Trust was the best adapted to illustrate their meaning was the fact that it is one of the very few business organizations of the country whose growth could be traced in trustworthy documents. There is in existence just such documentary material for a history of the Standard Oil Company as there is for a history of the Civil War, or the French Revolution, or any other national episode which has divided men's minds. This has come about largely from the fact that almost constantly since its organization in 1870, the Standard Oil Company has been under investigation by the Congress of the United States, and by the legislatures of various states in which it has operated, on the suspicion that it was receiving rebates from the railroads and was practicing methods in restraint of free trade. In 1872, and again in 1876, it was before congressional committees. In 1879, it was before examiners of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and before committees appointed by the legislatures of New York and of Ohio for investigating railroads. Its operations figured constantly in the debate which led up to the creation of the Interstate Commerce Commission in 1887, and again and again since that time the Commission has been called upon to examine directly or indirectly into its relation with the railroads. In 1888, in the investigation of trust conducted by Congress and by the State of New York, the Standard Oil Company was the chief subject for examination. In the State of Ohio between 1882 and 1892, a constant warfare was waged against the Standard in the courts and legislature resulting in several volumes of testimony. The legislatures of many other states concerned themselves with it. This hostile legislation compelled the trust to separate into its component parts in 1892, but investigation did not cease. Indeed, in the last great industrial inquiry, conducted by the commission appointed by President McKinley, the Standard Oil Company was constantly under discussion and hundreds of pages of testimony on it appear in the nineteen volumes of reports which the Commission has submitted. This mass of testimony, all of it submitted under oath it should be remembered, contains the different charters and agreements under which the Standard Oil Trust has operated, many contracts and agreements with railroads, with refineries, with pipelines, and it contains the experiences in business from 1872 up to 1900 of multitudes of individuals. These experiences have exactly the quality of the personal reminiscences of actors in great events, with the additional value that they were given on the witness stand, 
and it is fair, therefore, to suppose that they are more cautious and exact in statements than many writers of memoirs are. These investigations, covering as they do all of the important steps in the development of the trust, include full accounts of the point of view of its officers in regard to that development, as well as their explanations of many of the operations over which controversy has arisen. Hundreds of pages of sworn testimony are found in these volumes from John D. Rockefeller, William Rockefeller, Henry M. Flagler, H. H. Rogers, John D. Archbald, Daniel O'Day, and other members of the concern. Aside from the great mass of sworn testimony accessible to the student, there is a large pamphlet literature dealing with different phases of the subject, and there are files of the numerous daily newspapers and monthly reviews supported by the oil regions, in the columns of which are to be found not only statistics, but full reports of all controversies between oil men. No complete collection of this voluminous printed material has ever been made, but several small collections exist, and in one or another of these I have been able to find practically all of the important documents relating to the subject. Mrs. Roger Sherman of Titusville, Pennsylvania, owns the largest of these collections, and in it are to be found copies of the rarest pamphlets. Louis Emery, Jr. of Bradford, the late E. G. Patterson of Titusville, the late Henry D. Lloyd, author of Wealth vs. Commonwealth, William Hassan of Oil City, and P. C. Boyle, the editor of the Oil City Derrick, have collections of value, and they have all been most generous in giving me access to their books. But the documentary sources of this work are by no means all printed. The Standard Oil Trust and its constituent companies have figured in many civil suits, the testimony of which is still in manuscript in the files of the courts where the suits were tried. These manuscripts have been examined on the ground, and in numerous instances full copies of affidavits and of important testimony have been made for permanent reference and study. I have also had access to many files of private correspondence and papers, the most important being that of the officers and council of the Petroleum Producers Union from 1878 to 1880, that covering the organization from 1887 to 1895, of the various independent companies which resulted in the Pure Oil Company, and that containing the material prepared by Roger Sherman for the suit brought in 1897 by the United States Pipeline against certain of the standard companies under the Sherman Antitrust Act. As many of the persons who have been active in the development of the oil industry are still living, their help has been freely sought. Scores of persons in each of the great oil centers have been interviewed, and the comprehension and interpretation of the documents on which the work is based have been materially aided by the explanations which the actors in the events under consideration were able to give. When the work was first announced in the fall of 1901, the Standard Oil Company, or perhaps I should say officers of the company, courteously offered to give me all the assistance in their power, an offer of which I have freely taken advantage. In accepting assistance from Standard men as from independents, I distinctly stated that I wanted facts, and that I reserved the right to use them according to my own judgment of their meaning, that my object was to learn more perfectly what was actually done, not to learn what my informants thought of what had been done. It is perhaps not too much to say that there is not a single important episode in the history of the Standard Oil Company, so far as I know it, or a notable step in its growth which I have not discussed more or less fully with officers of the company. It is needless to add that the conclusions expressed in this work are my own. I am T. End of Preface Chapter 1, Part 1, The Birth of an Industry One of the busiest corners of the globe at the opening of the year 1872 was a strip of northwestern Pennsylvania not over fifty miles long known the world over as the oil regions. Twelve years before, this strip of land had been but little better than a wilderness. Its chief inhabitants, the lumbermen, who every season cut great swaths of primeval pine and hemlock from its hills, and in the spring floated them down the Allegheny River to Pittsburgh. 
The great tides of western emigration had shunned the spot for years as too rugged and unfriendly for settlement, and yet in twelve years this region avoided by men had been transformed into a bustling trade center, where towns elbowed each other for place, into which three great trunk railroads had built branches, and every foot of whose soil was fought for by capitalists. It was the discovery and development of a new raw product, petroleum, which had made this change from wilderness to marketplace. This product in twelve years had not only peopled a waste place of the earth, it had revolutionized the world's methods of illumination, and added millions upon millions of dollars to the wealth of the United States. Petroleum, as a curiosity, and indeed in a small way as an article of commerce, was no new thing when its discovery in quantities called the attention of the world to this corner of northwestern Pennsylvania. The journals of many an early explorer of the valleys of the Allegheny and its tributaries tell of springs and streams, the surfaces of which were found covered with a thick oily substance which burned fiercely when ignited, and which the Indians believed to have curative properties. As the country was opened, more and more was heard of these oil springs. Certain streams came to be named from the quantities of the substance found on the surface of the water, as Oil Creek in northwestern Pennsylvania, Old Greasy or Kanawha in West Virginia. The belief in the substance as a cure-all increased as time went on, and in various parts of the country it was regularly skimmed from the surface of the water as cream from a pan, or soaked up by woolen blankets bottled and peddled as a medicine for man and beast. Up to the beginning of the nineteenth century no oil seems to have been obtained except from the surfaces of springs and streams. That it was to be found far below the surface of the earth was discovered independently at various points in Kentucky, West Virginia, Ohio, and Pennsylvania by persons drilling for salt water to be used in manufacturing salt. Not infrequently the water they found was mixed with a dark green, evil-smelling substance which was recognized as identical with the well-known rock oil. It was necessary to rid the water of this before it could be used for salt, and in many places cisterns were devised in which the brine was allowed to stand until the oil had risen to the surface. It was then run into the streams or on the ground. This practice was soon discovered to be dangerous, so easily did the oil ignite. In several places, particularly in Kentucky, so much oil was obtained with the salt water that the wells had to be abandoned. Certain of these deserted salt wells were opened years after, when it was found that the troublesome substance which had made them useless was far more valuable than the brine the original drillers sought. Naturally, the first use made of the oil obtained in quantities from the salt wells was medicinal. By the middle of the century it was without doubt the great American medicine. Seneca oil seems to have been the earliest name under which petroleum appeared in the East. It was followed by a large output of Kentucky petroleum sold under the name American Medicinal Oil. Several hundred thousand bottles of this oil are said to have been put up in Burkesville, Kentucky, and to have been shipped to the East and to Europe. The point at which the business of bottling petroleum for medicine was carried on most systematically and extensively was Pittsburgh. Near that town at Tarantum in Allegheny County were located salt wells owned and operated in the forties by Samuel M. Keir. The oil which came up with the salt water was sufficient to be a nuisance, and Mr. Keir sought a way to use it. Believing it had curative qualities, he began to bottle it. By 1850 he had worked up this business until Keir's petroleum, or rock oil, was sold all over the United States. The crude petroleum was put up in eight-ounce bottles, wrapped in a circular setting forth in good patent medicine style, its virtues as a cure-all, and giving directions about its use. While it was admitted to be chiefly a liniment, it was recommended for cholera morbus, liver complaint, bronchitis and consumption, and the dose prescribed was three teaspoonfuls three times a day. Mr. Keir's circulars are crowded with testimonials of the efficacy of rock oil, dated anywhere between 1848 and 1853. Although his trade in this oil was so extensive, 
he was not satisfied that petroleum was useful only as a medicine. He was interested in it as a lubricator and a luminant. That petroleum had the qualities of both had been discovered at more than one point before 1850. More than one mill-owner in the districts where petroleum had been found was using it in a crude way for oiling his machines or lighting his works. But though the qualities of both lubricator and luminant were present, the impurities of the natural oil were too great to make its use general. Mr. Keir seems to have been the first man to have attempted to secure an expert opinion as to the possibility of refining it. In 1849 he sent a bottle of oil to a chemist in Philadelphia, who advised him to try distilling it and burning it in a lamp. Mr. Keir followed the advice, and a five-barrel still which he used in the fifties for refining petroleum is still to be seen in Pittsburgh. His trade in the oil he produced at his little refinery was not entirely local, for in 1858 we find him agreeing to sell to Joseph Coffin of New York at sixty-two and a half cents a gallon one hundred barrels of carbon oil that will burn in the ordinary coal oil lamp. Although Mr. Keir seems to have done a good business in rock oil, neither he nor anyone else up to this point had thought it worth while to seek petroleum for its own sake. They had all simply sought to utilize what rose before their eyes on springs and streams, or came to them mixed with the salt water for which they drilled. In 1854, however, a man was found who took rock oil more seriously. This man was George H. Bissell, a graduate of Dartmouth College who, worn out by an experience of ten years in the South as a journalist and teacher, had come north for a change. At his old college the latest curiosity of the laboratory was shown him, the bottle of rock oil, and the professor contended that it was as good or better than coal for making illuminating oil. Bissell inquired into its origin and was told that it came from oil springs located in northwestern Pennsylvania on the farm of a lumber firm, Brewer, Watson & Company. These springs had long yielded a supply of oil which was regularly collected and sold for medicine and was used locally by mill owners for lighting and lubricating purposes. Bissell seems to have been impressed with the commercial possibilities of the oil, for he at once organized a company, the Pennsylvania Rock Oil Company, the first in the United States, and leased the lands on which these oil springs were located. He then sent a quantity of the oil to Professor Silliman of Yale College and paid him for analyzing it. The professor's report was published and received general attention. From the rock oil might be made as good an illuminant as any the world knew. It also yielded gas, paraffin, lubricating oil. In short, declared Professor Silliman, your company have in their possession a raw material from which, by simple and not expensive process, they may manufacture very valuable products. It is worthy of note that my experiments prove that nearly the whole of the raw product may be manufactured without waste, and this solely by a well-directed process which is in practice in one of the most simple of all chemical processes. The oil was valuable, but could it be obtained in quantity great enough to make the development of so remote a locality worthwhile? The only method of obtaining it known to Mr. Bissell and his associates in the new company was from the surface of oil springs. Could it be obtained in any other way? There has long been a story current in the oil regions that the Pennsylvania Rock Oil Company received its first notion of drilling for oil from one of those trivial incidents which so often turn the course of human affairs. As the story goes, Mr. Bissell was one day walking down Broadway when he halted to rest in the shade of an awning before a drug store. In the window he saw on a bottle a curious label. Here's petroleum, or rock oil, it read. Celebrated for its wonderful curative powers, a natural remedy, produced from a well in Allegheny County, P.A., four hundred feet below the earth's surface, etc. On the label was the picture of an artesian well. It was from this well that Mr. Keir got his natural remedy. Hundreds of men had seen the label before, for it went out on every one of Mr. Keir's circulars, but this was the first to look at it with a seeing eye. 
as quickly as the bottle of rock oil in the Dartmouth laboratory had awakened in Mr. Bissell's mind the determination to find out the real value of the strange substance, the label gave him the solution of the problem of getting oil in quantities. It was to bore down into the earth where it was stored and pump it up. Professor Silliman made his report to the Pennsylvania Rock Oil Company in 1855 but it was not until the spring of 1858 that a representative of the organization, which by this time had changed hands and was known as the Seneca Oil Company, was on the ground with orders to find oil. The man sent out was a small stockholder in the company, Edwin L. Drake, Colonel Drake, as he was called. Drake had had no experience to fit him for his task. A man forty years of age, he had spent his life as a clerk an express agent, and a railway conductor. His only qualifications were a dash of pioneer blood and a great persistency in undertakings which interested him. Whether Drake came to Titusville ordered to put down an artesian well or not is a mooted point. His latter-day admirers claimed that the idea was entirely his own. It seems hardly credible that men as intelligent as Professor Silliman, Mr. Bissell, and others interested in the Pennsylvania Rock Oil Company, should not have taken means of finding out how the familiar Kears rock oil was obtained. Professor Silliman at least must have known of the quantities of oil which had been obtained in different states in drilling salt wells. Indeed, in his report, he speaks of well sunk for the purpose of accumulating the product. In the American Journal of Science for 1840, of which he was one of the editors, is an account of a famous oil well struck near Burtsville, Kentucky, about 1830 when drilling for salt. It seems probable that the idea of seeking oil on the lands leased by the Petroleum Rock Oil Company by drilling artesian wells had long been discussed by the gentlemen interested in the venture, and that Drake came to Titusville with instructions to put down a well. It is certain, at all events, that he was soon explaining to his superiors at home the difficulty of getting a driller, an engine-house and tools, and that he was employing the interval in trying to open new oil springs and make the old ones more profitable. The task before Drake was no light one. The spot to which he had been sent was Titusville, a lumberman's hamlet on Oil Creek, fourteen miles from where that stream joins the Allegheny River. Its chief connection with the outside world was by a stage to Erie, forty miles away. This remoteness from civilization, and Drake's own ignorance of artesian wells, added to the general skepticism of the community concerning the enterprise, caused great difficulty and long delays. It was months before Drake succeeded in getting together the tools, engine and rigging necessary to bore his well, and before he could get a driller who knew how to manipulate them, winter had come, and he had to suspend operations. People called him crazy for sticking to the enterprise, but that had no effect on him. As soon as spring opened, he borrowed a horse and wagon and drove over a hundred miles to Tarantum, where Mr. Keir was still pumping his salt wells and was either bottling or refining the oil which came up with the brine. Here Drake hoped to find a driller. He brought back a man, and after a few months more of experiments and accidents, the drill was started. One day, late in August, 1859, Titusville was electrified by the news that Drake's folly, as many of the onlookers had come to consider it, had justified itself. The well was full of oil. The next day a pump was started, and twenty-five barrels of oil were gathered. There was no doubt of the meaning of the Drake well in the minds of the people of the vicinity. They had long ago accepted all Professor Silliman had said of the possibilities of petroleum, and now that they knew how it could be obtained in quantity, the whole countryside rushed out to obtain leases. The second well in the immediate region was drilled by a Titusville tanner, William Barnsdall, an Englishman who at his majority had come to America to make his fortune. He had fought his way westward, watching always for his chance. The day the Drake well was struck he knew it had come. Quickly forming a company he began to drill a well. He did not wait for an engine, but worked his drill through the rock by a spring pole. It took 
three months and cost three thousand dollars to do it, but he had his reward. On February 1, 1860, he struck oil, twenty-five barrels a day, and oil was selling at eighteen dollars a barrel. In five months the English tanner had sold over sixteen thousand dollars worth of oil. A lumberman and merchant of the village, who long had faith in petroleum if it could be had in quantity, Jonathan Watson, one of the firm of Brewer Watson and Company, whose land the Pennsylvania Rock Oil Company had leased, mounted his horse as soon as he heard of the Drake Well, and riding down the valley of Oil Creek, spent the day in leasing farms. He soon had the third well of the region going down, this too by a spring pole. This well started off in March at sixty gallons a minute, and oil was selling at sixty cents a gallon. In two years the farm where this third well was struck had produced a hundred and sixty-five thousand barrels of oil. Working an unfriendly piece of land a few miles below the Drake well lived a man of thirty-five. Setting out for himself at twenty-two, he had won his farm by the most dogged efforts working at sawmills, saving his earnings, buying a team, working it for others until he could take up a piece of land, hoarding his savings here. For what? How could he know? He knew well enough when Drake struck oil, and hastened out to buy a share in a two-acre farm. He sold it at a profit, and with the money put down a well, from which he realized seventy thousand dollars. A few years later the farm he had slaved to win came into the field, in 1871 he refused a million dollars for it, and at one time he had stored there two hundred thousand barrels of oil. A young doctor who had buried himself in the wilderness saw his chance. For a song he bought thirty-eight acres on the creek, six miles below the Drake Well, and sold half of it for the price he had paid to a country storekeeper and lumberman of the vicinity, one Charles Hyde. Out of this thirty-eight acres millions of dollars came. One well alone, the maple shade, cleared one and one-half millions. On every rocky farm, in every poor settlement of the region, was some man whose ear was attuned to fortune's call, and who had the daring and the energy to risk everything he possessed in an oil lease. It was well that he acted at once, for as the news of the discovery of oil reached the open, the farms and towns of Ohio, New York, and Pennsylvania poured out a stream of ambitious and vigorous youth, eager to seize what might be there for them, while from the East came men with money and business experience, who formed great stock companies, took up the lands in parcels of thousands of acres, and put down wells along every rocky run and creek as well as over the steep hills. In answer to their drill, oil poured forth in floods. In many places pumping was out of the question. The wells flowed two thousand, three thousand, four thousand barrels a day, such quantities of it that at the close of 1861 oil, which in January of 1860 was $20 a barrel, had fallen to ten cents. Here was the oil, and in unheard-of quantities, and with it came all the swarm of problems which a discovery brings. The methods Drake had used were crude and must be improved. The processes of refining were those of the laboratory and must be developed. Communication with the outside world must be secured. Markets must be built up. Indeed, a whole new commercial machine had to be created to meet the discovery. These problems were not realized before the region teemed with men to wrestle with them, men alive to the instant need of things. They had to begin with so simple and elementary a matter as devising something to hold the oil. There were not barrels enough to be bought in America, although turpentine barrels, molasses barrels, whiskey barrels, every sort of barrel and cask, were added to new ones made especially for oil. Reservoirs excavated in the earth and faced with logs and cement, and box-like structures of planks or logs were tried at first, but were not satisfactory. A young Iowa schoolteacher and farmer, visiting at his home in Erie County, went to the region. Immediately he saw his chance. It was to invent a receptacle which would hold oil in quantities. Certain large producers listened to his scheme and furnished money to make a trial tank. 
it was a success, and before many months the schoolteacher was buying thousands of feet of lumber, employing scores of men, and working them and himself day and night. For nearly ten years he built these wooden tanks. Then seeing that iron tanks, huge receptacles holding thousands of barrels of oil where his held hundreds, were bound to supersede him, he turned, with the ready adaptability which characterized the men of the region, to producing oil for others to tank. After the storing problem came that of transportation. There was one waterway leading out, Oil Creek as it had been called for more than a hundred years, an uncertain stream running the length of the narrow valley in which the oil was found and uniting with the Allegheny River at what is now known as Oil City. From this junction it was 132 miles to Pittsburgh and a railroad. Besides this waterway were rough country roads leading to the railroads at Union City, Quarry, Erie, and Meadville. There was but one way to get the oil to the bank of Oil Creek or to the railroads, and that was by putting it into barrels and hauling it. Teamsters equipped for this service seemed to fall from the sky. The farms for a hundred miles around gave up their boys and horses and wagons to supply the need. It paid. There were times when three or even four dollars a barrel were paid for hauling five or ten miles. It was not too much for the work. The best roads over which they traveled were narrow, rough, unmade highways, mere openings to the outer world, while the roads to the wells they themselves had to break across fields and through forests. These roads were made almost impassable by the great number of heavily freighted wagons traveling over them. From the big wells a constant procession of teams ran, and it was no uncommon thing for a visitor to the oil regions to meet oil caravans of a hundred or more wagons. Often these caravans were held up for hours by a dangerous mud hole into which a wheel had sunk or a horse fallen. If there was a possible way to be made around the obstruction, it was taken, even if it led through a farmer's field. Indeed, a sort of guerrilla warfare went on constantly between the farmers and the teamsters. Often the roads became impassable, so that new ones had to be broken, and not even a shotgun could keep the driver from going where the passage was least difficult. The teamster, in fact, carried a weapon which few farmers cared to face, his terrible black snake, as his long, heavy black whip was called. The man who had once felt the cruel lash of a black snake around his legs did not often oppose the owner. With the wages paid him, the teamster could easily become a kind of plutocrat. One old producer tells of having a teamster in his employ, who for nine weeks drew only enough of his earnings to feed himself and horses. He slept in his wagons and tethered a team. At the end of the time he thought he'd go home for a clean shirt and ask for a settlement. It was found that he had nineteen hundred dollars to his credit. The story is a fair illustration both of the habits and the earnings of the Oil Creek Teamsters indispensable to the business, they became the tyrants of the region, working and brawling as suited them, a genius not unlike the flatboat men who once gave color to life on the Mississippi, or the cowboys who make the plains picturesque today. Bad as their reputation was, many a man found in their ranks the start which led later to wealth and influence in the oil business. One of the shrewdest, kindest, oddest men the oil regions ever knew Wesley Chambers, came to the top from the teamster class. He had found his way to the creek after eight years of unsuccessful gold hunting in California. There's my chance, he said, when he saw the lack of teams and boats, and he set about organizing a service for transporting oil to Pittsburgh. In a short time he was buying horses of his own and building boats. Wide awake to actualities, he saw a few years later that the teamster and the boat were to be replaced by the pipeline and the railroad, and forestalled the change by becoming a producer. In this problem of transportation the most important element after the team was Oil Creek and the flatboat. A more uncertain stream never ran in a bed. In the summer it was low, in the winter frozen. Now it was gorged with ice now running mad over the flats. 
the best service was gotten out of it in time of low water through artificial freshets. Mill dams, controlled by private parties, were frequent along the creek and its tributaries. By arrangement these dams were cut on a certain day or days of the week, usually Friday, and on the flood or freshet the flatboats loaded with barrels of oil were floated downstream. The freshet was always exciting and perilous and frequently disastrous. From the points where they were tied up the boatmen watched the coming flood and cut themselves loose the moment after its head had passed them. As one fleet after another swung into the roaring flood the danger of collision and jams increased. Rare indeed was the freshet when a few wrecks did not lie somewhere along the creek and often scores lay piled high on the bank, a hopeless jam of broken boats and barrels, the whole soaked in petroleum and reeking with gas and profanity. If the boats rowed safely through to the river there was little further danger. The Allegheny River traffic grew to great proportions. Fully one thousand boats and some thirty steamers were in the fleet, and at least four thousand men. This traffic was developed by men who saw here their opportunity of fortune, as others had seen it in drilling or teaming. The foremost of these men was an Ohio River captain, driven northward by the war, one J. J. Vandergrift. Captain Vandergrift had run the full gamut of river experiences, from cabin boy to owner and commander of his own steamers. The war stopped his Mississippi River trade. Fitting up one of his steamers as a gunboat, he turned it over to Commodore Foote and looked for a new stream to navigate. From the oil region at that moment the loudest cry was for barrels. He towed four thousand empty casks up the river, saw at once the need of some kind of bulk transportation, took his hint from a bulk boat which an ingenious experimenter was trying, ordered a dozen of them built, towed his fleet to the creek, bought oil to fill them, and then returned to Pittsburgh to sell his cargo. On one alone he made seventy thousand dollars. But the railroad soon pressed the river hard. At the time of the discovery of oil three lines, the Philadelphia and Erie, the Buffalo and Erie, now the Lake Shore, connecting with the Central, and the Atlantic and Great Western connecting with the Erie, were within teeming distance of the region. The points at which the Philadelphia and Erie Road could be reached were Erie, forty miles from Titusville, Union City, twenty-two miles, and Corey, sixteen miles. The Buffalo and Erie were reached at Erie, the Atlantic and Great Western were reached at Meadville, Union City, and Corey, and the distances were twenty-eight, twenty-two, and sixteen miles, respectively. Erie was the favorite shipping point at first, as the wagon road in that direction was the best. The amount of freight the railroads carried the first year of the business was enormous. Of course, connecting lines were built as rapidly as men could work. By the beginning of 1863 the Oil Creek Road, as it was known, had reached Titusville from Corey. This gave an eastern connection by both the Philadelphia and Erie and the Atlantic and Great Western, but as the latter were constructing a branch from Meadville to Franklin, the Oil Creek Road became the feeder of the former principally. Both of these roads were completed to Oil City by 1865. The railroads built, the vexatious time-taking and costly problem of getting the oil from the well to the shipping point still remained. The teamster was still the tyrant of the business. His day was almost over. He was to fall before the pipeline. The feasibility of carrying oil in pipes was discussed almost from the beginning of the oil business. Very soon after the Drake well was struck, oil man began to say that the natural way to get this oil from the wells to the railroads was through pipes. In many places gravity would carry it. Where it could not, pumps would force it. The belief that this could be done was so strong that as early as February 1862 a company was incorporated in Pennsylvania for carrying oil in pipes or tubes from any point on Oil Creek to its mouth or to any station on the Philadelphia and Erie Railroad. This company seems never to have done more than get a charter. In 1863 at least three short pipelines were put into operation. The first of these was a two-inch pipe through which distillate was pumped a distance of three miles from the Warren refinery at Plumer to Warren's Landing on the Allegheny River. 
The one which attracted the most attention was a line two and one-half miles in length carrying crude oil from the tar farm to the Humboldt refinery at Plumer. Various other experiments were made, both gravity and pumps being trusted for propelling the oil, but there was always something wrong. The pipes leaked or burst, the pumps were too weak. Shifting oil centers interrupted experiments which might have been successful. Then suddenly the man for the need appeared, Samuel Van Sickle. He came to the creek in 1864 with some money, hoping to make more. He handled quantities of oil produced at Pithole, several miles from a shipping point, and saw his profits eaten up by teamsters. Their tyranny aroused his ire and his wits, and he determined to build a pipeline from the wells to the railroad. He was greeted with jeers, but he went doggedly ahead, laid a two-inch pipe, put in three relay pumps, and turned in his oil. From the start the line was a success, carrying eighty barrels of oil an hour. The day that the Van Sickle pipeline began to run oil, a revolution began in the business. After the Drake Well, it is the most important event in the history of the oil regions. The Teamsters saw its meaning first and turned out in fury, dragging the pipe, which was for the most part buried to the surface, and cutting it so that the oil would be lost. It was only by stationing an armed guard that they were held in check. A second line of importance, that of Abbott and Harley, suffered even more than that of Van Sickle. The Teamsters did more than cut the pipe. They burned the tanks in which oil was stored, laid in wait for employees, threatened with destruction the wells which furnished the oil, and so generally terrorized the country that the governor of the state was called upon in April 1866 to protect the property and men of the lines. The day of the Teamster was over, however, and the more philosophical of them accepted the situation. Scores disappeared from the region, and scores more took to drilling. They died hard, and the cutting and plugging of pipelines was for years a pastime of the remnant of their race. End of Part 1, Chapter 1, Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com. The History of Standard Oil by Ida M. Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter One, Part Two. If the uses to which oil might be put, and the methods for manufacturing it had not been well understood when the Drake well was struck, there would have been no such imperious demand as came for the immediate opening of new territory and developing methods of handling and carrying it on a large scale. But men already knew what the oil was good for, and in a crude way how to distill it. The process of distillation also was free to all. The essential apparatus was very simple, a cast-iron still, usually surrounded by brickwork, a copper worm, and two tin or zinc-lined tanks. The still was filled with crude oil, which was subjected to a high enough heat to vaporize it. The vapor passed through a cast-iron gooseneck fitted to the top of the still into the copper worm, which was immersed in water. Here the vapor was condensed and passed into the zinc-lined tank. This product, called a distillate, was treated with chemicals washed with water, and run off into the tin-lined tank where it was allowed to settle. Anybody who could get the apparatus could make oil, and many men did, badly of course to begin with, and with an alarming proportion of waste and explosion and fires, but with experience they learned, and some of the great refineries of the country grew out of these rude beginnings. Luckily not all the men who undertook the manufacturing of petroleum in these first days were inexperienced. The chemists to whom are due chiefly the processes now used, Atwood, Gessner, and Merrill, had for many years been busy making oils from coal. They knew something of petroleum, and when it came in quantities began at once to adapt their processes to it. Merrill at the time was connected with Samuel Downer of Boston in manufacturing oil from Trinidad pitch and from coal bought in Newfoundland. The year oil was discovered, Mr. Downer distilled 7,500 tons of this coal, clearing on it at least $100,000. In 
As soon as petroleum appeared, he and Mr. Merrill saw that here was a product which was bound to displace their coal, and with courage and promptness they prepared to adapt their works. In order to be near the supply they came to Corry, fourteen miles from the Drake Well, and in 1862 put up a refinery which cost $250,000. Here were refined thousands of barrels of oil, most of which was sent to New York for export. To the Boston works the firm went crude, which was manufactured for the home trade and for shipping to California and Australia. The processes used in the downer works at this early day were in all essentials the same as are used today. In 1865 William Wright, after a careful study of petroleum, as the oil regions were then often called, published with Harper and Brothers an interesting volume in which he devotes a chapter to oil refining and refiners. Mr. Wright describes there not only the downer works at Corey, but a factory which, if much less important in the development of the oil regions, held a much larger place in its imagination. This was the Humboldt works at Plumer. In 1862 two German brothers, the Messrs. Ludovici, came to the oil country and, choosing a spot distant from oil wells, main roads, or water courses, erected an oil refinery which was reported to have cost a half million dollars. The works were built in a way unheard of then and uncommon now. The foundations were all of cut stone. The boiler and engines were of the most expensive character. A house erected in connection with the refinery was said to have been finished in hardwood with marble mantels, and furnished with rich carpets, mirrors, and elaborate furniture. The lavishness of the Humboldt refinery and the formality with which its business was conducted were long a tradition in the oil regions. Of more practical moment are the features of the refinery which Mr. Wright mentions. One is that the works had been so planned as to take advantage of the natural descent of the ground so that the oil would pass from one set of vessels to another without using artificial power, and the other that the supply of crude oil was obtained from the tar farm three miles away, being forced by pumps through pipes over the hills. Mr. Wright found some twenty refineries between Titusville and Oil City the year of his visit, 1865. In several factories that he visited they were making naphtha, gasoline, and benzene for export three grades of illuminating oils, prime white, standard white, and straw color, were made everywhere. Paraffin, refined to a pure white article like that of today, was manufactured in quantities by the downer works, and lubricating oils were beginning to be made. As men and means were found to put down wells, to devise and build tanks and boats and pipes and railroads for handling the oil, to adapt and improve process for manufacturing so men were found from the beginning of the oil business to wrestle with every problem raised. They came in shoals, young, vigorous, resourceful, indifferent to difficulties, greedy for a chance, and with each year they forced more light and wealth from the new product. By the opening of 1872 they had produced nearly forty million barrels of oil, and had raised their product to the fourth place among the exports of the United States over 152 million gallons going abroad in 1871, a percentage of the production which compares well with what goes today. As for the market, they had developed it until it included almost every country of the earth, China, the East and West Indies, South America, and Africa. Over 40 different European ports received refined oil from the United States in 1871. Nearly a million gallons were sent to Syria, about a half million to Egypt, about as much to the British West Indies, and a quarter of a million to the Dutch East Indies. Not only were illuminating oils being exported. In 1871 nearly seven million gallons of naphtha, benzene, and gasoline were sent abroad, and it became evident now for the first time that a valuable trade in lubricants made from petroleum was possible. A discovery by Joshua Merrill of the Downer Works opened this new source of wealth to the industry. Until 1869 the impossibility of deodorizing petroleum had prevented its use largely as a lubricant, but in that year Mr. Merrill discovered a process by which a deodorized lubricating oil could be made. He had both the apparatus for producing the oil 
and the oil itself patented. The oil was so favorably received that the market sale by the Downer Works was several hundred percent greater in a single year than the firm had ever sold before. The oil field had been extended from the valley of Oil Creek and its tributaries down the Allegheny River for fifty miles and probably covered two thousand square miles. The early theory that oil followed the streams had been exploded, and wells were now drilled on the hills. It was known, too, that if oil was found in the first sand struck in the drilling, it might be found still lower in a second or third sand. The Drake well had struck oil at sixty-nine and a half feet, but wells were now drilled as deep as sixteen hundred feet. The extension of the field, the discovery that oil was under the hills as well as under streams, and to be found in various sands, had cost enormously. It had been done by wildcatting, as putting down experimental wells were called, by following superstitions in locating wells, such as the witch hazel stick or the spiritualistic medium, quite as much as by studying the position of wells in existence and calculating how oil belts probably ran. As the cost of a well was from three thousand to eight thousand dollars, according to its location, and as four thousand three hundred and seventy four of the five thousand five hundred and sixty wells drilled in the first ten years of the business eighteen fifty nine to eighteen sixty nine were dry holes or were abandoned as unprofitable something of the daring it took to operate on small means as most producers did in the beginning is evident but they loved the game and every man of them would stake his last dollar on the chance of striking oil with the extension of the field rapid strides had been made in tools, in rigs, in all of the various essentials of drilling a well. They had learned to use torpedoes to open up hard rocks, naphtha to cut the paraffin which coated the sand and stopped the flow of oil, seed bags to stop the inrush of a stream of water. They lost their tools less often and knew better how to fish for them when they did. In short, they had learned how to put down and care for oil wells. Equal advances had been made in other departments. Fewer cars were loaded with barrels. Tank cars for carrying in bulk had been invented. The wooden tank, holding two hundred to twelve hundred barrels, had been rapidly replaced by the great iron tank, holding twenty thousand or thirty thousand barrels. The pipelines had begun to go directly to the wells, instead of pumping from a general receiving station, or dump as it was called, thus saving the tedious and expensive operation of hauling. From beginning to end the business had been developed, systematized, simplified. Most important was the simplification of the transportation problem by the development of pipelines. By 1862 they were the one oil gatherer. Several companies were carrying on the pipeline business and two of them had acquired great power in the oil regions because of their connections with trunk lines. These were the Empire Transportation Company and the Pennsylvania Transportation Company. The former, which had been the first business organization to go into the pipeline business on a large scale, was a concern which appeared in the oil regions not over six months before Van Sickle began to pump oil. The Empire Transportation Company had been organized in 1865, to build up an east and west freight traffic via the Philadelphia and Erie Railroad, a new line which had just been leased by the Pennsylvania. Some ten railroads connected in one way or another with the Philadelphia and Erie, forming direct routes east and west. In spite of their evident community of interest, these various roads were kept apart by their jealous fears of one another. Each insisted on its own timetable, its own rates, its own way of doing things. The shipper via this route must make a separate bargain with each road and often submit to having his freight changed at terminals from one car to another because of the difference of gauge. The Empire Transportation Company undertook to act as a mediator between the roads and the shipper to make the route cheap, fast, and reliable. It proposed to solicit freight, furnish its own cars and terminal facilities, and collect money due. It did not make rates, however it only harmonized those made by the various branches in the system. It was to receive a commission on the business secured, and a rental for the cars and other facilities it furnished. It was a difficult task the new company undertook, but it had at its head 
a remarkable man to cope with difficulties. This man, Joseph D. Potts, was in 1865 thirty-six years old. He had come of a long and honorable line of ironmasters of the Schuylkill region of Pennsylvania, but had left the great forge towns with which his ancestors had been associated, Pottstown, Glasgow Forge, Valley Forge, to become a civil engineer. His profession had led him to the service of the Pennsylvania Railroad, where he had held important positions in connection with which he now undertook the organization of the Empire Transportation Company. Colonel Potts, the title came from his service in the Civil War, possessed a clear and vigorous mind. He was far-seeing, forceful in execution, fair in his dealings. To marked ability and integrity he joined a gentle and courteous nature. The first freight which the Empire Transportation Company attacked after its organization was oil. The year was a great one for the oil regions, the year of pit holes. In January there had suddenly been struck on Pithole Creek in a wilderness six miles from the Allegheny River, a well located with a witch-hazel twig which produced two hundred and fifty barrels a day, and oil was selling at eight dollars a barrel. Wells followed in rapid succession. In less than ten months the field was doing over ten thousand barrels a day. This sudden flood of oil caused a tremendous excitement. Crowds of speculators and investors rushed to pit hole from all over the country. The Civil War had just closed, soldiers were disbanding, and hundreds of them found their way to the new oil field. In six weeks after the first well was struck, pit hole was a town of six thousand inhabitants. In less than a year it had fifty hotels and boarding houses. Five of these hotels cost fifty thousand dollars or more each. In six months after the first well the post office of Pithole was receiving upwards of ten thousand letters per day, and was counted third in size in the state, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and Pithole being the order of rank. It had a daily paper, churches, all the appliances of a town. The handling of the great output of oil from the Pithole field was a serious question. There seemed not enough cars in the country to carry it, and shippers resorted to every imaginable trick to get accommodations. When the agent of the Empire Transportation Company opened his office in June 1865 and demonstrated his ability to furnish cars regularly and in large numbers, trade rapidly flowed to him. Now the Empire Agency had hardly been established when the Van Sickle pipeline began to carry oil from Pithole to the railroad. Lines began to multiply. The railroads saw at once that they were destined speedily to do all the gathering and hasten to secure control of them. Colonel Potts's first pipeline purchase was a line running from Pithole to Titusville, which as yet had not been wet. When the Empire Transportation Company took over this line, nothing had been demonstrated but that oil could be driven by relay pumps five miles through a two-inch pipe. The Empire's first effort was to get a longer run by fewer pumps. The agent in charge, C. P. Hatch, believed that oil could be brought the entire ten and one half miles from Pithole to Titusville by one pump. He met with ridicule, but he insisted on trying it in the new line his company had acquired. The experiment was entirely successful. Improvements followed as rapidly as hands could carry out the suggestions of ingenuity and energy. One of the most important made the first year of business was connecting wells by pipe directly with the tanks at the pumping stations, thus doing away with the expensive hauling in barrels to the dump. A new device for accounting to the producer for his oil was made necessary by this change, and the practice of taking the gauge or measuring of the oil in the producer's tank before and after the run and issuing duplicate run tickets was devised by Mr. Hatch. The producers, however, were not all square. It sometimes happened that they sold oil by a transfer order of the pipeline, which they did not have in the line. To prevent these, the Empire Transportation Company, in 1868, began to issue certificates for credit balances of oil. These soon became the general mediums of trade in oil, and remain so today. One of the cleverest of the pipeline devices of the Empire Company was its assessment for waste and fire. In running oil through pipes there is more or less loss by leaking and evaporation. 
In September 1868, Mr. Hatch announced that thereafter he would deduct two percent from oil runs for wastage. The assessment raised almost a riot in the region, meetings were held, the Empire Transportation Company was denounced as a highway robber, and threats of violence were made if the order was enforced. While this excitement was in progress, there came a big fire on the line. Now, the company's officials had been studying the question of fire insurance from the start. Fires in the oil regions were as regular a feature of the business as explosions used to be on the Mississippi steamboats, and no regular fire insurance company would take the risk. It had been decided that at the first fire there should be announced what was called a general average assessment, that is, a fire tax, and to be ready blanks were prepared. Now, in the thick of the resistance to the wastage assessment came a fire, and the line announced that the producers having oil in the line must pay the insurance. The controversy at once waxed hotter than ever, but was finally compromised by the withdrawal in this case of the fire insurance if the producers would consent to the tax for waste. They did consent, and later when fires occurred the general average assessment was applied without serious opposition. Both of these practices prevail today. By the end of 1871, the Empire Transportation Company was one of the most efficient and respected business organizations in the oil country. Its chief rival was the Pennsylvania Transportation Company, an organization which had its origin in the second pipeline laid in the oil regions. This line was built by Henry Harley, a man who for fully ten years was one of the most brilliant figures in the oil country. Harley was a civil engineer by profession, a graduate of the Troy Polytechnic Institute, and had held a responsible position for some time as an assistant of General Herman Hauck in the Hoosac Tunnel. He became interested in the oil business in 1862, first as a buyer of petroleum, then as an operator in West Virginia. In 1865 he laid a pipeline from one of the rich oil farms of the creek to the railroad. It was a success, and from this venture Harley and his partner, W. H. Abbott, one of the wealthiest and most active men in the country, developed an important transportation system. In 1868 J. Gould, who as president of the Erie Road was eager to increase his oil freight, bought a controlling interest in the Abbott and Harley lines and made Harley general oil agent of the Erie system. Harley now became closely associated with Fisk and Gould, and the three carried on a series of bold and piratical speculations in oil which greatly enraged the oil country. They built a refinery near Jersey City, extended their pipeline system, and in 1871, when they reorganized under the name of the Pennsylvania Transportation Company, they controlled probably the greatest number of miles of pipe of any company in the region, and then were fighting the empire bitterly for freight. There is no part of this rapid development of the business more interesting than the commercial machine the oil men had devised in 1872 for marketing oil. A man with a thousand-barrel well in his hands in 1862 was in a plight. He had got to sell his oil at once for lack of storage room or let it run on the ground and there was no exchange, no market, no telegraph, not even a post office within his reach where he could arrange a sale. He had to depend on buyers who came to him. These buyers were the agents of the refineries in different cities or of the exporters of crude in New York. They went from well to well on horseback, if the roads were not too bad, on foot if they were, and at each place made a special bargain varying with the quantity bought and the difficulty in getting it away, for the buyer was the transporter, and, as a rule, furnished the barrels or boats in which he carried off his oil. It was not long before the speculative character of the oil trade, due to the great fluctuations in quantity, added a crowd of brokers to the regular buyers who tramped up and down the creek. When the railroads came in, the trains became the headquarters for both buyers and sellers. This was the more easily managed as the trains on the creek stopped at almost every oil farm. These trains became, in fact, a sort of traveling oil exchange, and on them a large percentage of all the bargaining of the business was done. 
The brokers and buyers first organized and established headquarters in Oil City in 1869, but there was an oil exchange in New York City as early as 1866. Titusville did not have an exchange until 1871. By this time the pipelines had begun to issue certificates for the oil they received, and the trading was done to a degree in these. The method was simple and much more convenient than the old one. The producer ran his oil into a pipeline, and for it received a certificate showing that the line held so much to his credit. This certificate was transferred when the sale was made and presented when the oil was wanted. One achievement of which the oil men were particularly proud was increasing the refining capacity of the region. At the start the difficulty of getting the apparatus for a refinery to the creek had been so enormous that the bulk of the crude had been driven to the nearest manufacturing cities, Erie, Pittsburgh, and Cleveland. Much had gone to the seaboard, too, and Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and Baltimore were all doing considerable refining. There was always a strong feeling in the oil regions that the refining should be done at home. Before the railroads came, the most heroic efforts were made again and again to get in the necessary machinery. Brought from Pittsburgh by water, as a rule, the apparatus had to be hauled from Oil City, where it had to be dumped on the muddy bank of the river, there were no wharfs, over the indescribable roads to the site chosen. It took weeks, months sometimes, to get in the apparatus. The chemicals used in the making of the oil, the barrels in which to store it, all had to be brought from outside. The wonder is that under these conditions anybody tried to refine on the creek. But refineries persisted in coming, and after the railroads came, increased. By 1872 the daily capacity had grown to nearly 10,000 barrels, and there were no more complete or profitable plants in existence than two or three of those on the creek. The only points having larger daily capacity were Cleveland and New York City. Several of the refineries had added barrel works. Assets were made on the ground. Iron works at Oil City and Titusville promised soon to supply the needs of both drillers and refiners. The exultation was great, and the press and people boasted that the day would soon come when they would refine for the world. There, in their own narrow valleys, should be made everything which petroleum would yield. Cleveland, Pittsburgh, the seaboard, must give up refining. The business belonged to the oil regions, and the oil men meant to take it. A significant development in the region was the tendency among many of the oil men to combine different branches of the business. Several large producers conducted shipping agencies for handling their own and other people's oil. The firm of Pearson Nahart was a prominent one carrying on this double business in the sixties and early seventies. J. J. Vandergriff, who has been mentioned already as one of the first men to take hold of the transportation problem, early became interested in production. As soon as the pipeline was demonstrated to be a success, he began building lines. He also added to his interest a large refinery, the Imperial of Oil City. Captain Vandergriff, by 1870, produced, transported, and refined his own oil, as well as transported and refined much of other people's. It was a common practice for a refinery in the oil regions to pipe oil directly to its works by its own line, and in 1872 one refinery in Titusville, the Octave, carried its refined oil a mile or more by pipe to the railroad. Although most of the refineries at this period sold their products to dealers and exporters, the building up of markets by direct contact with new territory was beginning to be a consideration with all large manufacturers. The Octave of Titusville, for instance, chartered a ship in 1872 to load with oil and send in charge of its own agent into South American ports. The odds against the oil men in developing the business had not been merely physical ones. There had been more than the wilderness to conquer, more than the possibilities of a new product to learn. Over all the early years of their struggle and hardships hovered the dark cloud of the Civil War. They were so cut off from men that they did not hear of the fall of Sumter for four days after it happened, and the news for the time blotted out interest even in flowing wells. 
twice at least when Lee invaded Pennsylvania, the whole business came to a standstill, men abandoning the drill, the pump, the refinery to make ready to repel the invader. They were taxed for the war, taxes rising to ten dollars per barrel in 1865, one dollar on crude and twenty cents a gallon on refined, the oil barrel is usually estimated at forty-two gallons. They gave up their quota of men again and again at the call for recruits, and when the end came and a million men were cast on the country, this little corner of Pennsylvania absorbed a larger portion of men probably than any other spot in the United States. The soldier was given the first chance everywhere at work. He was welcomed into oil companies, stock being given him for the value of his war record. There were lieutenants and captains and majors, even generals scattered all over the field, and the field felt itself honored and bragged, as it did of all things, of the number of privates and officers who immediately on disbanding had turned to it for employment. It was not only the Civil War from which the oil regions had suffered. In 1870 the Franco-Prussian War broke the foreign market to pieces and caused great loss to the whole industry, and there had been other troubles. From the first oil men had to contend with wild fluctuations in the price of oil. In 1859 it was $20 a barrel, and in 1861 it had averaged 52 cents. Two years later, in 1863, it averaged eight dollars and fifteen cents, and in eighteen sixty seven but two dollars and forty cents. In all these first twelve years nothing like a steady price could be depended on, for just as the supply seemed to have approached a fixed amount, a wildcat well would come in and knock the bottom out of the market. Such fluctuations were the natural element of the speculator, and he came early, buying in quantities, and holding in storage tanks for higher prices. If enough oil was held, or if production fell off, up went the price only to be knocked down by the throwing of great quantities of stocks on the market. The producers themselves often held their oil, though not always to their own profit. A historic case of obstinate holding occurred in 1871 on the McRae farm, the most productive field in the region at that time. Prices were hovering around three dollars, and McRae swore he would not sell under five dollars. He bought, hired, and built iron tankage until he had upward of two hundred thousand barrels. There was great loss from leakage and from evaporations, and there were taxes, but McRae held on, refusing four dollars, four dollars and fifty cents, and even five dollars. Evil times came in the oil region soon after, and with them dollar oil. McCrae finally was obliged to sell his stocks at about a dollar twenty cents per barrel. To develop a business in face of such fluctuations and speculations in the raw product took not only courage, it took a dash of the gambler. It never could have been done, of course, had it not been for the streams of money which flowed unceasingly and apparently from choice into the regions. In 1865, Mr. Wright calculated that the oil country was using a capital of one hundred million dollars. In 1872 the oil men claimed the capital in operation was two hundred million dollars. It has been estimated that in the first decade of the industry nearly three hundred and fifty million dollars was put into it. Speculation in oil stock companies was another great evil. It reached its height in 1864 and 1865, the flush times of the business. Stocks in companies whose holdings were hardly worth the stamps on the certificates were sold all over the land. In March 1865, the aggregate capital of the oil companies whose charters were on file in Albany, New York, was $350 million, and in Philadelphia alone in 1864 and 1865, 1,000 oil companies, mostly bogus, are said to have been formed. These swindles were dignified by the names of officers of distinction in the United States Army, for the war was coming to an end, and the name of a general was the most popular and persuasive argument in the country. Of course, there came a collapse. The oil bubble burst in 1866, 
and it was nothing but the irrepressible energy of the region which kept the business going in the panic which followed. Then there was the disturbing effect of foreign competition. What would become of them if oil was found in quantities in other countries? A decided depression of the market occurred in 1866, when the government sent out reports of developments of foreign oil fields. If there was oil in Japan, China, Burma, Persia, Russia, Bavaria, in the quantities the government reports said, why, there was trouble in store for Pennsylvania, the oil men argued, and for a day the market fell. It was only for a day. Men forgot easily in the oil regions in the sixties. An evil in their business which they were only beginning to grasp fully in 1871 was the unholy system of freight discrimination which the railroads were practicing. Three trunk lines competed for the business by 1872. The Pennsylvania, which at least the Philadelphia and Erie, the Erie, and the Central. The latter road reached the oil regions by a branch from Ashtabula on the Lake Shore and Michigan Southern Division to Oil City. This branch was completed in 1868. The Pennsylvania claimed the oil traffic as a natural right, for the oil regions were in Pennsylvania, and did not Tom Scott own that state? The Erie Road for about five years had been in the hands of those splendid pirates, Jay Gould and Jim Fisk. Naturally, they took all they could get of the oil traffic and took it by freebooting methods. Corners and rings were their favorite devices for securing trade, and more than once their aid had carried through daring and unscrupulous speculations in oil. The Central in this period was waging its famous desperate war on the Erie, Commodore Vanderbilt having marked that highway for his own along with most other things in New York State. All three of the roads began as early as 1868 to use secret rebates on the published freight rates in oil as a means of securing traffic. This practice had gone on until in 1871 any big producer, refiner, or buyer could bully a freight agent into a special rate. Those on the inside those who had poles also secured special rates. The result was that the open rate was enforced only on the innocent and the weak. Serious as all these problems were, there was no discouragement or shrinking from them. The oil men had rid themselves of bunco men and burst the oil bubbles. They had harnessed the brokers in exchanges and made strict rules to govern them. They had learned not to fear the foreigners or to take with equal sang -froid the dry hole which made them poor, or the gusher which made them rich. For every evil they had a remedy. They were not afraid even of the railroads, and loudly declared that if the discriminations were not stopped they would build a railroad of their own. Indeed the evils in the oil business in 1871, far from being a discouragement, rather added to the interest. They had never known anything but struggle, with conquest, and twelve years of it was far from cooling their ardor for a fair fight. More had been done in the oil regions in the first dozen years than the development of a new industry. From the first there had gone with the oil men's ambition to make oil to light the whole earth, a desire to bring civilization to the wilderness from which they were drawing wealth, to create an orderly society from the mass of humanity which poured pell-mell into the region. A hatred of indecency first drew together the better element of each of the rough communities which sprang up. Whiskey sellers and women flocked to the region at the breaking out of the excitement. Their first shelters were shanties built on flatboats which were towed from place to place. They came to Rooseville, a collection of pine shanties and oil derricks built on a muddy flat, as forlorn and disreputable a town in appearance as the earth ever saw. They tied up for trade, and the next morning woke up from their brawl to find themselves twenty miles away, floating down the Allegheny River. Rooseville meant to be decent. She had cut them loose, and by such summary vigilance she kept herself decent. Other towns adopted the same policy. By common consent, vice was corralled largely in one town. Here a whole street was given up to dance houses and saloons and those who must have a spree were expected to go to Petroleum Center to take it. Decency and schools. Vice cut adrift, 
they looked for a schoolteacher. Children were sadly out of place, but there they were, and these men, fighting for a chance, saw to it that a shanty with a schoolteacher in it was in every settlement. It was not long, too, before there was a church, a union church. To worship God was their primal instinct, to defend a creed, a later development. In the beginning every social contrivance was wanting. There were no policemen, and each individual looked after evildoers. There were no firemen, and every man turned out with a bucket at a fire. There were no bankers, and each man had to put his wealth away as best he could until a peripatetic banker from Pittsburgh relieved him. At one time Dr. Egbert, a rich operator, is said to have had one million eight hundred thousand dollars in currency in his house. There were no hospitals, and in 1861, when the horrible possibilities of the oil fire were first demonstrated by the burning of the Rouse Well, a fire at which nineteen persons lost their lives, the many injured found welcome and care for long weeks in the little shanties of women already overburdened by the difficulties of caring for families in the rough community. Out of this poverty and disorder they had developed in ten years a social organization as good as their commercial. Titusville, the hamlet on whose outskirts Drake had drilled his well, was now a city of ten thousand inhabitants. It had an opera house where in 1871 Clara Louise Kellogg and Christine Nilsson sang, Joe Jefferson and Janoshek played, and Wendell Phillips and Bishop Simpson spoke. It had two prosperous and fearless newspapers. Its schools prepared for college. Oil City was not behind, and between them was a string of lively towns. Many of the oil farms had a decent community life. The Columbia Farm kept up a library and reading room for its employees. There was a good schoolhouse used on Sunday for services, and there was a Columbian farm band of no mean reputation in the oil regions. Indeed, by the opening of 1872, life in the oil regions had ceased to be a mere makeshift. Comforts in orderliness and decency, even opportunities for education and for social life, were within reach. It was a conquest to be proud of, quite as proud of as they were of the fact that their business had been developed until it had never before, on the whole, been in so satisfactory a condition. Nobody realized more fully what had been accomplished in the oil regions than the oil men themselves. Nobody rehearsed their achievements so loudly. In ten years, they were fond of saying, we have built this business up from nothing to a net product of six millions of barrels per annum. We have invented and devised all the apparatus, the appliances, the forms needed for a new industry. We use a capital of two hundred million and support a population of sixty thousand people. To keep up our supply we drill one hundred new wells per month at an average cost of six thousand dollars each. We are fourth in the exports of the United States. We have developed a foreign market, including every civilized country on the globe, but what had been done was, in their judgment, only a beginning. Life ran swift and ruddy and joyous in these men. They were still young, most of them under forty, and they looked forward with all the eagerness of the young who have just learned their powers to years of struggle and development. They would solve all these perplexing problems of overproduction, of railroad discrimination, of speculation. They would meet all their own needs. They would bring the oil refining to the region where it belonged. They would make their towns the most beautiful in the world. There was nothing too good for them, nothing they did not hope and dare. But suddenly, at the very heyday of this confidence, a big hand reached out from nobody knew where to steal their conquest and throttle their future. The suddenness and the blackness of the assault on their business stirred to the bottom their manhood and their sense of fair play, and the whole region arose in a revolt which is scarcely paralleled in the commercial history of the United States. End of chapter one. Recording by Tom Weiss. Tom's Audiobooks dot com.
Chapter Two, Part One of the History of the Standard Oil Company. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Two: The Rise of the Standard Oil Company. The chief refining competitor of Oil Creek in 1872 was Cleveland, Ohio. Since 1869, that city had done annually more refining than any other place in the country. Strung along the banks of the Walworth and Kingsbury runs, the creeks to which the city frequently banishes her heavy and evil-smelling burdens, there had been since the early sixties from twenty to thirty oil refineries. Why they were there, more than two hundred miles from the spot where the oil was taken from the earth, a glance at a map of the railroads will show. By rail and water, Cleveland commanded the entire western market. It had two trunk lines running to New York, both eager for oil traffic, and by Lake Erie and the canal it had for a large part of the year a splendid cheap waterway. Thus at the opening of the oil business Cleveland was destined by geographical position to be a refining center. Men saw it and hastened to take advantage of the opportunity. There was grave risk. The oil supply might not hold out. As yet there was no certain market for refined oil. But a sure result was not what drew people into the oil business in the early sixties. Fortune was running fleet-footed across the country, and at her garment men clutched. They loved the chase almost as they did success, and so many a man in Cleveland tried his luck in an oil refinery, as hundreds on Oil Creek were trying it in an oil lease. By 1865 there were thirty refineries in the town, with a capital of about a million and a half dollars and a daily capacity of some two thousand barrels. The works multiplied rapidly. The report of the Cleveland Board of Trade for 1866 gives the number of plants at the end of that year as fifty, and it dilates eloquently on the advantages of Cleveland as a refining point over even Pittsburgh to that time supposed to be the natural center for the business. If the railroad and lake transportation men would but adopt as liberal a policy toward the oil freights of Cleveland as the Pennsylvania Railroad was adopting toward that of Pittsburgh, aided by her natural advantages, the town was bound to become the greatest oil refining center in the United States. By 1868 the Board of Trade reported joyfully that Cleveland was receiving within 300,000 barrels as much oil as Pittsburgh. In 1869 she surpassed all competitors. Cleveland now claims the leading position among the manufacturers of petroleum with a very reasonable prospect of holding that rank for some time to come, commented the Board of Trade report. Each year has seen greater consolidation of capital, greater energy and success in prosecuting the business, and notwithstanding some disastrous fires, a stronger determination to establish an immovable reputation for the quantity and quality of this most important product. The total capital invested in this business is not less than four millions of dollars, and the total product of the year would not fall short of fifteen millions. Among the many young men of Cleveland who, from the start, had an eye on the oil refining business, and had begun to take an active part in its development as soon as it was demonstrated that there was a reasonable hope of its being permanent, was a young firm of produce commission merchants. Both members of this firm were keen businessmen, and one of them had remarkable commercial vision, a genius for seeing the possibilities in material things. This man's name was Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller. He was but twenty-three years old when he first went into the oil business, but he had already got his feet firmly on the business ladder and had got them there by his own efforts. The habit of driving good bargains and of saving money had started him. He himself once told how he learned these lessons so useful in money-making in one of his frequent Sunday school talks to young men on success in business. The value of a good bargain he learned in buying cordwood for his father. I knew what a cord of good solid beech and maple wood was. My father told me to select only the solid wood and the straight wood, and not to put any limbs in it or any punky wood. That was a good training for me. I did not need any father to tell me or anybody else 
how many feet it took to make a cord of wood. And here is how he learned the value of investing money. Among the early experiences that were helpful to me that I recollect with pleasure was one in working a few days for a neighbor in digging potatoes, a very enterprising, thrifty farmer who could dig a great many potatoes. I was a boy of perhaps thirteen or fourteen years of age, and it kept me very busy from morning until night. It was a ten-hour day, and as I was saving these little sums I soon learned that I could get as much interest for fifty dollars loaned at seven per cent, the legal rate in the state of New York at that time for a year, as I could earn by digging potatoes for one hundred days. The impression was gaining ground with me that it was a good thing to let the money be my slave and not make myself a slave to money. Here we have the foundation principles of a great financial career. When young Rockefeller was thirteen years old, his father moved from the farm in central New York, where the boy had been born, July 8, 1839, to a farm near Cleveland, Ohio. He went to school in Cleveland for three years. In 1855 it became necessary for him to earn his own living. It was a hard year in the West, and the boy walked the streets for days looking for work. He was about to give it up and go to the country when, to quote the story as Mr. Rockefeller once told it to his Cleveland Sunday school, as good fortune would have it, I went down to the dock and made one more application, and I was told that if I would come in after dinner, our noonday meal was dinner in those days, they would see if I could come to work for them. I went down after dinner, and I got the position, and I was permitted to remain in the city. The position, that of a clerk and bookkeeper, was not lucrative. According to a small ledger which has figured frequently in Mr. Rockefeller's religious instructions, he earned from September 26, 1855, to January 1856, fifty dollars. Out of that, Mr. Rockefeller told the young men of his Sunday school class, I paid my washerwoman and the lady I boarded with, and I saved a little money to put away he proved an admirable accountant, one of the early and late sort, who saw everything, forgot nothing, and never talked. In 1856 his salary was raised to twenty-five dollars a month, and he went on always saving a little money to put away. In 1858 came a chance to invest his savings. Among his acquaintances was a young Englishman, M. B. Clark. Older by twelve years than Rockefeller, he had left a hard life in England when he was twenty to seek fortune in America. He had landed in Boston in 1847 without a penny or a friend, and it had taken three months for him to earn money to get to Ohio. Here he had taken the first job at hand, as man of all work, woodchopper, teamster. He had found his way to Cleveland, had become a valuable man in the houses where he was employed, had gone to school at nights, had saved money. They were two of a kind, Clark and Rockefeller, and in 1858 they pooled their earnings and started a produce commission business on the Cleveland docks. The venture succeeded. Local historians credit Clark and Rockefeller with doing a business of $450,000 the first year. The war came on, and as neither partner went to the front, they had full chance to take advantage of the opportunity for produce business a great army gives. A greater chance than furnishing army supplies, lucrative as most people found that, was in the oil business, so Clark and Rockefeller began to think, and in 1862, when an Englishman of ability and energy, one Samuel Andrews, asked them to back him in starting a refinery, they put in four thousand dollars and promised to give more if necessary. Now Andrews was a mechanical genius. He devised new processes, made a better and better quality of oil, got larger and larger percentages of refined from his crude. The little refinery grew big, and Clark and Rockefeller soon had one hundred thousand dollars or more in it. In the meantime, Cleveland was growing as a refining center. The business which in 1860 had been a gamble was by 1865 one of the most promising industries of the town. It was but the beginning so Mr. Rockefeller thought, and in that year he sold out his share of the commission business and put his money into the oil firm of Rockefeller and Andrews. 
In the new firm Andrews attended to the manufacturing. The pushing of the business, the buying and the selling, fell to Rockefeller. From the start his effect was tremendous. He had the frugal man's hatred of waste and disorder, of middlemen and unnecessary manipulation, and he began a vigorous elimination of these from his business. The residuum that other refineries let run into the ground he sold. Old iron found its way to the junk shop. He bought his oil directly from the wells. He made his own barrels. He watched and saved and contrived. The ability with which he made the smallest bargain furnishes topics to Cleveland storytellers today. Low-voiced, soft-footed, humble, knowing every point in every man's business, he never tired until he got his wares at the lowest possible figure. John always got the best of the bargain, old men tell you in Cleveland today, and they wince though they laugh in telling it. Smooth, a savvy fellow, is their description of him. To drive a good bargain was the joy of his life. The only time I ever saw John Rockefeller enthusiastic, a man told the writer once, was when a report came in from the creek that his buyer had secured a cargo of oil at a figure much below the market price. He bounded from his chair with a shout of joy, danced up and down, hugged me, threw up his hat, acted so like a madman that I have never forgotten it. He could borrow as well as bargain. The firm's capital was limited. Growing as they were, they often needed money, and had none. Borrow they must. Rarely, if ever, did Mr. Rockefeller fail. There was a story handed down in Cleveland from the days of Clark and Rockefeller, produce merchants, which is illustrative of his methods. One day a well-known and rich businessman stepped into the office and asked for Mr. Rockefeller. He was out and Clark met the visitor. Mr. Clark, he said, you may tell Mr. Rockefeller when he comes in that I think I can use the ten thousand dollars he wants to invest with me for your firm. I have thought it all over. Good God, cried Clark, we don't want to invest ten thousand dollars. John is out right now trying to borrow five thousand dollars for us. It turned out that to prepare him for a proposition to borrow five thousand dollars, Mr. Rockefeller had told the gentleman that he and Clark wanted to invest ten thousand dollars. And the joke of it is, said Clark, who used to tell the story, John got the five thousand dollars even after I had let the cat out of the bag. Oh, he was the greatest borrower you ever saw. These qualities told. The firm grew as rapidly as the oil business of the town and started a second refinery, William A. Rockefeller and Company. They took in a partner, H. M. Flagler, and opened a house in New York for selling oil. Of all these concerns John D. Rockefeller was the head. Finally in June 1870, five years after he became an active partner in the refining business, Mr. Rockefeller combined all his companies into one, the Standard Oil Company. The capital of the new concern was one million dollars. The parties interested in it were John D. Rockefeller, Henry M. Flagler, Samuel Andrews, Stephen B. Harkness, and William Rockefeller. The strides the firm of Rockefeller and Andrews made after the former went into it were attributed for three or four years mainly to his extraordinary capacity for bargaining and borrowing. Then its chief competitors began to suspect something. John Rockefeller might get his oil cheaper now and then, they said, but he could not do it often. He might make close contracts for which they had neither the patience nor the stomach. He might have an unusual mechanical and practical genius in his partner. But these things could not explain all. They believed they bought on the whole almost as cheaply as he, and they knew they made as good oil and with as great or nearly as great economy. He could sell at no better price than they. Where was his advantage? There was but one place where it could be, and that was in transportation. He must be getting better rates from the railroads than they were. In 1868 or 1869, a member of a rival firm long in the business, which had been prosperous from the start, and which prided itself on its methods, its economy, and its energy, Alexander Schofield and Company, went to the Atlantic and Great Western Road, then under the Erie Management, 
and complained. "'You are giving others better rates than you are us,' said Mr. Alexander, the representative of the firm. "'We cannot compete if you do that.' The railroad agent did not attempt to deny it. He simply agreed to give Mr. Alexander a rebate also. The arrangement was interesting. Mr. Alexander was to pay the open or regular rate on oil from the oil regions to Cleveland, which was then forty cents a barrel. At the end of each month he was to send to the railroad vouchers for the amount of oil shipped and paid for at forty cents, and was to get back from the railroad, in money, fifteen cents on each barrel. This concession applied only to oil brought from the wells. He was never able to get a rebate on oil shipped eastward. According to Mr. Alexander, the Atlantic and Great Western gave the rebates on oil from the oil regions to Cleveland up to 1871, and the system was then discontinued. Late in 1871, however, the firm for the first time got a rebate on the Lake Shore Road on oil brought from the field. Another Cleveland man, W. H. Doan, engaged in shipping crude oil, began to suspect about the same time as Mr. Alexander that the Standard was receiving rebates. Now, Mr. Doan had always been opposed to the drawback business, but it was impossible for him to supply his customers with crude oil at as low a rate as the Standard paid if it received a rebate and he did not and when it was first generally rumored in Cleveland that the railroads were favoring Mr. Rockefeller, he went to see the agent of the road. I told him I did not want any drawback unless others were getting it. I wanted it if they were getting it, and he gave me at that time ten cents drawback. This arrangement, Mr. Doan said, had lasted but a short time. At the date he was speaking, the spring of 1872, he had had no drawback for two years. A still more important bit of testimony as to the time when rebates first began to be given to the Cleveland refiners, and as to who first got them and why, is contained in an affidavit made in 1880 by the very man who made the discrimination. This man was General J. H. Devereux, who in 1868 succeeded Amasa Stone as vice president of the Lake Shore Railroad. General Devereux said that his experience with the oil traffic had begun with his connection with the Lake Shore, that the only written memoranda concerning oil which he found in his office on entering his new position was a book in which it was stated that the representatives of the twenty-five oil refining firms in Cleveland had agreed to pay a cent a gallon on crude oil removed from the oil regions. General Devereux says that he soon found there was a deal of trouble in store for him over oil freight. The competition between the twenty-five firms was close. The Pennsylvania was claiming a patent right on the transportation of oil and was putting forth every effort to make Pittsburgh and Philadelphia the chief refining centers. Oil Creek was boasting that it was going to be the future refining point of the world. All of this looked bad for what General Devereux speaks of as the then very limited refining capacity of Cleveland. This remark shows how new he was to the business, for as we have already seen, Cleveland in 1868 had anything but a limited refining capacity. Between three and four million dollars were invested in oil refineries, and the town was receiving within thirty-five thousand barrels of as much oil as New York City and within three hundred thousand as much as Pittsburgh and it was boasting that the next year it would outstrip these competitors, which, as a matter of fact, it did. The natural point for General Devereux to consider, of course, was whether he could meet the rates the Pennsylvania were giving and increase the oil freight for the lake shore. The road had a branch running to Franklin, Pennsylvania, within a few miles of Oil City. This he completed, and then, as he says in his affidavit, a sharper contest than ever was produced growing out of the opposition of the Pennsylvania Railroad in competition. Such rates and arrangements were made by the Pennsylvania Railroad that it was publicly proclaimed in the public print in Oil City, Titusville, and other places that Cleveland was to be wiped out as a refining center as with a sponge. General Devereux goes on to say that all the refiners of the town, without exception, came to him in alarm and expressed their fears that they would have either to abandon their business there 
or move to Titusville or other points in the oil regions, that the only exception to this decision was that offered by Rockefeller, Andrews, and Flagler, who, on his assurance that the Lakeshore Railroad could and would handle oil as cheaply as the Pennsylvania Company, proposed to stand their ground at Cleveland and fight it out on that line. And so General Devereux gave the Standard the rebate on the rate which Amasa Stone had made with all the refineries. Why he should have not quieted the fears of the twenty-four or twenty-five other refiners by lowering their rate, too, does not appear in the affidavit. At all events, the rebate had come, and, as we have seen, it soon was suspected and others went after it, and in some cases got it. But the rebate seems to have been granted generally only on oil brought from the oil regions. Mr. Alexander claims he was never able to get his rate lowered on his eastern shipments. The railroad took the position with him that if he could ship as much oil as the standard, he could have as low a rate, but not otherwise. Now, in 1870, the Standard Oil Company had a daily capacity of about 1,500 barrels of crude. The refinery was the largest in town, though it had some close competitors. Nevertheless, on the strength of its large capacity, it received the special favor. It was a plausible way to get around the theory generally held then as now, though not so definitely crystallized into law, that the railroad, being a common carrier, had no right to discriminate between its patrons. It remained to be seen whether the practice would be accepted by Mr. Rockefeller's competitors without a contest, or, if contested, would be supported by the law. What the standard's rebate on eastern shipments was in 1870, it is impossible to say. Mr. Alexander says he was never able to get a rate lower than $1.33 a barrel by rail, and that it was commonly believed in Cleveland that the standard had a rate of 90 cents. Mr. Flagler, however, the only member of the firm who had been examined under oath on that point, showed, by presenting the contract of the Standard Oil Company with the Lakeshore Road in 1870, that the rates varied during the year from a dollar forty to a dollar twenty and a dollar sixty, according to the season. When Mr. Flagler was asked if there was no drawback or rebate on this rate, he answered, none whatever. It would seem from the above as if the one man in the Cleveland oil trade in 1870 who ought to have been satisfied was Mr. Rockefeller. His was the largest firm in the largest refining center of the country, that is, of the 10,000 to 12,000 daily capacity divided among the 25 or 26 refiners of Cleveland, he controlled 1,500 barrels. Not only was Cleveland the largest refining center in the country, it was gaining rapidly, for where in 1868 it shipped 776,356 barrels of refined oil, in 1869 it shipped 923,933, in 1870 1,459,500, and in 1871 1,640,499. Not only did Mr. Rockefeller control the largest firm in this most prosperous center of a prosperous business, he controlled one of amazing efficiency. The combination in 1870 of the various companies with which he was connected had brought together a group of remarkable men. Samuel Andrews, by all accounts, was the ablest mechanical superintendent in Cleveland. William Rockefeller, the brother of John D. Rockefeller was not only an energetic and intelligent businessman, he was a man whom people liked. He was open-hearted, jolly, a good storyteller, a man who knew and liked a good horse, not too pious, as some of John's business associates thought him, not a man to suspect or fear, as many a man did John. Old oil men will tell you on the creek today how much they liked him in the days when he used to come to Oil City buying oil for the Cleveland firm. The personal quality of William Rockefeller was, and always has been, a strong asset of the Standard Oil Company. Perhaps the strongest man in the firm after John D. Rockefeller was Henry M. Flagler. He was, like the others, a young man, and one who, like the head of the firm, had the passion for money, and, in a hard self-supporting experience begun when but a boy, 
had learned as well as his chief some of the principles of making it. He was untiring in his efforts to increase the business, quick to see an advantage, as quick to take it. He had no scruples to make him hesitate over the ethical quality of a contract which was advantageous. Success, that is, making money, was its own justification. He was not a secretive man like John D. Rockefeller, not a dreamer, but he could keep his mouth shut when necessary, and he knew the worth of a financial dream when it was laid before him. It must have been evident to every businessman who came in contact with the young Standard Oil Company that it would go far. The firm itself must have known it would go far. Indeed, nothing could have stopped the Standard Oil Company in 1870, the oil business being what it was, but an entire change in the nature of the members of the firm, and they were not the kind of material which changes. With such a set of associates, with his organization complete from his buyers on the creek to his exporting agent in New York, with the transportation advantages which none of his competitors had had the daring or the persuasive power to get, certainly Mr. Rockefeller should have been satisfied in 1870. But Mr. Rockefeller was far from satisfied. He was a brooding, cautious, secretive man, seeing all the possible dangers as well as all the possible opportunities and things, and he studied, as a player at chess, all the possible combinations which might imperil his supremacy. These twenty-five Cleveland rivals of his, how could he at once and forever put them out of the game? He and his partners had somehow conceived a great idea, the advantages of combination. What might they not do if they could buy out and absorb the big refineries now competing with them in Cleveland? The possibilities of the idea grew as they discussed it. Finally they began tentatively to sound some of their rivals. But there were other rivals than these at home. There were the creek refiners. They were there at the mouth of the wells. What might not this geographical advantage do in time? Refining was going on there on an increasing scale. The capacity of the oil regions had indeed risen to nearly 10,000 barrels a day, equal to that of New York, exceeding that of Pittsburgh by nearly 4,000 barrels, and almost equaling that of Cleveland. The men of the oil country loudly declared that they meant to refine for the world. They boasted of an oil kingdom which eventually should handle the entire business and compel Cleveland and Pittsburgh either to abandon their works or bring them to the oil country. In this boastful ambition they were encouraged particularly by the Pennsylvania Railroad, which naturally handled the largest percentage of the oil. How long could the Standard Oil Company stand against this competition? There was another interest as deeply concerned as Mr. Rockefeller in preserving Cleveland's supremacy as a refining center and this was the Lake Shore and New York Central Railroads. Let the bulk of refining be done in the oil regions, and these roads were in danger of losing a profitable branch of business. This situation in regard to the oil traffic was really more serious now than in 1868 when General Devereux had first given the Standard a rebate. Then it was that the Pennsylvania, through its lusty ally the Empire Transportation Company, was making the chief fight to secure a patent right on oil transportation. The Erie was now becoming as aggressive a competitor. Gould and Fisk had gone into the fight with the vigor and the utter unscrupulousness which characterized all their dealings. They were allying themselves with the Pennsylvania Transportation Company, the only large rival pipeline system which the Empire had. They were putting up a refinery near Jersey City, and they were taking advantage shrewdly of all the speculative features of the new business. As competition grew between the roads, they grew more reckless in granting rebates, the refiners more insisted in demanding them. In 1871 things had come to such a pass in the business that every refiner suspected his neighbor to be getting better rates than he. The result was that the freight agents were constantly beset for rebates, and that the large shippers were generally getting them on the ground of the quantity of oil they controlled. Indeed, it was evident that the rebate being admitted, the only way in which it could be adjusted with a show of fairness was to grade it according to the size of the shipment. 
under these conditions of competition it was certain that the new york central system must work if it was to keep its great oil freight and the general freight agent of the lake shore road began to give the question special attention this man was peter h watson mr watson was an able patent lawyer who served under the strenuous stanton as assistant secretary of war and served well after the war he had been made general freight agent of the lake shore and michigan southern railroad and later president of the branch of that road which ran into the oil regions he had oil interests principally at franklin pennsylvania and was well known to all oil men he was a business intimate of mr rockefeller and a warm friend of horace f clark the son-in-law of w h vanderbilt at that time president of the lake shore and michigan southern railroad as the standard oil company was the largest shipper in cleveland and had already received the special favor from the lake shore which general devereux describes it was natural that mr watson should consult frequently with mr rockefeller on the question of holding and increasing his oil freight it was equally natural too that mr rockefeller should use his influence with mr watson to strengthen the theory so important to his rapid growth the theory that the biggest shipper should have the best rate two other towns shared cleveland's fear of the rise of the oil regions as a refining center and they were pittsburgh and philadelphia and mr rockefeller and mr watson found in certain refiners of these places a strong sympathy with any plan which looked to holding the region in check but while the menace in their geographical positions was the first ground of sympathy between these gentlemen something more than local troubles occupied them this was the condition of the refining business as a whole it was unsatisfactory in many particulars first it was overdone the great profits on refined oil and the growing demand for it had naturally caused a great number to rush into its manufacture there was at this time a refining capacity of three barrels to every one produced to be sure few if any of these plants expected to run the year around then as to-day there were nearly always some stills in even the most prosperous work shut down but after making a fair allowance for this fact there was still a much larger amount of refining actually done than the market demanded the result was that the price of refined oil was steadily falling when mr rockefeller had received on an average fifty-eight and three-quarter cents a gallon for the oil he exported in eighteen sixty five the year he went into business in eighteen seventy he received but twenty-six and three-eight cents in eighteen sixty five he had a margin of forty-three cents out of which to pay for transportation manufacturing barreling and marketing and to make his profits in eighteen seventy he had but seventeen and an eighth cents with which to do all this to be sure his expenses had fallen enormously between eighteen sixty five and eighteen seventy but so had his profits the multiplication of refiners with the intense competition threatened to cut them down still lower naturally mr rockefeller and his friends looked with dismay on this lowering of profits through gaining competition another anxiety of the american refiners was the condition of the export trade oil had risen to fourth place in the exports of the united states in the twelve years since its discovery and every year larger quantities were consumed abroad but it was crude oil not refined which the foreigners were beginning to demand that is they had found they could import crude refine it at home and sell it cheaper than they could buy american refined france to encourage her home refineries had even put a tax on american refined in the fall of eighteen seventy one while mr rockefeller and his friends were occupied with all these questions certain pennsylvania refiners it is not too certain who brought to them a remarkable scheme the gist of which was to bring together secretly a large enough body of refiners and shippers to persuade all the railroads handling oil to give to the company formed special rebates on its oil and drawbacks on that of other people if they could get such rates it was evident that those outside of their combination could not compete with them long and that they would become eventually the only refiners they could then limit their output to actual demand and so keep up prices this done 
they could easily persuade the railroads to transport no crude for exportation so that the foreigners would be forced to buy American refined. They believed that the price of oil thus exported could easily be advanced 50 percent. The control of the refining interest would also enable them to fix their own price on crude. As they would be the only buyers and sellers, the speculative character of the business would be done away with. In short, the scheme they worked out put the entire oil business in their hands. It looked as simple to put into operation as it was dazzling in its results. Mr. Flagler had sworn that neither he nor Mr. Rockefeller believed in this scheme but when they found that their friend Peter H. Watson and various Pittsburgh and Philadelphia parties who felt as they did about the oil business believed in it, they went in and began at once to work up a company secretly. It was evident that a scheme which aimed at concentrating in the hands of one company, the business now operated by scores, and which proposed to effect this consolidation through a practice of the railroads which was contrary to the spirit of their charters, although freely indulged in, must be worked with fine discretion if it ever were to be effective. The first thing was to get a charter, quietly. At a meeting held in Philadelphia late in the fall of 1871, a friend of one of the gentlemen interested mentioned to him that a certain estate then in liquidation had a charter for sale which gave its owners the right to carry on any kind of business in any country and in any way that it could be bought for what it would cost to get a charter under the general laws of the state, and that it would be a favor to the heirs to buy it. The opportunity was promptly taken. The name of the charter bought was the South, often written Southern, Improvement Company. For a beginning it was as good a name as another, since it said nothing. With this charter in hand, Mr. Rockefeller and Mr. Watson and their associates began to seek converts. In order that their great scheme might not be injured by premature public discussion, they asked of each person whom they approached a pledge of secrecy. Two forms of the pledges required before anything was revealed were published later. The first of these, which appeared in the New York Tribune, read as follows. I, A. B., do faithfully promise upon my honor and faith as a gentleman that I will keep secret all transactions which I may have with the corporation known as the South Improvement Company, that should I fail to complete any bargains with the said company, all the preliminary conversations shall be kept strictly private, and finally that I will not disclose the price for which I dispose of my product or any other facts which may in any way bring to light the internal workings or organization of the company. All this I do freely promise signed and witness. A second, published in a history of the Southern Improvement Company, ran, The undersigned pledge their solemn words of honor that they will not communicate to anyone without permission of Z, name of director of Southern Improvement Company, any information that he may convey to them or any of them in relation to the Southern Improvement Company, signed and witness. That the promoters met with encouragement is evident from the fact that, when the corporators came together on January 2, 1872, in Philadelphia, for the first time under their charter, and transferred the company to the stockholders, they claimed to represent in one way or another a large part of the refining interest of the country. At this meeting eleven hundred shares of the stock of the company, which was divided into two thousand one hundred dollar shares, were subscribed for, and twenty per cent of their value was paid in. Just who took stock at this meeting the writer has not been able to discover. At the same time a discussion came up as to what refiners were to be allowed to go into the new company. Each of the men represented had friends whom he wanted taken care of, and after considerable discussion it was decided to take in every refinery they could get hold of. This decision was largely due to the railroad men. Mr. Watson had seen them as soon as the plans for the company were formed, and they had all agreed that if they gave the rebates and drawbacks, all refineries then existing must be taken in upon the same level. That is, while the incorporators had intended to kill off all but themselves and their friends, the railroads refused to go into a scheme which was going to put anybody out of business. The plan, if they went into it, must cover the refining trade as it stood. 
it was enough that it could prevent anyone in the future going into the business. Very soon after this meeting of January 2nd, the rest of the stock of the Southern Improvement Company was taken. The complete list of stockholders with their holdings was as follows. William Frew, Philadelphia, 10 shares. W. P. Logan, Philadelphia, 10 shares. John P. Logan, Philadelphia, 10 shares. Charles Lockhart, Pittsburgh, 10 shares. Richard S. Waring, Pittsburgh, 10 shares. W. G. Warden, Philadelphia, 475 shares. O. F. Waring, Pittsburgh, 475 shares. P. H. Watson, Ashtabula, Ohio, 100 shares. H. M. Flagler, Cleveland, 180 shares. O. H. Payne, Cleveland, 180 shares. William D. Rockefeller, Cleveland, 180 shares. J. A. Bostwick, New York, 180 shares. John D. Rockefeller, Cleveland, 180 shares. Total shares, 2,000. Mr. Watson was elected president and W. G. Warden of Philadelphia, secretary of the new association. It will be noticed that the largest individual holdings in the company were those of W. G. Warden and O. F. Waring, each of whom had 475 shares. The company most heavily interested in the South Improvement Company was the Standard Oil of Cleveland, John D. Rockefeller, William Rockefeller, and H. M. Flagler, all stockholders of that company, each having 180 shares, 540 in the company. O. H. Payne and J. A. Bostwick, who soon after became stockholders in the Standard Oil Company, also had each 180 shares, giving Mr. Rockefeller and his associates 900 shares in all. It has frequently been stated that the South Improvement Company represented the bulk of the oil refining interest in the country. The incorporators of the company in approaching the railroads assured them that this was so. As a matter of fact, however, the thirteen gentlemen above named, who were the only ones ever holding stock in the concern, did not control over one-tenth of the refining business of the United States in 1872. That business in the aggregate amounted to a daily capacity of about 45,000 barrels, from 45,000 to 50,000, Mr. Warden put it, and the stockholders of the South Improvement Company owned a combined capacity of not over 4,600 barrels. In assuring the railroads that they controlled the business, they were dealing with their hopes rather than with facts. End of Chapter 2, Part 1 Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks.com Chapter 2, Part 2 of the History of the Standard Oil Company by Ida M. Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter 2, Part 2, The Rise of the Standard Oil Company. The organization complete, there remained contracts to be made with the railroads. Three systems were to be interested. The central, which by its connection with the Lake Shore and Michigan Southern, ran directly into the oil regions. The Erie, allied with the Atlantic and Great Western, with a short line likewise tapping the heart of the region, and the Pennsylvania, with the connections known as the Allegheny Valley and Oil Creek Railroad. The persons to be won over were W. H. Vanderbilt of the Central, H. F. Clark, President of the Lake Shore and Michigan Southern, J. Gould of the Erie, General G. B. McClellan, President of the Atlantic and Great Western, and Tom Scott of the Pennsylvania. There seems to have been little difficulty in persuading any of these persons to go into the scheme after they had been assured by the leaders that all of the refiners were to be taken in. This was a verbal condition, however, not found in the contracts they signed. This important fact Mr. Warden himself made clear when, three months later, he was on the witness stand before a committee of Congress appointed to look into the great scheme. We had considerable discussion with the railroads, Mr. Warden said, in regard to the matter of rebate on their charges for freight. They did not want to give us a rebate unless it was with the understanding that all the refineries should be brought into the arrangement 
and placed upon the same level. Question. You say you made propositions to railroad companies, which they agreed to accept upon the condition that you could include all the refineries? Answer. No, sir, I did not say that. I said that was the understanding when we discussed this matter with them. It was no proposition on our part. They discussed it not in the form of a proposition that the refineries should all be taken in, but it was the intention and resolution of the company from the first that that should be the result. We never had any other purpose in the matter. Question. In case you could take the refineries all in, the railroads proposed to give you a rebate upon their freight charges? answer. No, sir, it was not put in that form. We were to put the refineries all in upon the same terms. It was the understanding with the railroad companies that we were to have a rebate. There was no rebate given in consideration of our putting the companies all in, but we told them we would do it. The contract with the railroad companies was with us. Question. But if you did form a company composed of the proprietors of all these refineries, you were to have a rebate upon your freight charges? Answer. No, we were to have a rebate anyhow, but were to give all the refineries the privilege of coming in. Question. You were to have the rebate whether they came in or not? Answer. Yes, sir. What effect were these arrangements to have upon those who did not come into the combination? Asked the chairman. I don't think we ever took that question up, answered Mr. Wharton. A second objection to making a contract with the company came from Mr. Scott of the Pennsylvania Road and Mr. Potts of the Empire Transportation Company. The substance of this objection was that the plan took no account of the oil producer, the man to whom the world owed the business. Mr. Scott was strong in his assertion that they could never succeed unless they took care of the producers. Mr. Warden objected strongly to forming a combination with them. The interests of the producers were in one sense antagonistic to ours, one is the seller and the other is the buyer. We held in the argument that the producers were abundantly able to take care of their own branch of the business if they took care of the quantity produced. So strongly did Mr. Scott argue, however, that finally the members of the South Improvement Company yielded, and a draft of an agreement to be proposed to the producers was drawn up in lead pencil it was never presented. It seems to have been used principally to quiet Mr. Scott. The work of persuasion went on swiftly. By the 18th of January, the president of the Pennsylvania Road, J. Edgar Thompson, had put his signature to the contract, and soon after Mr. Vanderbilt and Mr. Clark signed for the Central System, and J. Gould and General McClellan for the Erie. The contracts to which these gentlemen put their names fixed gross rates of freight from all common points, as the leading shipping points within the regions were called, to all the great refining and shipping centers, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, and Cleveland. For example, the open rate on crude to New York was put at $2.56. On this price, the South Improvement Company was allowed a rebate of $1.06 for its shipments. But it got not only this rebate, it was given in cash a like amount on each barrel of crude shipped by parties outside the combination. The open rate from Cleveland to New York was two dollars, and fifty cents of this was turned over to the South Improvement Company, which at the same time received a rebate enabling it to ship for one dollar and fifty cents. Again, an independent refiner in Cleveland paid eighty cents a barrel to get his crude from the oil regions to his works and the railroad sent 40 cents of this money to the South Improvement Company. At the same time it cost the Cleveland refiner in the combination but 40 cents to get his crude oil. Like drawbacks and rebates were given for all points, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Boston, and Baltimore. An interesting provision in the contracts was that full way bills of all petroleum shipped over the roads should each day be sent to the South Improvement Company. This, of course, gave them knowledge of just who was doing business outside of their company, of how much business he was doing, and with whom he was doing it. Not only were they to have full knowledge of the business of all shippers, they were to have access to all books of the railroads. The parties to the contracts agreed that if anybody appeared in the business offering an equal amount of transportation, 
and having equal facilities for doing business with the South Improvement Company, the railroads might give them equal advantages and drawbacks and rebates, but to make such a miscarriage of the scheme doubly improbable, each railroad was bound to cooperate as far as it legally might to maintain the business of the South Improvement Company against injury by competition, and lower or raise the gross rates of transportation for such times and to such extent as might be necessary to overcome the competition, the rebates and drawbacks to be very pari passu with the gross rates. The reason given by the railroads in the contract for granting these extraordinary privileges was that the magnitude and extent of the business and operations purposed to be carried on by the South Improvement Company would greatly promote the interests of the railroads and make it desirable for them to encourage their undertaking. The evident advantages received by the railroad were a regular amount of freight. The Pennsylvania was to have 45% of the eastbound shipments, the Erie and Central each 27.5%, while westbound freight was to be divided equally between them. Fixed rates and freedom from the system of cutting, which they had all found so harassing and disastrous. That is, the South Improvement Company, which was to include the entire refining capacity of the company, was to act as the evener of the oil business. It was on the 2nd of January, 1872, that the organization of the South Improvement Company was completed. The day before the Standard Oil Company of Cleveland increased its capital from one million to two million five hundred thousand dollars, all the stockholders of the company being present and voting therefore, the stockholders were greater by five than in 1870. The names of O. B. Jennings, Benjamin Brewster, Truman B. Handy, Amasa Stone, and Stillman Witt having been added. The last three were officers and stockholders in one or more of the railroads centering in Cleveland. Three weeks after this increase of capital, Mr. Rockefeller had the charter and contracts of the South Improvement Company in hand, and was ready to see what they would do in helping him carry out his idea of wholesale combination in Cleveland. There were at that time some twenty-six refineries in the town, some of them very large plants. All of them were feeling more or less the discouraging effects of the last three or four years of railroad discrimination in favor of the Standard Oil Company. To the owners of these refineries Mr. Rockefeller now went one by one and explained the South Improvement Company. You see, he told them, this scheme is bound to work. It means an absolute control by us of the oil business. There is no chance for anyone outside but we are going to give everybody a chance to come in. You are to turn over your refinery to my appraisers, and I will give you Standard Oil Company stock or cash, as you prefer, for the value we put upon it. I advise you to take the stock. It will be for your good. Certain refiners objected. They did not want to sell. They did want to keep and manage their business. Mr. Rockefeller was regretful but firm. It was useless to resist, he told the hesitating. They would certainly be crushed if they did not accept his offer. And he pointed out in detail, and with gentleness, how beneficent this scheme really was, preventing the creek refiners from destroying Cleveland, ending competition, keeping up the price of refined oil, and eliminating speculation. Really a wonderful contrivance for the good of the oil business. That such was Mr. Rockefeller's argument is proved by abundant testimony from different individuals who succumbed to the pressure. Mr. Rockefeller's own brother, Frank Rockefeller, gave most definite evidence on this point in 1876 when he and others were trying to interest Congress in a law regulating interstate commerce. We had in Cleveland at one time about thirty establishments, but the South Improvement Company was formed and the Cleveland companies were told that if they didn't sell their property to them it would be valueless, that there was a combination of railroad and oil men, that they would buy all they could, and that all they didn't buy would be totally valueless, because they would be unable to compete with the South Improvement Company, and the result was that out of the thirty there were only four or five that didn't sell. From whom was that information received? asked the examiner from the officers of the Standard Oil Company. They made no bones about it at all. They said, if you don't sell your property to us, it will be valueless, 
because we have got advantages with the railroads. "'Have you heard these gentlemen say what you have stated?' Frank Rockefeller was asked. "'I have heard Rockefeller and Flagler say so,' he answered. W. H. Doan, whose evidence on the first rebates granted to the Cleveland trade we have already quoted, told the Congressional Committee which a few months after Mr. Rockefeller's great coup tried to find out what had happened in Cleveland. The refineries are all bought up by the Standard Oil Works. They were forced to sell. The railroads had put up the rates, and it scared them. Men came to me and told me they could not continue their business. They became frightened and disposed of their property. Mr. Doan's own business, that of a crude oil shipper, was entirely ruined, all of his customers but one having sold. To this same committee Mr. Alexander of Alexander Schofield and Company gave his reason for selling. There was a pressure brought to bear upon my mind, and upon almost all citizens of Cleveland engaged in the oil business, to the effect that unless we went into the South Improvement Company we were virtually killed as refiners that if we did not sell out we should be crushed out. My partner, Mr. Hewitt, had some negotiations with parties connected with the South Improvement Company, and they gave us to understand, at least my partner so represented to me, that we should be crushed out if we did not go into that arrangement. He wanted me to see the parties myself, but I said to him that I would not have any dealings with certain parties who were in that company for any purpose, and I never did. We sold at a sacrifice, and we were obliged to. There was only one buyer in the market, and we had to sell on their terms or be crushed out, as it was represented to us. It was stated that they had a contract with railroads by which they could run us into the ground if they pleased. After learning what the arrangements were, I felt as if, rather than fight such a monopoly, I would withdraw from the business even at a sacrifice. I think we received about forty or forty-five cents in the dollar on the valuation which we placed upon our refinery. We spent over fifty thousand dollars on our works during the past year, which was nearly all that we received. We paid out sixty or seventy thousand dollars before that. We considered our works at their cash value worth seventy-five per cent of their cost. According to our valuation, our establishment was worth one hundred and fifty thousand dollars and we sold it for about $65,000, which was about 40 or 45 percent of its value. We sold to one of the members, as I suppose, of the Southern Improvement Company, Mr. Rockefeller. He is a director in that company. It was sold in name to the Standard Oil Company of Cleveland, but the arrangements were, as I understand it, that they were put into the South Improvement Company. I am stating what my partner told me. He did all the business. His statement was that all these works were to be merged into the South Improvement Company. I never talked with any members of the South Improvement Company myself on the subject. I have declined to have anything to do with them. Mr. Hewitt, the partner who Mr. Alexander says carried on the negotiations for the sale of the business, appeared before an investigating committee of the New York State Senate in 1879 and gave his recollections of what happened. According to his story, the entire oil trade in Cleveland became paralyzed when it became known that the Southern Improvement Company had grappled the entire transportation of oil from the west to the seaboard. Mr. Hewitt went to see the freight agents of the various roads. He called on W. H. Vanderbilt, but from no one did he get any encouragement. Then he saw Peter H. Watson of the Lake Shore Railroad, the president of the company who was frightening the trade. Watson was noncommittal, said Mr. Hewitt. I got no satisfaction except, you'd better sell, you'd better get clear, better sell out, no help for it. After a little time Mr. Hewitt concluded with his partners that there was indeed no help for it, and he went to see Mr. Rockefeller, who offered him fifty cents on the dollar on the constructive account. The offer was accepted. There was nothing else to do, the firm seems to have concluded. When they came to transfer the property, Mr. Rockefeller urged Mr. Hewitt to take stock in the new concern. He told me, said Mr. Hewitt, that it would be sufficient to take care of my family for all time what I represented there, and asking for a reason, he made this expression I remember. I have ways of making money that you know nothing of. A few of the refiners contested before surrendering. Among these was Robert Hanna, 
an uncle of Mark Hanna, of the firm of Hanna, Baslington and Company. Mr. Hanna had been refining since July 1869. According to his own sworn statement he had made money fully sixty percent on his investment the first year, and after that thirty percent. Sometime in February 1872 the Standard Oil Company asked an interview with him and his associates. They wanted to buy his works, they said. But we don't want to sell, objected Mr. Hanna. You can never make any more money in my judgment, said Mr. Rockefeller. You can't compete with the Standard. We have all the large refineries now. If you refuse to sell, it will end in your being crushed. Hanna and Baslington were not satisfied. They went to see Mr. Watson, president of the South Improvement Company, and an officer of the Lake Shore, and General Deverell, manager of the Lake Shore Road. They were told that the Standard had special rates, that it was useless to try to compete with them. General Devereux explained to the gentlemen that the privileges granted the Standard were the legitimate and necessary advantage of the larger shipper over the smaller, and that if Hanna, Baslington and Company could give the road as large a quantity of oil as the Standard did, with the same regularity, they could have the same rate. General Devereux says they recognized the propriety of his excuse. They certainly recognized its authority. They say that they were satisfied they could no longer get rates to and from Cleveland which would enable them to live, and reluctantly sold out. It must have been reluctantly, for they had paid $75,000 for their works, and had made 30% a year on an average on their investment, and the standard appraiser allowed them $45,000. Truly and really less than one half of what they were absolutely worth with a fair and honest competition in the lines of transportation, said Mr. Hanna eight years later, in an affidavit. Under the combined threat and persuasion of the Standard, armed with the South Improvement Company's scheme, almost the entire independent oil interest of Cleveland collapsed in three months' time. Of the twenty-six refineries, at least twenty-one sold out. From a capacity of probably not over fifteen hundred barrels of crude a day, the standard rose in three months' time to one of ten thousand barrels. By this maneuver it became master of over one-fifth of the refining capacity of the United States. Its next individual competitor was Sohn and Fleming of New York, whose capacity was seventeen hundred barrels. The standard had a greater capacity than the entire Oil Creek regions, greater than the combined New York refiners. The transaction by which it acquired this power was so stealthy that not even the best-informed newspaper men of Cleveland knew what went on. It had all been accomplished in accordance with one of Mr. Rockefeller's chief business principles. Silence is golden. While Mr. Rockefeller was working out the good of the oil business in Cleveland, his associates were busy at other points. Charles Lockhart in Pittsburgh and W. G. Warden in Philadelphia were particularly active, though neither of them accomplished any such sweeping benefaction as Mr. Rockefeller had. It was now evident what the stockholders of the South Improvement Company meant when they assured the railroads that all the refiners were to go into the scheme, that, as Mr. Warden said, they never had any other purpose in the matter. A little more time and the great scheme would be an accomplished fact, and then there fell in its path two of those never-to-be-foreseen human elements which so often block great maneuvers. The first was born of a man's anger. The man had learned of the scheme. He had wanted to go into it, but the directors were suspicious of him. He had been concerned in speculative enterprises and in dealings with the Erie Road, which had injured these directors in other ways. They didn't want him to have any of the advantages of their great enterprise. When convinced that he could not share in the deal, he took his revenge by telling people in the oil regions what was going on. At first the oil regions refused to believe, but in a few days another slip born of human weakness came in to prove the rumor true. The schedule of rates agreed upon by the South Improvement Company and the railroads had been sent to the freight agent of the Lake Shore Railroad, but no order had been given to put them in force. The freight agent had a son on his deathbed. Distracted by his sorrow, he left his office in charge of subordinates, but neglected to tell them that the new schedules on his desk were a secret compact 
whose effectiveness depended upon their being held until all was complete. On February 26th the subordinates, ignorant of the nature of the rates, put them into effect. The independent oil men heard with amazement that freight rates had been put up nearly 100 percent. They needed no other proof of the truth of the rumors of conspiracy which were circulating. It now remained to be seen whether the oil regions would submit to the South Improvement Company as Cleveland had to the Standard Oil Company. End of Chapter 2 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's Audiobooks dot com Chapter 3 Part 1 Of the History of the Standard Oil by Ida M. Tarbell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss Chapter 3 The Oil War of 1872. It was not until after the middle of February 1872 that the people of the oil regions heard anything of the plan which was being worked out for their good. Then an uneasy rumor began running up and down the creek. Freight rates were going up. Now an advance in a man's freight bill may ruin his business. More, it may mean the ruin of a region. Rumor said it that the new rate meant just this. That is, it more than covered the margin of profit in any branch of the oil business. The railroads were not going to apply the proposed tariffs to everybody. They had agreed to give a company unheard of until now, the South Improvement Company, a special rate considerably lower than the new open rate. It was only a rumor, and many people discredited it. Why should the railroads ruin the oil regions to build up a company of outsiders? but facts began to be reported. Mr. Doan, the Cleveland shipper already quoted, told how suddenly on the 22nd of February, without notice, his rate from the oil regions to Cleveland was put up from 35 cents a barrel to 65 cents, an advance of $24 on a carload. Mr. Josiah Lombard of the New York refining firm of Ayers Lombard & Company was buying oil for his company at Oil City. Their refinery was running about 12,000 barrels a month. On the 19th of February, the rate from Oil City to Buffalo, which had been 40 cents a barrel, was raised to 65 cents, and a few days later the rate from Warren to New York was raised from 87 cents to $2.14. Mr. Lombard was not aware of this change until his house in New York reported to him that the bills for freight were so heavy that they could not afford to ship and wanted to know what was the matter. On the morning of February 26, 1872, the oil men read in their morning papers that the rise which had been threatening had come, moreover that all members of the South Improvement Company were exempt from the advance. At the news all oil dumb rushed into the streets. Nobody waited to find out his neighbor's opinion. On every lip there was but one word, and that, was conspiracy. In the vernacular of the region it was evident that a torpedo was filling for that scheme. In twenty-four hours after the announcement of the increase in freight rates, a mass meeting of three thousand excited, gesticulating oilmen was gathered in the opera house at Titusville. Producers, brokers, refiners, drillers, pumpers were in the crowd. Their temper was shown by the mottoes on the banners which they carried down with the conspirators, no compromise, don't give up the ship. Three days later, as large a meeting was held at Oil City, its temper more warlike if possible, and so it went. They organized a petroleum producers' union, pledged themselves to reduce their production by starting no new wells for sixty days, and by shutting down on Sundays to sell no oil to any person known to be in the South Improvement Company, but to support the creek refiners and those elsewhere who had refused to go into the combination, to boycott the offending railroads, and to build lines which they would own and control themselves. They sent a committee to the legislature asking that the charter of the South Improvement Company be repealed, and another to Congress demanding an investigation of the whole business on the ground that it was an interference with trade. They ordered that a history of the conspiracy giving the names of the conspirators, 
and the designs of the company should be prepared, and thirty thousand copies sent to judges of all courts, senators of the United States, members of Congress and of state legislatures, and to all railroad men and prominent businessmen of the country, to the end that enemies of the freedom of trade may be known and shunned by all honest men. They prepared a petition ninety-three feet long praying for a free pipeline bill, something which they had long wanted, but which so far the Pennsylvania Railroad had prevented their getting, and sent it by a committee to the legislature. And for days they kept one thousand men ready to march on Harrisburg at a moment's notice if the legislature showed signs of refusing their demands. In short, for weeks the whole body of oil men abandoned regular business and surged from town to town, intent on destroying the monster, the forty thieves, the great anaconda, as they called the mysterious South Improvement Company. Curiously enough, it was chiefly against the combination which had secured the discrimination from the railroads, not the railroads which had granted it, that their fury was directed. They expected nothing but robbery from the railroads, they said. They were used to that but they would not endure it from men in their own business. When they began the fight, the mass of the oil men knew nothing more of the South Improvement Company than its name and the fact that it had secured from the railroads advantages and rates which were bound to ruin all independent refiners of oil and to put all producers at its mercy. Their tempers were not improved by the discovery that it was a secret organization and that it had been at work under their very eyes for some weeks without their knowing it. At the first public meeting this fact came out, leading refiners of the region relating their experience with the Anaconda. According to one of these gentlemen, J. D. Archbald, the same who afterward became vice president of the Standard Oil Company, which office he now holds, he and his partners had heard of the scheme some months before. Alarmed by the rumor, a committee of independent refiners had attempted to investigate, but could learn nothing until they had been given a promise not to reveal what was told them. When convinced that a company had been formed actually strong enough to force or persuade the railroads to give it special rates and refuse them to all persons outside, Mr. Archbald said that he and his colleagues had gone to the railway kings to remonstrate, but all to no effect. The South Improvement Company, by some means, had convinced the railroads that they owned the oil regions, producers and refiners both, and that hereafter no oil of any account would be shipped except as they shipped it. Mr. Archbald and his partners had been asked to join the company, but had refused, declaring that the whole business was iniquitous, that they would fight it to the end, and that in their fight they would have the backing of the oil men as a whole. They excused their silence up to this time by citing the pledge extracted from them before they were informed of the extent and nature of the South Improvement Company. Naturally the burning question throughout the oil regions, convinced as it was of the inequity of the scheme, was, who are the conspirators? Whether the gentlemen concerned regarded themselves in the light of conspirators or not, they seemed from the first to have realized that it would be discreet not to be identified publicly with the scheme and to have allowed one name alone to appear in all signed negotiations. This was the name of the president, Peter H. Watson. However anxious the members of the South Improvement Company were that Mr. Watson should combine the honors of president with the trials of scapegoat, it was impossible to keep their names concealed. The Oil City Derrick, at that time one of the most vigorous, witty, and daring newspapers in the country, began a blacklist at the head of its editorial columns the day after the Raisin Freight was announced, and it kept it there until it was believed complete. It stood finally, as it appears on the opposite page. This list was not exact, but it was enough to go on, and the oil blockade, to which the Petroleum Producers' Union had pledged itself, was now enforced against the firms listed and as far as possible against the railroads. All of these refineries had their buyers on the creek, and although several of them were young men generally liked for their personal and business qualities, no mercy was shown them. They were refused oil by everybody, though they offered from seventy-five cents to a dollar more than the market price, 
they were ordered at one meeting to desist from their nefarious business or leave the oil region, and when they declined they were invited to resign from the oil exchanges of which they were members. So strictly indeed was the blockade enforced that in Cleveland the refineries were closed and meetings for the relief of the workmen were held. In spite of the excitement there was little vandalism, the only violence at the opening of the war being at Franklin, where a quantity of the oil belonging to Mr. Watson was run on the ground. The sudden uprising of the oil regions against the South Improvement Company did not alarm its members at first. The excitement would die out, they told one another. All that they needed to do was to keep quiet and stay out of the oil country. But the excitement did not die out. Indeed, with every day it became more intense and more widespread. When Mr. Watson's tanks were tapped, he began to protest in letters to a friend, F. W. Mitchell, a prominent banker and oil man of Franklin. The company was misunderstood, he complained. Have a committee of leading producers appointed, he wrote, and we will show that the contracts with the railroads are as favorable to the producing as to other interests, that the much-denounced rebate will enhance the price of oil at the wells, and that our entire plan in operation and effect will promote every legitimate American interest in the oil trade. Mr. Mitchell urged Mr. Watson to come openly to the oil regions and meet the producers as a body. A mass meeting was never a deliberative body, Mr. Watson replied but if a few of the leading oil men would go to Albany or New York, or any place favorable to calm investigation and deliberation, and therefore outside of the atmosphere of excitement which enveloped the oil country, he would see them. These letters were read to the producers, and a motion to appoint a committee was made. It was received with protests and jeers. Mr. Watson was afraid to come to the oil regions, they said. The letters were not addressed to the association. They were private, an insult to the body. We are lowering our dignity to treat with this man Watson, declared one man. He is free to come to these meetings if he wants to. What is there to negotiate about? asked another. To open a negotiation is to concede that we are wrong. Can we go halves with these middlemen in their swindle? He has set a trap for us, declared another. We cannot treat him without guilt, and the motion was voted down. The stopping of the oil supply finally forced the South Improvement Company to recognize the producers' union officially by asking that a committee of the body be appointed to confer with them on a compromise. The producers sent back a pertinent answer. They believed the South Improvement Company meant to monopolize the oil business. If that was so, they could not consider a compromise with it. If they were wrong, they would be glad to be enlightened, and they asked for information. First, the charter under which the South Improvement Company was organized. Second, the Articles of Association. Third, the officers' names. Fourth, the contracts with the railroads which signed them. Fifth, the general plan of management. Until we know these things, the oil men declared, we can no more negotiate with you than we could sit down to negotiate with a burglar as to his privileges in our house. The producers' union did not get the information they asked from the company at that time, but it was not long before they had it, and much more. The committee which they had appointed to write a history of the South Improvement Company reported on March 20, and in April the Congressional Committee appointed at the insistence of the oil men made its investigation. The former report was published broadcast and is readily accessible today. The Congressional investigation was not published officially, and no trace of its work can now be found in Washington, but while it was going on reports were made in the newspapers of the oil regions, and at its close the Producers' Union published in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, a pamphlet called A History of the Rise and Fall of the South Improvement Company, which contains the full testimony taken by the committee. This pamphlet is rare, the writer never having been able to find a copy save in three or four private collections. The most important part of it is the testimony of Peter H. Watson, the President, and W. G. Warden, the Secretary of the South Improvement Company. 
It was in these documents that the oil men found full justification for the war they were carrying on, and for the losses they had caused themselves and others. Nothing indeed could have been more damaging to a corporation than the publication of the charter of the South Improvement Company, as its president told the Congressional Investigating Committee when he was under examination. This charter was a sort of clothes horse to hang a scheme upon. As a matter of fact, it was a clothes horse big enough to hang the earth upon. It granted powers practically unlimited. There really was no exaggeration in the summary of its powers made and scattered broadcast by the irate oil men in their history of the rise and fall of the South Improvement Company. The South Improvement Company can own, contract, or operate any work, business, or traffic, save only banking, may hold and transfer any kind of property, real or personal hold and operate on any leased property, oil territory, for instance, make any kind of contract, deal in stock, securities, and funds, loan its credit, guarantee anyone's paper, manipulate any industry, may seize upon the lands of other parties for railroading or any other purpose, may absorb the improvements, property, or franchises of another company ad infinitum, may fix the fares, tolls, or freights to be charged on lines of transit operated by it, or on any business it gives to any other company or line without limit. Its capital stock can be expanded or watered at liberty. It can change its name and location at pleasure, can go anywhere and do almost anything. It is not a Pennsylvania corporation only. It can, so far as these enactments are valid or are confirmed by other legislatures, operate in any state or territory. Its directors must only be citizens of the United States, not necessarily of Pennsylvania. It is responsible to no one. Its stockholders are only liable to the amount of their stock in it. Its directors, when wielding all the princely powers of the corporation, are also responsible only to the amount of their stock in it. It may control the business of the continent and hold and transfer millions of property and yet be rotten to the core. It is responsible to no one, makes no reports of its acts or financial condition. Its records and deliberations are secret, its capital illimitable, its object unknown. It can be here today, tomorrow away. Its domain is the whole country, its business everything. Now it is petroleum it grasps and monopolizes. Next year it may be iron, coal, cotton, or breadstuffs. They are landsmen granted perpetual letters of marquee to prey upon all commerce everywhere. When the course of this charter through the Pennsylvania legislature came to be traced, it was found to be devious and uncertain. The company had been incorporated in 1871, and vested with all the powers, privileges, duties, and obligations of an earlier company, incorporated in 1870, the Pennsylvania Company. Both of them were children of that interesting body known as the Tom Scott Legislature. The act incorporating the company was not published until after the oil war. Its sponsor was never known, and no votes on it are recorded. The origin of the South Improvement Company has always remained in darkness. It was one of several improvement companies chartered in Pennsylvania at about the same time and enjoying the same commercial carte blanche. Bad as the charter was in appearance, the oil men found that the contracts which the new company had made with the railroads were worse. These contracts advanced the rates of freight from the oil regions over 100 percent, an advance which more than covered the margin of profit on their business. But it was not the railroad that got the greater part of this advance. It was the South Improvement Company. Not only did it ship its own oil at fully a dollar a barrel cheaper on an average than anybody else could, but it received fully a dollar a barrel rake-off on every barrel its competitors shipped. It was computed and admitted by the members of the company who appeared before the investigating committee of Congress that this discrimination would have turned over to them fully six million dollars annually on the carrying trade. The railroads expected to receive about one and a half millions more than from the existing rates. That is, an additional cost of about 
a dollar twenty-five cents a barrel was added to crude oil, and it was computed that this would enable the refiners to advance their wholesale price at least four cents a gallon. It is hardly to be wondered at that, when the oil men had before them, the full text of these contracts they refused absolutely to accept the repeated assertions of the members of the South Improvement Company that their scheme was intended only for the good of the oil business. The Committee of Congress could not be persuaded to believe it either. Your success meant the destruction of every refiner who refused for any reason to join your company or whom you did not care to have in, and it put the producers entirely in your power. It would make a monopoly such as no set of men are fit to handle, the chairman of the committee declared. Of course Mr. Warden, the secretary of the company, protested again and again that they meant to take in all the refiners, but when he had to admit that the contracts with the railroads were not made on this condition, his protestations met with little credence. Besides, there was the damning fact that no refiners had come in except those in Cleveland and that they with one accord testified that they had yielded to force. Not a single factory in either New York or the oil regions was in the combination. The fact that these producers had never been approached in any way looked very bad for the company, too. Mr. Watson affirmed and reaffirmed before the committee that it was the intention of the company to take care of the producers. It was an essential part of this contract that the producer should join it, he declared. But no such condition was embodied in the contract. It was verbal only, and, besides, it had never been submitted to the producers themselves in any form until after the trouble in the oil regions began. The committee, like the oil men, insisted that under the circumstances no such verbal understanding was to be trusted. No part of the testimony before the committee made a worse impression than that showing that the chief object of the combination was to put up the price of refined oil to the consumer, though nobody had denied from the first that this was the purpose. In a circular intended for private circulation, which appeared in the newspapers about this time, explaining the facts of the South Improvement Company, this was made clear. The object of this combination of interest, ran the circular, is understood to be twofold. Firstly, to do away, at least in great measure, with the excessive and undue competition now existing between the refining interests, by reason of there being a far greater refining capacity than is called for or justified by the existing petroleum-consuming requirements of the world. Secondly, to avoid the heretofore undue competition between the various railroad companies transporting oil to the seaboard by fixing a uniform rate of freight, which it is thought can be adhered to by some such arrangement as guaranteeing to each road some such percentages of the profit of the aggregate amount of oil transported, whether the particular line carries it or not. It is also asserted that a prominent feature of the combination will be to limit the production of refined petroleum to such amounts as may serve in a great measure, to do away with the serious periodical depressions in the article. It is also to be expected that, desiring to curtail the production of refined petroleum in this country, the railroads will not offer any additional facilities for exportation of the crude article. A writer in the Oil City Derrick, quoted in the Cleveland Herald, March 2, 1872, said, The ring pretend that they will make their margin out of the consumers that is, they will put refined up to a figure that will enable them to pay well for crude. The consumers are the avowed victims, since they must pay a price which will warrant the ring in going on with their operations. And the producer's security for the price is a mere matter of discretion. Whether the members of the company discuss the subject, they put forward this object as one sufficient to justify the combination. If refined oil was put up, everybody in the trade would make more money. To this end, the public ought to be willing to pay more. When Mr. Warden was under examination by the committee, the chairman said to him, Under your arrangement, the public would have been put to an additional expense of $7,500,000 a year. What public? said Mr. Warden. They would have had to pay it in Europe. But to keep up the price abroad, you would have had to keep up the price at home. 
said the chairman. Mr. Warden conceded the point. "'You could not get a better price for that exported without having a better price here,' he said. Mr. Watson contended that the price could be put up with benefit to the consumer, and when he was asked how, he replied, "'By steadying the trade. You will notice what all those familiar with this trade know, that there are very rapid and excessive fluctuations in the oil market, that when these fluctuations take place, the retail dealers are always quick to note a rise in price, but very slow to note a fall. Even if two dollars a barrel had been added to the price of oil under a steady trade, I think the price of the retail purchaser would not have been increased. That increased price would only amount to one cent a quart, four cents a gallon, and I think the price would not have been increased to the retail dealer, because the fluctuations would have been avoided. That was one object to be accomplished. The committee were not convinced, however, that a scheme which began by adding four cents to the price of a gallon of oil could be to the good of the consumer. Nor did anything appear in the contracts which showed how the fluctuations in the price of oil were to be avoided. These fluctuations were due to the rise and fall in the crude market, and that depended on the amount of crude coming from the ground. The South Improvement Company might assert that they meant to bring the producers into their scheme and persuade them to keep down the amount of production in the same way they meant to keep down refined, so that the price could be kept steadily high. But they had nothing to prove that they were sincere in the intention, nothing to prove that they had thought of the producers seriously until the trouble in the oil regions began. It looked very much to the committee as if the real intention of the company was to keep up the price of refined to a certain figure by limiting the output and that there was nothing to show that it would not go up with crude, though it might not go down with it. Under these circumstances it seemed as if a fluctuating market which gave a moderate average was better for the consumer than the steady price which Mr. Watson thought so good for the public. Thirty-two cents a gallon was the ideal price they had in view, though refined had not sold for that since 1869, the average price in 1870 being twenty-six and three-eighths, and in 1871, twenty-four and a quarter. The refiner who in 1871 sold his oil at twenty-four and a quarter cents a gallon cleared easily fifty-two cents a barrel, a large profit on his investments, but the refiners in the early stages of this new industry had made much larger profits. It was to perpetuate these early profits that they had gone into the South Improvement Company. It did not take the full exposition of the objects of the South Improvement Company, brought out by the Congressional Investigating Committee, with the publication of charters and contracts, to convince the country at large that the oil regions were right in their opposition. From the first, the sympathy of the press and the people were with the oil men. It was evident to everybody that if the railroads had made the contracts as charged, and it daily became more evident they had done so. Nothing but an absolute monopoly of the whole oil business by this combination could result. It was robbery, cried the newspapers all over the land. Under the thin guise of assisting in the development of oil refining in Pittsburgh and Cleveland, said the New York Tribune, this corporation has simply laid its hand upon the throat of the oil traffic with a demand to stand and deliver and if this could be done in the oil business, what was to prevent it being done in any other industry? Why should not a company be formed to control wheat or bread or iron or steel as well as oil? If the railroads would do this for one company, why not for another? The South Improvement Company, men agreed, was a menace to the free trade of the country. If the oil men yielded now, all industries must suffer from their weakness the railroads must be taught a lesson as well as would-be monopolists. The oil men had no thought of yielding. With every day of the war their backbone grew stiffer. The men were calmer, too, for their resistance had found a ground which seemed impregnable to them, and arguments against the South Improvement Company now took the place of denunciations. On all sides, men said, this is a transportation question, and now is the time to put an end once and forever to the rebates. This sentiment against discrimination 
on account of amount of freight or for any other reason had been strong in the country since its beginning, and it now crystallized immediately. The country so buzzed with discussion on the duties of the railroads that reporters sent from the eastern newspapers commented on it. Nothing was commoner, indeed, on the trains which ran the length of the region and were its real forums than to hear a man explaining that the railways derived their existence and power from the people, that their charters were contracts with the people, that a fundamental provision of these contracts was that there should be no discriminating in favor of one person or one town, that such a discrimination was a violation of charter, that therefore the South Improvement Company was founded on fraud, and that the courts must dissolve it if the railways did not abandon it. The Petroleum Producers Union, which had been formed to grapple with the monster, actually demanded interstate regulation, for in a circular sent out to newspapers and boards of trade asking their aid against the conspiracy, they included this paragraph. We urge you to exert all your influence with your representatives in Congress to support such measures offered there as will prohibit for all future time any monopoly of railroads or other transportation companies from laying embargoes upon the trade between states by a system of excessive freights or unjust discrimination against buyers or shippers at any trade, by the allowance of rebates or drawbacks to any persons whatever. This is a matter of national importance, and only the most decided action can protect you and us from the scheming strength of these monopolies. How the whole question appeared to an intelligent oil man, one, too, who had had the courage to resist in the attack on the trade in Cleveland, and who still was master of his own refinery, is shown by the following letter to the Cleveland Herald. Editors Herald As I understand, the financial success of this South Improvement Company is based upon contracts made with the officers, either individually or otherwise, of all the railroads leading out of the oil region, by which they, the South Improvement Company, receive as a drawback certain excess of freights, not only on every barrel of oil shipped out of the oil regions by or to themselves, but also on every barrel of oil shipped out of the oil regions by or to other refineries or dealers or consumers. The first advance in freights to Cleveland has already been made. The on crude oil from 40 cents to 65 cents per barrel. This seemingly slight advance has already caused one party that I know of to pay an excess of over $2,000. Other firms have paid larger or smaller sums according to the quantity of oil they were compelled to have. This excess, we suppose, goes directly to swell the profits of the South Improvement Company. This is only the beginning. The whole extent of the evil that may be done to producers, refiners, dealers, and consumers and to the public generally, if this corporation, or rather combination of corporations, is successful, is so deep and varied and far-reaching that it cannot be fully comprehended, and I will not attempt it in detail, but only suggest a few inquiries. Where will be their limits? How high will they advance freights? How low will they force the price of crude? How high refined? Will they adopt a liberal policy for producers, or will they destroy their interests and crush out the oil production entirely? Will they be liberal with dealers and consumers and adopt uniform rules with steady prices, or will they take advantage of times and circumstances and force ruinous corners upon the trade? These and many other questions are pertinent, for clearly if they can control the shipment, they can control the price of oil and if they can control the price to the extent of 25 cents per barrel, they can control it entirely. If they can control it entirely, where will be their limit? Who will dictate a line of policy to them? And may not one of the greatest and most important industries of this country be destroyed and hundreds of thousands of businessmen be made bankrupt if this combination is successful and has the disposition to work ruin? I do not say that I think they will work ruin. They undoubtedly will attempt to make all the money they can and will pursue such a policy as, in their judgment, will bring them the utmost amount of profits, regardless of consequences. But what that policy will be, of course, we cannot judge. 
It is understood that the parties to this combination excuse themselves and their action before the public by reciting the undoubted facts in the case. They are these. That the refining of oil as a business has been of late and is now overdone. That the capacity for refining oil in this country exceeds the production in the ratio of three barrels to one. That the railroads have reduced freights to their lowest extreme and were even losing money. That refiners, in spite of all their efforts, could not earn their running expenses. That the special interests of Cleveland as a refining point were in danger of being lost and that this great business might go to other points, and the millions of dollars in refining property here to be sacrificed, and thousands of men thrown out of employment, that real estate would depreciate, and that many other collateral troubles connected with the loss of this business would follow, and that now, by the consummation of the plans of this monopoly, all these evils will be avoided. In answer to this, Assuming that the refining interest of Cleveland is a unit in this corporation, that of Pittsburgh another, that of New York another, and that of Philadelphia another, it follows that it is immaterial to the stockholders of the South Improvement Company whether the oil produced at the oil regions is refined by them at their works in Cleveland, or at Pittsburgh, or in New York, or in Philadelphia. It would not affect their dividends at all provided they refined the oil at the cheapest point for them to do so. That place might be Cleveland, it might be Pittsburgh, and it might not be either of them, but it might be New York or Philadelphia. Therefore, as long as it is for the pecuniary advantage of this combination to refine at Cleveland, they may do so, but no longer, and should it be for the interest of the combination, to discontinue their works at Cleveland, what would become of the oil refining interest at this point? That question everybody can answer. Therefore I see little weight to the argument used that this monopoly is for the benefit of Cleveland. Hence I do not consider the special danger to Cleveland by any means as averted. But without discussing this position, its advantages or disadvantages as an oil refining center, for it has both in a marked degree, on general principles, I will assert that the laws of business and manufacturing interests, like the laws of supply and demand, are unchangeable, and that a prosperity such as this monopoly would bring us is a forced prosperity, consequently not permanent, but temporary and fictitious in character, and damaging in its ultimate results. And more than all this, if the refining prosperity of Cleveland could be re-established permanently by means of the success of this monopoly, we could not afford to accept it at the cost proposed, viz. that of enriching ourselves at the expense of those who are weaker, but are in power. We have just refused to build an opera house because we should, by using the only means we could command to do so, compromise our morality. How much more emphatically should we refuse to accept any benefits to our city which have their origin in unmitigated fraud? In the Opera House instance just cited, the managers use no compulsion. No unwilling man would be forced by them to buy a ticket and take his chances. But the South Improvement Company forced every producer to take a less price for his oil without rendering him an equivalent. They force every refiner who is in their way to prosecute his business against them as competitors at fearful odds, and perhaps at the expense of a royalty on every barrel, or to sell his works and abandon his business to the South Improvement Company at any paltry price they may dictate. They also force every consumer of oil on this broad continent, after paying all the legitimate cost of producing, refining, and transportation on oil, to pay them also an additional tribute. For what? Absolutely nothing. The railroad companies derive their existence and power to act under charters granted them by the citizens through their legislatures of the several states in which they exist. This charter is a contract made by and between the citizens of the one part and the railroad company on the other, and both parties bind themselves alike to the faithful performance of the conditions of the contract. One of the fundamental provisions of this contract is that there shall be no discrimination shown to any individuals, 
or body of individuals, as to facilities or privileges of doing business with such railway company. On the contrary, the railroad company is expressly required in all cases to charge uniform rates for the transportation of freight and passengers. They must, if desired, carry the freight for A that they do for B, and always at the same price. Any deviation from this stipulated condition is a willful and fraudulent violation of their contract. If it is by means of such violations of contracts on the part of the several railroad companies connected with them that the South Improvement Company expects success, then the whole gigantic structure is established upon fraud as a basis, and it ought to come down. Very respectfully, F. M. Bacchus, Cleveland, Ohio, March 5, 1872. This is the end of Chapter 3, Part 1. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com. Chapter Three, Part Two of the History of the Standard Oil Company by Ida M. Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Three. Part Two, The Oil War of 1872 The oil men now met the very plausible reasons given by the members of the company for their combination more intelligently than at first. There were grave abuses in the business, they admitted. There was too great refining capacity. But this, they argued, was a natural development in a new business whose growth had been extraordinary and whose limits were by no means defined time and experience would regulate it. Give the refiners open and regular freights, with no favors to anyone, and the stronger and better equipped would live, the others die, but give all a chance. In fact, time and energy would regulate all the evils of which they complained if there were fair play. The oil men were not only encouraged by public opinion and by getting their minds clear on the merits of their case. They were upheld by repeated proofs of aid from all sides. Even the women of the region were asking what they could do, and were offering to wear their black velvet bonnets all summer if necessary. Solid support came from the independent refiners and shippers in other parts of the country who were offering to stand in with them in their contest. New York was already one of the chief refining centers of the country and the South Improvement Company had left it entirely out of its combination. As incensed as the creek itself, the New York interests formed an association, and about the middle of March sent a committee of three, with H. H. Rogers of Charles Pratt & Company at its head, to Oil City to consult with the Producers' Union. Their arrival in the oil regions was a matter of great satisfaction. What made the oil men most exultant, however, was their growing belief that the railroads, the crux of the whole scheme, were weakening. However fair the great scheme may have appeared to the railroad kings in the privacy of the council chamber, it began to look dark as soon as it was dragged into the open, and signs of a scuttle soon appeared. General G. B. McClellan, president of the Atlantic and Great Western, sent to the very first mass meeting this telegram. New York, February 27. 1872. Neither the Atlantic and Great Western nor any of its officers are interested in the South Improvement Company. Of course, the policy of the road is to accommodate the petroleum interest. G. B. McClellan. A great applause was started, only to be stopped by the hisses of a group whose spokesman read the following. Contract with South Improvement Company, signed by George B. McClellan, President for the Atlantic and Great Western Railroad. I only signed it after it was signed by all the other parties. J. Gould. The railroads tried in various ways to appease the oil men. They did not enforce the new rates. They had signed the contracts, they declared, only after the South Improvement Company had assured them that all the refineries and producers were to be taken in. Indeed, they seemed to have realized within a fortnight that the scheme was doomed, 
and to have been quite ready to meet cordially a committee of oil men which went east to demand that the railroads revoke their contracts with the South Improvement Company. This committee, which was composed of twelve persons, three of them being the New York representatives already mentioned, began its work by an interview with Colonel Scott at the Colonial Hotel in Philadelphia. With evident pride the committee wrote back to the producers' union. Mr. Scott, differing in this respect from the railroad representatives whom we afterwards met, notified us that he would call upon us at our hotel. An interesting account of their interview was given to the Hepburn Committee in 1879 by W. T. Scheide, one of the number. We saw Mr. Scott on the 18th of March, 1872, in Philadelphia, and he said to us that he was very much surprised to hear of this agitation in the oil regions, that the object of the railroads in making this contract with the South Improvement Company was to obtain an evener to pool the freight, pool the oil freights among the different roads, that they had been cutting each other on oil freights for a number of years and had not made any money out of it, although it was a freight they should have made money from that they had endeavored to make an arrangement among themselves, but had always failed. He said that they supposed that the gentleman representing the South Improvement Company represented the petroleum trade, but as he was now convinced they did not, he would be very glad to make an arrangement with this committee, who undoubtedly did represent the petroleum trade. The committee told him that they could not make any such contract, that they had no legal authority to do so. He said that could be easily fixed, because the legislature was then in session, and by going to Harrisburg a charter could be obtained in a very few days. The committee still said that they would not agree to any such arrangement, that they did not think the South Improvement Company's contract was a good one, and they were instructed to have it broken, and so they did not feel that they could accept a similar one, even if they had the power. Leaving Colonel Scott, the committee went on to New York where they stayed for about a week, closely watched by the newspapers, all of which treated the oil war as a national affair. Their first interview of importance in New York was with Commodore Vanderbilt, who said to them very frankly at the beginning of their talk, I told Billy, W. H. Vanderbilt, not to have anything to do with that scheme. The committee, in its report, said that the Commodore fully agreed with them upon the justice of their claims, and frequently asserted his objections to any combination seeking a monopoly of other men's property and interests. He told them that if what they asked was that the railroads should fix a tariff which, while giving them a paying rate, would secure the oil men against drawbacks, rebates, or variations in the tariff, he would willingly cooperate. The Commodore ended his amiable concessions by reading the committee a letter just received from the South Improvement Company offering to cooperate with the producers and refiners or to compromise existing differences. The oil men told the Commodore emphatically that they would not treat with the South Improvement Company or with anyone interested in it, nor would they recognize its existence. And this stand they kept throughout their negotiations, though repeated efforts were made by the railroad men, particularly those of the central system, to persuade them to a compromise. At the meeting with the officials of the Erie and the Atlantic and Great Western, the committee was incensed by being offered a contract similar to that of the South Improvement Company, on consideration that the original be allowed to stand. It seemed impossible to the railroad men that the oil men really meant what they said, and would make no terms save on the basis of no discriminations of any kind to anybody. They evidently believed that if the committee had a chance to sign a contract as profitable as that of the South Improvement Company, all their fair talk of fair play, the duty of the common carrier, equal chance to all in transportation, would at once evaporate. They failed utterly at first to comprehend that the oil war of 1872 was an uprising against an injustice, and that the moral wrong of the thing had taken so deep a hold of the oil country that the people as a whole had combined to restore right. General McClellan of the Atlantic and Great Western and Mr. Divin, one of the Erie's directors, were the only ones who gave the committee any support in their position. The final all-important conference with the railroad men was held on March 25 at the Erie offices. Horace Clark, president of the Lake Shore and Michigan Southern Railway, was chairman of this meeting. 
and according to H. H. Rogers' testimony before the Hepburn Committee in 1879, there were present besides the oil men Colonel Scott, General McClellan, Director Divin, William H. Vanderbilt, Mr. Stebbins, and George Hall. The meeting had not been long in session before Mr. Watson, president of the South Improvement Company, and John D. Rockefeller presented themselves for admission. Up to this time Mr. Rockefeller had kept well out of sight in the affair. He had given no interviews, offered no explanations. He had allowed the president of the company to wrestle with the excitement in his own way but things were now in such critical shape that he came forward in a last attempt to save the organization by which he had been able to concentrate in his own hands the refining interest of Cleveland. With Mr. Watson he knocked for admission to the council going on in the Erie offices. The oil men flatly refused to let him in. A dramatic scene followed, Mr. Clark, the chairman, protesting in agitated tone against shutting out his lifelong friend Watson. The oil men were obdurate. They would have nothing to do with anybody concerned with the South Improvement Company. So determined were they that, although Mr. Watson came in, he was obliged at once to withdraw. A Times reporter who witnessed the little scene between the two supporters of the tottering company after its president was turned out of the meeting remarked sympathetically that Mr. Rockefeller soon went away, looking pretty blue. The acquiescence of the railroad kings in the refusal of the oil men to recognize representatives of the South Improvement Company was followed by an unwilling promise to break the contracts with the company. Another strong effort was made to persuade the independents to make the same contracts on condition that they shipped as much oil, but they would not hear of it. They demanded open rates with no rebates to anyone. Horace Clark and W. H. Vanderbilt particularly stuck for this arrangement. Their opposition to the oil men's position was so strong that the latter, in reporting it to the Union, said, We feel it proper to say that we are in no wise indebted to these gentlemen for any courtesy or consideration received at their hands. So well did the committee fight its battle, and so strongly were they supported by the New York refiners, that the railroads were finally obliged to consent to revoke the contracts and to make a new one embodying the views of the oil regions. The contract finally signed at this meeting by H. F. Clark for the Lakeshore Road, O. H. P. Archer for the Erie, W. H. Vanderbilt for the Central, George B. McClellan for the Atlantic and Great Western, and Thomas A. Scott for the Pennsylvania, agreed that all shipping of oil should be made on a basis of perfect equality to all shippers, producers, and refiners, and that no rebates, drawbacks, or other arrangements of any character should be made or allowed that will give any party the slightest difference in rates or discriminations of any character whatever. It was also agreed that the rates should not be liable to change either for increase or decrease without first giving William Hassan, president of the Producers' Union, at least ninety days' notice. The same rate was put on refined oil from Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and the Creek to eastern shipping points. That is, Mr. Rockefeller could send his oil from Cleveland to New York at a dollar fifty cents per barrel. So could his associates in Pittsburgh, and this was what it cost the refiner on the creek, but the latter had this advantage. He was at the wells. Mr. Rockefeller and his Pittsburgh allies were miles away, and it cost them, by the new contract, fifty cents to get a barrel of crude to their works. The oil regions meant that geographical position should count that the advantages Mr. Rockefeller had by his command of the western market and by his access to a cheap eastern waterway should be considered as well as their own position beside the raw product. This contract was the first effective thrust into the great bubble. Others followed in quick succession. On the 28th the railroads officially annulled their contracts with the company. About the same time the Pennsylvania legislature repealed the charter. On March 30, the Committee of Oil Men sent to Washington to be present during the congressional investigation, now about to begin, spent an hour with President Grant. They wired home that, on their departure, he said, Gentlemen, I have noticed the progress of monopolies and have long been convinced that the national government would have to interfere and protect the people against them. The President and the members of Congress of both parties continued to show interest in the investigation. 
and there was little or no dissent from the final judgment of the committee, given early in May, that the South Improvement Company was the most gigantic and daring conspiracy a free country had ever seen. Their decision finished the work. The monster was slain, and the oil regions proclaimed exultantly. And now came the question, what should they do about the blockade established against the members of the South Improvement Company? The railroads they had forgiven. Should they forgive the members of the South Improvement Company? This question came up immediately on the repeal of the Charter. The first severe test to which their temper was put was early in April, when the Fisher Brothers, a firm of oil city brokers, sold some twenty thousand barrels of oil to the Standard Oil Company. The moment the sale was noised, a perfect uproar burst forth. Indignant telegrams came from every direction condemning the brokers. Betrayal, infamy, mercenary achievement, the most unkindest cut of all, was the gist of them. From New York, Porter and Archibald telegraphed annulling all their contracts with the guilty brokers. The oil exchange passed votes of censure, and the producers' union turned them out. A few days later it was learned that a dealer on the creek was preparing to ship five thousand barrels to the same firm. A mob gathered about the cars and refused to let them leave. It was only by stationing a strong guard that the destruction of the oil was prevented. But something had to be done. The cooler heads argued that the blockade, which had lasted now forty days, and from which the region had of course suffered enormous loss, should be entirely lifted. The objects for which it had been established had been accomplished, that is, the South Improvement Company had been destroyed. Now let free trade be established. If anybody wanted to sell to conspirators, it was his lookout. A long and excited meeting of men from the entire oil country was held at Oil City to discuss the question. The president of the Petroleum Producers Union, Captain William Hassan, in anticipation of the meeting, had sent to the officers of all the railroads which had been parties to the South Improvement Company the following telegram. Office Petroleum Producers Union, Oil City, Pennsylvania, April 4, 1872. We are informed by parties known as members of the South Improvement Company, now representing the Standard Oil Company, who are in the market overbidding other shippers, that all contracts between the railroad companies and South Improvement and Standard Companies are cancelled. Will you please give us official notice whether such contracts are cancelled or not? The people in mass meeting assembled have instructed the executive committee not to sell or ship any oil to these parties until we receive such notice. Please answer at once as we fear violence and destruction of property. Signed, William Hassan, President. General McClellan, Horace F. Clark, Thomas A. Scott, and W. H. Vanderbilt all sent emphatic telegrams in reply, asserting that the South Improvement contracts had been cancelled, and that their roads had no understanding of any nature in regard to freights with the Standard Oil Company. The only existing arrangement is with you, telegraphed General McClellan. W. H. Vanderbilt reminded Mr. Hassan that the agreement of March 25, between the railroad companies and the Joint Committee of Producers and Refiners, was on a basis of perfect equality for all, and the inference was how could Mr. Vanderbilt possibly make a special arrangement with the Standard. From the Standard Oil Company the following was received. Cleveland, Ohio, April 8, 1872. To Captain William Hassan, in answer to your telegram, this company holds no contract with the railroad companies or any of them, or with the South Improvement Company. The contracts between the South Improvement Company and the railroads have been cancelled, and I am informed you have been so advised by telegram. I state unqualifiedly that reports circulated in the oil regions and elsewhere that this company or any member of it threatened to depress oil are false. John D. Rockefeller, President after reading all the telegrams, the committee submitted its report. The gist of it was that since they had official assurance that the hated contracts were cancelled, and that since they had secured from all the trunk lines a fair rate of freight, equal to all shippers and producers, great or small, with an abolition of the system of rebates and drawbacks, the time had arrived to open the channels of trade to all parties desiring to purchase or deal in oil 
on terms of equality. The report was received with approbation and delight, and put an official end to the oil war. But no number of resolutions could wipe out the memory of the forty days of terrible excitement and loss which the region had suffered. No triumph could stifle the suspicion and the bitterness which had been sown broadcast through the region. Every particle of independent manhood in these men whose very life was independent action had been outraged. Their sense of fair play, the saving force of the region in the days before law and order had been established, had been violated. These were things which could not be forgotten. There henceforth could be no trust in those who had devised a scheme which, the producers believed, was intended to rob them of their property. It was inevitable that under the pressure of their indignation and resentment some person or persons should be fixed upon as responsible, and should be hated accordingly. Before the lifting of the embargo this responsibility had been fixed. It was the Standard Oil Company of Cleveland, so the oil regions decided, which was at the bottom of the business, and the Mephistopheles of the Cleveland Company, as they put it, was John D. Rockefeller. Even the Cleveland Herald acknowledged this popular judgment. Whether justly or unjustly, the editor wrote, Cleveland has the odium of having originated the scheme. This opinion gained ground as the days passed. The activity of the president of the Standard in New York in trying to save the contracts with the railroads, and his constant appearance with Mr. Watson, and the fact brought out by the congressional investigation that a larger block of the South Improvement Company stock was owned in the Standard than in any other firm, strengthened the belief. But what did more than anything else to fix the conviction was what they had learned of the career of the Standard Oil Company in Cleveland. Before the oil war the company had been known simply as one of several successful firms in the city. It drove close bargains, but it paid promptly and was considered a desirable customer. Now the oil regions learned for the first time of the sudden and phenomenal expansion of the company. Where there had been at the beginning of 1872 twenty-six refining firms in Cleveland, there were but six left. In three months before and during the oil war, the Standard had absorbed twenty plants. It was generally charged by the Cleveland refiners that Mr. Rockefeller had used the South Improvement Scheme to persuade or compel his rivals to sell to him. Why, cried the oil men, the Standard Oil has done already in Cleveland what the South Improvement Company set out to do for the whole country, and it has done it by the same means. By the time the blockade was raised, another unhappy conviction was fixed on the oil regions. The Standard Oil Company meant to carry out the plans of the exploded South Improvement Company. The promoters of the scheme were partly responsible for the report. Under the smart of their defeat they talked rather more freely than their policy of silence justified, and their remarks were quoted widely. Mr. Rockefeller was reported in the Derrick to have said to a prominent oil man of Oil City that the South Improvement Company could work under the charter of the Standard Oil Company, and to have predicted that in less than two months the gentlemen would be glad to join him. The newspapers made much of the following similar story, reported by a New York correspondent. A prominent Cleveland member of what was the South Improvement Company had said within two days, The business now will be done by the Standard Oil Company. We have a rate of freight by water from Cleveland to New York at seventy cents. No man in the trade shall make a dollar this year. We purpose to manipulating the market as to run the price of crude on the creek as low as two and a half. We mean to show the world that the South Improvement Company was organized for business and means business in spite of opposition. The same thing has been said in substance by the leading Philadelphia member. The trade here regards the Standard Oil Company as simply taking the place of the South Improvement Company and as being ready at any moment to make the same attempt to control the trade as its progenitors did, said the New York Bulletin about the middle of April and the Cleveland Herald discussed the situation under the heading South Improvement Company, alias Standard Oil Company. The effect of these reports in the oil regions was most disastrous. Their open war became a kind of guerrilla opposition. Those who sold oil to the Standard were ostracized, and its president was openly scorned. If Mr. Rockefeller had been an ordinary man, 
the outburst of popular contempt and suspicion which suddenly poured on his head would have thwarted and crushed him. But he was no ordinary man. He had the powerful imagination to see what might be done with the oil business if it could be centered in his hands, the intelligence to analyze the problem into its elements, and to find the key to control. He had the essential element of all great achievement, a steadfastness to a purpose once conceived which nothing could crush. The oil regions might rage, call him a conspirator, and all those who sold him oil traitors. The railroads might withdraw their contracts and the legislature annul his charter. Undisturbed and unresting, he kept at his great purpose. Even if his nature had not been such as to forbid him to abandon an enterprise in which he saw promised a vast profit, even if he had not had a mind which, stopped by a wall, burrows under or creeps around, he would nevertheless have been forced to desperate efforts to keep up his business. He had increased his refining capacity in Cleveland to 10,000 barrels on the strength of the South Improvement Company contracts. These contracts were annulled, and in their place was one signed by officials of all the oil-shipping roads refusing rebates to everybody. His geographical position was such that it cost him, under these new contracts, fifty cents more to get oil from the wells to New York than it did his rivals on the creek. True, he had many counterbalancing advantages. A growing western market almost entirely in his hands, late traffic, close proximity to all sorts of accessories to his manufacturing. But this contract put him on a level with his rivals. By his size he should have better terms than they. What did he do? He got a rebate. Seven years later Mr. Rockefeller's partner, H. M. Flagler, was called before a commission of the Ohio State Legislature appointed to investigate railroads. He was asked for the former contracts between his company and the railroads, and among others he presented one showing that, from the 1st of April until the middle of November 1872, their eastbound rate was a dollar twenty-five cents, twenty-five cents less than that set by the agreement of March twenty-fifth between the oil men and the railroads. The discrepancy between the date Mr. Flagler gives for this contract and that of Mr. Vanderbilt's telegram to Mr. Hassan stating that his road had no contract with the Standard Oil April sixth, and of Mr. Rockefeller's own telegram stating he had no contracts with the railroads April eighth, the writer is unable to explain. How had Mr. Rockefeller been able to get this rebate? Simply, as he had always done, by virtue of the quantity he shipped. He was able to say to Mr. Vanderbilt, I can make a contract to ship sixty carloads of oil a day over your road, nearly forty-eight hundred barrels. I cannot give this to you regularly unless you will make me a concession. And Mr. Vanderbilt made the concession while he was signing the contract with the oil men. Of course, the rate was secret, and Mr. Rockefeller probably understood now, as he had not two months before, how essential it was that he keep it secret. His task was more difficult now, for he had an enemy active, clamorous, contemptuous, whose suspicions had reached that acute point where they could believe nothing but evil of him, the producers and independent refiners of the oil regions. It was utterly impossible that he should ever silence this enemy for their points of view were diametrically opposed. They believed in independent effort, every man for himself, and fair play for all. They wanted competition, loved open fight. They considered that all business should be done openly, that the railways were bound as public carriers to give equal rates, that any combination which favored one firm or one locality at the expense of another was unjust and illegal. This belief long held by many of the oil men had been crystallized by the uprising into a common sentiment. It had become the moral code of the region. Mr. Rockefeller's point of view was different. He believed that the good of all was in a combination which would control the business as the South Improvement Company proposed to control it. Such a combination would end at once all the abuses the business suffered. As rebates and special rates were essential to this control, he favored them. Of course, Mr. Rockefeller must have known that the railroad was a common carrier, and that the common law forbade discrimination. But he knew that the railroads had not obeyed the laws governing them. 
that they had regularly granted special rates and rebates to those who had large amounts of freight. That is, you were able to bargain with the railroads as you did with the man carrying on a strictly private business depending in no way on a public franchise. Moreover, Mr. Rockefeller probably believed that, in spite of the agreements, if he did not get rebates, somebody else would, that they were for the wariest, the shrewdest, the most persistent. If somebody was to get rebates, why not he? This point of view was no uncommon one. Many men held it and felt a sort of scorn, as practical men always do for theorists, when it was contended that the shipper was as wrong in taking rates as the railroads in granting them. Thus, on one hand, there was an exaggerated sense of personal independence, on the other a firm belief in combination, on one hand a determination to root out the vicious system of rebates practiced by the railway, on the other a determination to keep it alive and profit by it. Those theories which the body of oil men held as vital and fundamental, Mr. Rockefeller and his associates either did not comprehend or were deaf to. This lack of comprehension by many men of what seems to other men to be the most obvious principles of justice is not rare. Many men who are widely known as good share it. Mr. Rockefeller was good. There was no more faithful Baptist in Cleveland than he. Every enterprise of that church he had supported liberally from his youth. He gave to its poor. He visited its sick. He wept with its suffering. Moreover, he gave unostentatiously to many outside charities of whose worthiness he was satisfied. He was simple and frugal in his habits. He never went to the theater, never drank wine. He gave much time to the training of his children, seeking to develop in them his own habits of economy and of charity. Yet he was willing to strain every nerve to obtain for himself special and unjust privileges from the railroads which were bound to ruin every man in the oil business not sharing them with him. He was willing to array himself against the combined better sentiment of a whole industry to oppose a popular movement aimed at righting an injustice so revolting to one sense of fair play as that of railroad discriminations. Religious emotion and sentiment of charity, propriety, and self-denial seemed to have taken the place in him of notions of justice and regard for the rights of others. Unhampered, then, by any ethical consideration, undismayed by the clamor of the oil regions, believing firmly as ever that relief for the disorders in the oil business lay in combining and controlling the entire refining interest, this man of vast patience and foresight took up his work. That work now was to carry out some kind of a scheme which would limit the output of refined oil. He had put his competitors in Cleveland out of the way. He had secured special privileges in transportation, but there were still too many refineries at work to make it possible to put up the price of oil four cents a gallon. It was certain, too, that no scheme could be worked to do that unless the oil regions could be mollified. That now was Mr. Rockefeller's most important business. Just how he began is not known. It is only certain that the day after the newspapers of the oil regions printed the report of the Congressional Committee on Commerce denouncing the South Improvement Company as one of the most gigantic and dangerous conspiracies ever attempted, and declaring that if it had not been checked in time, it would have resulted in the absorption and arbitrary control of trade in all the great interests of the country, Mr. Rockefeller and several other members of the South Improvement Company appeared in the oil regions. They had come, they explained, to present a new plan of cooperation, and to show the oil men that it was to their interest to go into it. Whether they would be able to obtain by persuasion what they had failed to obtain by assault was now an interesting uncertainty. End of chapter 3. Recording by Tom Weiss. Tom's Audiobooks dot com. Chapter 4, Part 1 of The History of Standard Oil, Volume 1, by Ida Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter 4, An Unholy Alliance. 
The feeling of outrage and resentment against the Standard Oil Company, general in the oil regions at the close of the Oil War, because of the belief that it intended to carry on the South Improvement Company in some new way, was intensified in the weeks immediately following the outbreak by the knowledge that Mr. Rockefeller had been so enormously benefited by the short-lived concern. Here he was shipping eastward over one road between 4,000 and 5,000 barrels of refined oil a day. Oil wrung from his neighbors by an outrageous conspiracy, men said bitterly. This feeling was still keen when Mr. Rockefeller and several of his colleagues in the South Improvement Scheme suddenly in May 1873 appeared on the streets of Titusville. The men who had fought him so desperately now stared in amazement at the smiling unruffled countenance with which he greeted them. Did not the man know when he was beaten? Did he not realize the opinion the oil regions held of him? His placid demeanor in the very teeth of their violence was disconcerting. Not less of a shock was given the country by the knowledge that Mr. Rockefeller, Mr. Flagler, Mr. Waring, and the other gentlemen in their party were pressing a new alliance, and that they claimed that their new scheme had none of the obnoxious features of the defunct South Improvement Company, though it was equally well adapted to work out the good of the oil business. For several days the visiting gentlemen slipped around, bland and smiling from street corner to street corner, from office to office, explaining, expostulating, mollifying. You misunderstand our intention, they told the refiners. It is to save the business, not to destroy it, that we are come. You see the disorders competition has wrought in the oil industry. Let us see what combination will do. Let us make an experiment, that is all. If it does not work, then we can go back to the old method. Although Mr. Rockefeller was everywhere and heard everything in these days, he rarely talked. I remember well how little he said, one of the most aggressively independent of the Titusville refiners told the writer. One day several of us met at the office of one of the refiners who I felt pretty sure was being persuaded to go into the scheme which they were talking up. Everybody talked except Mr. Rockefeller. He sat in a rocking chair, softly swinging back and forth, his hands over his face. I got pretty excited when I saw how those South Improvement men were pulling the wool over our men's eyes and making them believe we were all going to the dogs if there wasn't an immediate combination to put up the price and refine and prevent new people coming into the business, and I made a speech which I guess was pretty warlike. Well, right in the middle of it John Rockefeller stopped rocking and took down his hands and looked at me. You never saw such eyes. He took me all in, saw just how much fight he could expect from me, and I knew it, and then up went his hands, and back and forth went his chair. For fully a week this quiet circulation among the oil men went on, and then on May 15 and 16 public meetings were held in Titusville at which the new scheme which they had been advocating was presented publicly. This new plan, called the Pittsburgh Plan from the place of its birth, had been worked out by the visiting gentlemen before they came to the oil regions. It was a most intelligent and comprehensive proposition. As in the case of the South Improvement Scheme, a company was to be formed to run the refining business of the whole country, but this company was to be an open instead of a secret organization, and all refiners were to be allowed to become stockholders in it. The owners of the refineries who went into the combination were then to run them in certain particulars according to the direction of the board of the parent company. That is, they were to refine only such an amount of oil as the board allowed, and they were to keep up the price for their output as the board indicated. The buying of crude oil and the arrangements for transportation were also to remain with the directors. Each stockholder was to receive dividends whether his plant operated or not. The Pittsburgh plan was presented tentatively. If anything better could be suggested, they would gladly accept it, its advocates said. All we want is a practical combination. We are wed to no particular form. The first revelation of the public meetings at which the Pittsburgh plan was presented was that in the days Mr. Rockefeller and his friends had been so diligently shaking hands with the oilmen from Titusville to Oil City, they had made converts that they had not entered these open meetings until they had secured the assurance of cooperation 
in any plan of consolidation which might be effected from some of the ablest refiners and businessmen of the creek, notably from J. J. Vandergriff of Oil City and from certain firms of Titusville with which John D. Archbold was connected. All of these persons had fought the South Improvement Company, and they all now declared that if the proposed organization copied that piratical scheme they would have nothing to do with it, that their allegiance to the plan was based on their conviction that it was fair to all who went in, and that it was made necessary by over-refining, underselling, and by the certainty that the railroads could not be trusted to keep their contracts. It was evident that the possible profits and power to be gained by a successful combination had wiped out their resentment against the leaders of the South Improvement Company, and that if they had the assurance, as they must have had, that rebates were a part of the game, they justified themselves by the reflection that somebody was sure to get them, and that it might as well be they as anybody. The knowledge that a considerable body of the creek refiners had gone over to Mr. Rockefeller awakened a general bitterness among those who remained independent. Deserters, ringsters, monopolists were the terms applied to them, and the temper of the public meetings, as is evident from the full reports of the oil region published, became at once uncertain. There were long pauses in the proceedings, everybody fearing to speak. Mr. Rockefeller is not reported as having spoken at all, the brunt of defense and explanation having fallen on Mr. Flagler, Mr. Frew, and Mr. Waring. Two or three times the convention wrangled to the point of explosion, and one important refiner, M. N. Allen, who was also the editor of the Titusville Courier, one of the best papers in the region, took his hat and left. Before the end of the convention the supporters of combination ought to have felt, if they did not, that they had been a little too eager in pressing an alliance on the oil regions so soon after outraging its moral sentiment. The press and people were making it plain enough, indeed, that they did not trust the persuasive advocates of reform. On every street corner and on every railroad train men reckoned the percentage of interest the stockholders of the South Improvement Company would have in the new combination. It was too great. But what stirred the oil region most deeply was its conviction that the rebate system was regarded as the keystone of the new plan. "'What are you going to do with the men who prefer to run their own business?' asked the representative of the Oil City Derrick of one of the advocates of the plan. "'Go through them,' was reported to be his laconic reply. "'But how?' "'By the cooperation of transportation, that is, by rebates.' Now, the oil region had been too recently convicted of the sin of the rebate and had taken too firm a determination to uproot the iniquitous practice to be willing to ally itself with any combination which it suspected of accepting privileges which its neighbors could not get or would not take. At the very time the Association of Refiners was under consideration, an attempt was made to win over the producers by offering, through their union, to buy all their oil at five dollars a barrel for five years. Oil was four dollars at the time. The producers refused. Such an agreement could only be kept, they said, by an association which was an absolute monopoly, fixing prices of refined to satisfy its own greed. All they wanted of the producer was to be a party to their conspiracy. When they had destroyed his moral force and completed their monopoly, they would pay him what they pleased for oil, and the price would not be five dollars. What could he do then? He would be their slave, there would be no other buyer could be none, since they would control the entire transportation system. The upshot of the negotiations was that again the advocates of combination had to retire from the oil regions, defeated. Seek Semper Tirana, seek Transit Gloria South Improvement Company, sneered the oil city Derrick, which was given to sprinkling Latin phrases into its forceful and picturesque English. But the Derrick underrated both the man and the principle at which it sneered. A great idea was at work in the commercial world. It had come to them saddled with crime. They now saw nothing in it but the crime. The man who had brought it to them was not only endowed with far vision, he was endowed with an indomitable purpose. He meant to control the oil business. By one maneuver, and that a discredited one, he had obtained control of one-fifth of the entire refining output of the United States. He meant to secure the other four-fifths. He might retire now, but the oil region would hear of him again. 
It did. Three months later, in August 1872, it was learned that the scheme of consolidation which had been presented in vain at Titusville in May had been quietly carried out, that four-fifths of the refining interest of the United States, including many of the creek refiners, had gone into a National Refiners Association, of which Mr. Rockefeller was president, and one of their own men, J. J. Vandergrift, was vice president. The news aroused much resentment in the oil regions. The region was no longer solid in its free trade sentiment, no longer undividedly true to its vow that the rebate system, as applied to the oil trade, must end. There was an enemy at home. The hard words which for months men had heaped on the distant heads of Cleveland and Pittsburgh refiners, they began to pour out, more discreetly to be sure, on the heads of their neighbors. It boded ill for the interior peace of the oil regions. The news that the refiners had actually consolidated aroused something more than resentment. The producers generally were alarmed. If the aggregation succeeded they would have one buyer only for their product, and there was not a man of them who believed that this buyer would pay them a cent more than necessary for their oil. Their alarm aroused them to energy. The association which had scattered the South Improvement Company was revived, and began at once to consider what it could do to prevent the consolidated refiners getting the upper hand in the business. The association which now prepared to contest the mastery of the oil business with Mr. Rockefeller and those who had joined him was a curious and remarkable body. Its membership, drawn from the length and breadth of the oil regions, included men whose production was thousands of barrels a day and men who were pumping scarcely ten barrels. It included college-bred men who had come from the East with comfortable sums to invest, and men who signed their names with an effort, had never read a book in their lives, and whose first wells they had themselves kicked down. There were producers in it who had made and lost a half-dozen fortunes, and who were apparently just as buoyant and helpful as when they began. There were those who had never put down a dry well, and were still unsatisfied. However diverse their fortunes, their breeding, and their luck, there was no difference in the spirit which animated them now. The president of the association was Captain William Hassan, a young man both by his knowledge of the oil regions and the oil business well fitted for the position. Captain Hassan was one of the few men in the association who had been in the country before the discovery of oil. His father had bought in the fifties part of the grant of land at the mouth of Oil Creek, made in 1796 to the Indian chief Juan Planter, and had moved on it with his family. Four years after the discovery of oil, he and his partner disposed of 300 acres of the tract they owned for $750,000. Young Hassan had seen Juan Planter, as the site of his father's farm was called, become Oil City. He had seen the mill, blacksmith shop, and country tavern give way to a thriving town of several thousand inhabitants. All of his interests and his pride were wrapped up in the industry which had grown up about him. Independent in spirit, vigorous in speech, generous and just in character, William Hassan had been thoroughly aroused by the assault of the South Improvement Company, and under his presidency the producers had conducted their successful campaign. The knowledge that the same man who had been active in that scheme had now organized a national association had convinced Captain Hassan of the necessity of a counter-move, and he threw himself energetically into an effort to persuade the oil producers to devise an intelligent and practical plan for controlling their end of the business, and then stand by what they had decided on. Captain Hassan and those who were working with him would have had a much more difficult task in arousing the producers to action if it had not been for the general dissatisfaction over the price of oil. The average price of crude in the month of August, 1872, was $3.47.5. The year before, it had been $4.42.5, and that was considered a poverty price. It was pretty certain that the prices would fall still lower, that $3 oil was near at hand. Everybody declared $3 was not a living price for oil, that it cost more than that to produce it. The average yield of the wells in the oil region in 1872 was five barrels a day. Now a well cost at that time from $2,500 to 
exclusive of the price of the lease. It cost eight to ten dollars a day to pump a well, exclusive of the royalty interest, that is, the proportion of the production turned over to the landowner, usually one-fourth. If a man had big wells, and many of them, he made big profits on three-dollar oil, but there were comparatively few big producers. The majority of those in the business had but few wells, and these yielded only small amounts. If he had been contented to economize and to accept smaller gains, even the small producer could live on a much lower price than three dollars. But nobody in the oil regions in 1872 looked with favor on economy, and everybody despised small things. The oil men as a class had been brought up to enormous profits and held an entirely false standard of values. As Derrick told them once in a sensible editorial, their business was born in a balloon going up and spent all its early years in the sky. They had seen nothing but the extreme of fortune. One hundred percent per annum on an investment was, in their judgment, only a fair profit. If their oil property had not paid for itself entirely in six months and begun to yield a good percentage, they were inclined to think it a failure. Now nothing but five-dollar oil would do this, so great were the risks in business. And so it was for five-dollar oil, regardless of the laws of supply and demand, that they struggled. They were notoriously extravagant in the management of their business. Rarely did an oil man write a letter if he could help it he used the telegraph instead. Whole sets of drilling tools were sometimes sent by express. It was no uncommon thing to see near a derrick broken tools which could easily have been mended, but which the owner had replaced by new ones. It was anything to save bother with him. Frequently wells were abandoned which might have been pumped on a small but sure profit. In those days there were men who looked on a ten-barrel net well as hardly worth taking care of and yet even at fifty cents a barrel such a well would have paid the owner eighteen hundred dollars a year. The simple fact was that the profits which men in trades all over the country were glad enough to get, the oil producer despised. The one great thing which the oil regions did not understand in 1872 was economy. As a matter of fact, the oil-producing business was going through a stage in its natural development similar to oil refining. Both under the stimulus of the enormous profits in the years immediately following the discovery of oil had been pushed until they had outstripped consumption. The competition resulting from the inrush of producers and refiners and the economies which had been worked out were bringing down profits. The combinations attempted by both refiners and producers in these years were really efforts to keep up prices to the extravagant point of the early speculative years. Now, the drop in the price of oil everybody recognized to be due to a natural cause. Where a year before the production had been 12,000 barrels a day, it was now 16,000. The demand for refined had not increased in proportion to this production of crude, and oil stocks had accumulated until the tanks of the region were threatening to overflow, and there was no sign of falling off. Under these circumstances it needed little argument to convince the oil man that if they were to get a better price they must produce no more than the world would use. There was but one way to effect this, to put down no new wells until the stocks on hand were reduced and the daily production was brought down to a marketable level. Under the direction of the Producers' Association an agitation at once began in favor of stopping the drill for six months. It was a drastic measure. There was hardly an oil operator in the entire region who had not on hand some piece of territory on which he was planning to drill, or on which he had not wells under way. Stopping the drill meant that all of the aggressive work of his business should cease for six months. It meant that his production, unreplenished, would gradually fall off, until at the end of the period he would have probably not over half of what he had now that then he must begin over again to build up. It meant, too, that he was at the mercy of neighbors who might refuse to join the movement and who by continuing to drill would drain his territory. It seemed to him the only way of obtaining a manageable output of crude, however, and accordingly when late in the month of August the following pledge to stop the drill was circulated, the great majority of the producers signed it. Whereas, 
the extreme low price of oil requires of producers that operations therefore shall cease for the present now we the producers land owners and others residents of the pennsylvania oil region do hereby bind ourselves to each other not to commence the drilling of any more wells for the period of six months from the first day of september next not to lease any lands owned or controlled by us for the purpose of operations during the same period and we also agree to use all honorable means to prevent others from boring this we agree to and bind ourselves to each other under a forfeiture of two thousand dollars for each well commenced by either of us within the period above limited the same to be collected as any other debt it is however understood by the undersigned that this forfeiture is not to apply to any wells where the erection of rigs is completed or under way, or that may be commenced before the first day of September aforesaid. The chief objection to this pledge came from landowners in Clarion County. They were the original settlers, plodding Dutch farmers whose lives had always been poor and hard and shut in. The finding of oil had made them rich and greedy. They were so ignorant that it was difficult to transact business of any nature with them. It was not unusual for a Clarion County farmer, if offered an eighth royalty, to refuse it on the ground that it was too little, and to ask a tenth. A story used to be current in the oil regions of a producer who, returning from an unsuccessful land hunt in Clarion County, was asked why he had not secured a certain lease. Well, he said, farmers wanted seven-eighths of the oil as a royalty wanted me to furnish barrels and to paint both heads. I agreed to everything but the last. I could afford to paint but one head, so he wouldn't sign the lease. When the proposition to stop the drill for six months was brought to these men, who at the time owned the richest territory in the oil field, no amount of explanation could make them understand it. They regarded it simply as a scheme to rob them and would not sign. Outside of this district, however, the drill stopped over nearly all the field on the 1st of September. There was nothing but public opinion to hold the producers to their pledge. But public opinion in those days in the oil regions was fearless and active, and asserted itself in the daily newspapers and in every meeting of the association. The whole body of oil men became a vigilance committee intent on keeping one another loyal to the pledge. Men who appeared at church on Sunday in silk hats, carrying gold-headed canes, these were such in the oil region in 1872, now stole out at night to remote localities to hunt down rumors of drilling wells. If they found them to be true, their dignity did not prevent their cutting the tools loose or carrying off a band wheel. Stopping the drill afforded no immediate relief to the producers. It was for the future, and as soon as the Petroleum Producers Association had the movement well under way, it proposed another drastic measure, a thirty days shutdown, by which it meant that all wells should cease pumping for a month. Nothing shows better the compact organization and the determination of the oil producers at this time than the immediate response they gave to this suggestion. In ten days scarcely a barrel of oil was being pumped from end to end of the oil regions. That a business producing three million dollars a month employing ten thousand laboring men and fifty million dollars of capital, should be entirely suspended, dried up, stopped still as death by a mutual voluntary agreement, made and perfected by all parties interested within a space of ten days, this is a statement that staggers belief, a spectacle that takes one breath away, cried the Derrick, which was using all its wits to persuade the producers to limit their production. It was certainly a spectacle which saddened the heart, however much one might applaud the grim resolution of the men who were carrying it out. The crowded oil farms where creaking walking beams sawed the air from morning until night, where engines puffed, whistles screamed, great gas jets flared, teams came and went, and men hurried to and fro, became suddenly silent and desolate, and this desolation had an ugliness all its own, something unparalleled in any other industry of this country. The awkward derricks, staring cheap shanties, big tanks with miles and miles of pipe running hither and thither, the oil-soaked ground, blackened and ruined trees, terrible roads, all of the common features of the oil farm to which activity gave meaning and dignity, now became hideous in inactivity. 
Oil seemed a curse to many a man in those days as he stood by his silent wells and wondered what was to become of his business, of his family, in this clash of interests. While the producers were inaugurating these movements, Captain Hasson and a committee were busy making out the plan of the permanent association, which was to control the business of oil producing and prevent its becoming the slave of the refining interest. The knowledge that such an organization was being worked out kept the oil country in a ferment. In every district suggestions, practical and impractical, wise and foolish, occupied every producer's meeting and kept the idle oil men discussing from morning until night. At one mass meeting the following resolution was actually passed by a body of revengeful producers. Resolved that to give a wider market throughout the world for petroleum, to enhance its price and to protect producers from unjust combinations of home refiners, a committee be appointed to ask the representatives of foreign governments at Washington to request their respective governments to put a proper tariff on refined oil and to admit crude oil free into the ports of their respective governments. Toward the end of October, Captain Hassan presented the scheme which he and the committee had prepared. It proposed that there should be established what was called a Petroleum Producers Agency. This agency was really an incorporated company with a capital of $1 million, the stock of which was to be subscribed to only by the producers or their friends. This agency was to purchase all the oil of the members of the association at at least $5 a barrel. If stocks could be kept down so that the market took all the oil at once, the full price was to be paid at once in cash. If not, the agency was to store the oil in tanks it was to build, and a portion of the price was to be paid in tank certificates. By thus controlling all the oil, the agency expected to protect the weakest as well as the strongest producer, to equalize the interest of different localities, to prevent refiners and exporters from accumulating stocks, and to prevent gambling in oil. The agency was to take active means to collect reliable information about the oil business, the number of wells drilling, the actual production, the stocks on hand, things which had never been done to anybody's satisfaction. Indeed, one of the standing causes for quarrels between the various newspapers of the region was their conflicting statistics about production and stocks. It was to make a study of the market and to see what could be done to increase consumption. It was to oppose monopolies and encourage competition, and, if necessary, it was to provide cooperative refineries which the producers should own and control. The spirit of the agency, as explained by Captain Hassan, was most liberal, considering the interests of even the drillers and pumpers advise every employee to take at least one share of stock for himself, he said in his address, and one for his wife and each of his children, and encourage him to pay for it out of his saved earnings or out of his monthly pay. If he is not able to keep up his installments, assure him that you will help him, and then take care to do it. You will thus do him a double kindness, and benefit his family by encouraging habits of thrift and economy. You owe this much to him who so nobly seconded your efforts to gain control of the market by stopping work. You had all to gain, and he had nothing to hope for but your benefit. Now show your appreciation of his act by this evidence of your regard for his welfare. The plan was received with general enthusiasm, and when it came up for adoption it went through with a veritable whoop. Indeed, with a few moments after its official acceptance, which took place in Oil City on October 24, $200,000 worth of stock was taken, and less than two weeks later it was announced that more than the desired million dollars had been subscribed, that the trustees and officers had been elected, and that the agency was ready for work. For the first time in the history of the oil business, the producers were united in an organization which, if carried out, would regulate the production of oil to something like the demand for it, would prevent stocks from falling into the hands of speculators, and would provide a strong front to any combination with monopolistic tendencies. Only one thing was necessary now to make the producer a fitting opponent to his natural enemy, the refiner. That thing was loyalty to the agency it had established. The future of the producer at that moment was in his own hand. Would he stick? by every sign he would. He thought so himself. He had acted so resolutely and intelligently up to this point that even Mr. Rockefeller seems to have thought so. 
During the entire three months that the producers had been organizing, the refiners had been making divers' overtures to them. In August, several of the refiners sought certain of the big producers and privately proposed a two-headed combination which should handle the whole business, from drilling to exportation. The proposition they made was most alluring to men suffering from low prices. "'Carry out your plans to limit your production and guarantee to sell only to us,' said Mr. Rockefeller's representative, "'and we will give you four dollars a barrel for your oil. We will also establish a sliding scale, and for every cent a gallon that refined oil advances, we will give you twenty-five cents more on your barrel of crude.' The market price of crude oil, when this offer was made, was hovering around three dollars. How, asked the producer, can you do this? We expect, by means of our combination, to get a rebate of seventy-five cents a barrel, was the answer. But the railroads have signed an agreement to give no rebates, objected the producers. As if the railroads ever kept an agreement, answered the worldly wise refiners. Somebody will get the rebates. It is the way the railroads do business. If it is to be anybody, we propose it shall be our combination. Now it was clear enough to the men approached that the great body of their association would never go into any scheme based on rebates, and they said so. The refiners saw no disadvantage in that fact. We don't want all the producers, we only want the big ones. The small producer under our arrangement must die, as the small refiner must. The proposition never got beyond the conference chamber. It was too cynical. Several conferences of the same nature took place later between representatives of the two interests, but nothing came of them. The two associations were kept apart by the natural antagonism of their ideals and their policy. Captain Hassan and his followers were working on an organization which aimed to protect the weakest as well as the strongest, which welcomed everybody who cared to come into the business, which encouraged competition and discountenanced any sort of special privilege. Mr. Rockefeller and his associates proposed to save the strong and eliminate the weak, to limit the membership to those who came in now to prevent competition by securing exclusive privileges. Their program was cold-blooded, but it must be confessed that it showed a much firmer grasp on the commercial practices of the day and a much deeper knowledge of human nature as it operates in business than that of the producers. The formation of the producers' agency brought the refiners back to the oil regions in greater earnest than ever. The success of that organization gave them an active antagonist, one which, as it held the raw material, could at any time actually shut up the refineries by withholding oil. The vigor, the ability, the determination the new organization had displayed made it a serious threat to the domination Mr. Rockefeller and his associates had dreamed. It must be placated. On November 8th, immediately after it was announced that the entire million dollars' worth of stock was taken, an agent of the Standard Oil Company in Oil City was ordered to buy oil from the agency, 6,000 barrels of oil at $4.75 a barrel, and the order was followed by this telegram from Mr. Rockefeller. It has been represented to us that if we would buy of the producer's agent at Oil City and pay $4.75 per barrel, they would maintain the price. We are willing to go farther and buy only of the producer's agent, hence the order we have given you. See Hassan and others and let there be a fair understanding on this point. We will do all in our power to maintain prices and continue to buy, provided our position is fully understood. We do this to convince producers of our sincerity and to assist in establishing the market. A more adroit move could not have been made at this moment. This purchase was a demonstration that the Refiners' Association could, and would, pay the price the producers asked, that they asked nothing better, in fact, than to ally themselves with the agency. The events of the next three weeks, on the contrary, showed the agency that it would be some time before anybody else would pay them any such price as that Mr. Rockefeller promised. The reason was evident enough. In spite of the stopping of the drill, in spite of the thirty days' shutdown, production was increasing. Indeed, the runs for November were greater than they had ever been in any single month since the beginning of the oil business. A large number of wells under way when the drill was stopped had come in big. New territory had been opened up by unexpected wildcats. 
the shutdown had done less than was expected to decrease stocks. It was evident that the Producers' Association had a long and severe task before it to bring the crude output down to anything like the demand. Could the great body of producers be depended upon to take still further measures to lessen their production, and at the same time would they hold their oil until the agency had the mastery of the situation? Their tanks were overflowing. Many of them were in debt, and depending on their sales to meet their obligations, even to meet their daily personal expenses. It was little wonder that they grew rested as they began to realize that the agency in which they had seen immediate salvation from all their ills could only be made effective by months more of self-sacrifice, of agitation, of persistent effort from every man of them. With every day they became more impatient of the bonds the agency had set for them, and the leaders soon realized that some immediate tangible results must be given the mass of oil men, or there was danger of a stampede. This is the end of Chapter 4, Part 1, recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks, dot com. Chapter 4, Part 2 of The History of Standard Oil, Volume 1 by Ida Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter 4 An Unholy Alliance. A strong feature of the genius of John D. Rockefeller has always been his recognition of the critical moment for action in complicated situations. He saw it now, and his representatives again came to the creek seeking an alliance. Their arguments as they found their way from the private meetings into the press in the street ran something like this. Our combination is the only big buyer. We are in the thing to stay, and shall remain the only big buyer. You might erect refineries and oppose us, but it would take months, and while you are waiting, how are you going to hold the producers? You cannot do it. We can easily get all the oil we want today at our own price from the men who sell from necessity, and yet your agency is in the first flush of enthusiasm. Sell only to us, and we will buy 15,000 barrels a day from you. Refuse an alliance with us, and you will fail. Overwhelmed by the length and severity of the struggle before them if they insisted on independence, fearful lest the scattered and restless producers could not be held much longer, convinced by their confident arguments that the refiners could keep their promise, the Council finally agreed to a plan of union which the Derrick dubbed the Treaty of Titusville. A terrible hubbub followed the announcement that a treaty was proposed and would probably be adopted by the Association. The same old arguments which had greeted each overture from the refiners were gone over again. It would be a monopoly. The price they offered for crude depended upon their getting an unnaturally high price for refined. The markets of the world would refuse to pay this price when it was discovered that it was kept up by an agreement which was contrary to the laws of supply and demand. And, besides, the parties could not trust each other. Timmy O'Donnell Osedona Ferentes, liberal translation, Mind your eye when the Cleveland refiners get generous, cautioned the dairy. As always, the ghost of the South Improvement Company was between them. On the other hand, it was argued that it was Hobson's choice. Combine or bust, there is no other market. We cannot wait for one. We have a million barrels of oil on hand. The refiners will take 15,000 barrels a day, for spot cash. And after all, concluded the philosophical, if you can't do as well as you want to, do the best you can. On December 12 the proposed treaty was laid before the producers at Oil City. It aroused a debate so acrimonious that even the Derricks suppressed it. Captain Hansen led the opposition. In his judgment there was but one course for the producers to keep themselves free from all entanglements and give themselves time to build up solidly the structure they had planned. If they had followed his advice, the whole history of the oil regions would have been different. But they did not follow it. The treaty was ratified by a vote of twenty-seven to seven. 
the excitement and the personalities the association indulged in at their meeting augured ill for its future but when a week later a committee to see the refiners came back from new york with a contract signed by mr rockefeller the president and bearing with them an order for two hundred thousand barrels of oil at three dollars and twenty-five cents there was a general feeling that after all an alliance might not be so bad a thing two hundred thousand barrels was a big order and would do much to relieve their distress their formal sense was quieted too by the assurance that the producers before signing the contract had insisted that the refiner's combination enter into an agreement to take no rebates as long as the alliance lasted the main points of the agreement decided upon were that the refiners association should admit all existing refiners to its society and the producers association all producers present and to come that the former company should buy only from the latter the latter sell only to the former and that the agency should bind all producers enjoying its privileges to handle their oil through it. The refiners were to buy such daily quantities as the markets of the world would take, and at a price governed by the price of refined, five dollars per barrel when refined was selling at twenty-six cents a gallon. Either association could discontinue the agreement on ten days' notice. The producers, before signing the contract, insisted that the refiners' combination sign an agreement to take no rebates as long as the alliance lasted. This agreement in regard to rebates read as follows. Whereas it is deemed desirable to execute a contract of even date herewith between the Petroleum Producers Association and the Petroleum Refiners Association, for the purpose of securing a cooperation for mutual protection, it is agreed by the Refiners Association that Sections 1 and 3 of a contract made the 25th of March 1872, between certain trunk lines of railroads and a committee of producers and refiners, shall be and remain in full force. Petroleum Refiners Association. John D. Rockefeller. President. The sections of the contract of the 25th of March referred to agreed that no rebates or contracts or other arrangements should be made which would give any party the slightest difference in rates and that the rates should not be changed either for increase or decrease without first giving Mr. Hassan, the president of the Producers' Union, at least ninety days' notice in writing. As we now know, Mr. Rockefeller himself was receiving rebates when he signed this agreement. And now, at last, after five months of incessant work, the agency was ready to begin disposing of oil. They set to work diligently at once to apportion the 200,000 barrels the refiners had bought among the different districts. It was a slow and irritating task, for a method of appointment and of gathering had to be devised, and, as was to be expected, it aroused more or less dissatisfaction and many charges of favoritism. The agency had the work well under way, however, and had shipped about 50,000 barrels when, on January 14, it was suddenly announced that the refiners had refused to take any more of the contract oil. There was a hurried call of the producers' council and a demand for an explanation. A plausible one was ready for Mr. Rockefeller. You have not kept your part of the contract. You have not limited the supply of oil. There is more being pumped today than ever before in the history of the region. We can buy all we want at $2.50, and oil has sold within the week at two dollars if you will not or cannot stop overproduction can you expect us to pay your price we keep down the output of refined and so keep up the price if you will not do the same you must not expect high prices what could the producers reply in spite of their heroic measures they had not been able to curtail their output it seemed as if nature outraged that her generosity should be so manipulated as to benefit only the few, had opened her veins to flood the earth with oil, so that all men might know that here was a light cheap enough for the poorest of them. Her lavish outpouring now swept away all of the artificial restraints the producers and refiners had been trying to build. The Producers' Association seemed suddenly to comprehend their folly in supposing that when five thousand barrels more of oil was produced each day than the market demanded, any combination could long keep the contract the refiners had made with them. And their unhappy session 
made more unhappy by the reading of bitter and accusing letters from all over the discontented region, ended in a complete stampede from the refiners, the vote for dissolving the alliance having but one dissenting vote. There were few tears shed in the oil regions over the rupture of the contract. The greater part of the oil men had called it from the beginning an unholy alliance, and rejoiced that it was a fiasco. If the alliance had been all that came to an end, the case would not have been so serious, but it was not. The breaking of the alliance proved the death of the agency and the association. The leaders who had disapproved of the treaty withdrew from active work. The supporters of the alliance, demoralized by its failure, were glad to keep quiet. A few spasmodic efforts to stop the drill, to inaugurate another shutdown were made, but failed. Most of the producers felt that, as oil was so low, their only safety was in getting as large a production as they could, and a perfect fever of development followed. The Producers' Association, after ten months of as exciting and strenuous effort as an organization has ever put in, was snuffed out almost in a day. It was to be five years before the oil men recovered sufficiently from the shock of this collapse to make another united effort. If Mr. Rockefeller felt in the fall of 1872 that the good of the oil business required the dissolution of the producer's agency, he could not have acted with more acumen than he did in leading them into an alliance and at the psychological moment throwing up his contract. Humiliated as the producers were by their failure, they soon found consolidation in the knowledge that the Refiners' Association was in trouble. A serious thing, in fact, had happened. When the official report of the year's exports and imports came out, it was shown that the exports of refined oil had fallen off for the first time in the history of the business. In 1871, 132,178,843 gallons had been exported. In 1872, only 118,259,832 were exported. Just as alarming was the proof that the shale and coal oil refineries of Europe had taken a fresh start, that they were selling their products more cheaply than kerosene could be imported and sold. There was a general outcry from all over the country that Mr. Rockefeller and his associates were running the oil business by keeping up the price of refined oil beyond what the price of crude justified. The producers, eager for a scapegoat, argued that the low price of crude was due to decreased consumption as well as overproduction, and their ill will against Mr. Rockefeller flared up anew. In the meantime, the Refiners Association was having troubles of its own. The members were not limiting their output as they had agreed. That is, it was discovered every now and then that a refinery was making more oil than Mr. Rockefeller had directed. Again, what was more fatal to the success of the association, members sometimes sold at a lower price than that set by Mr. Rockefeller. These restrictions were fundamental to the success of the combination, and the members were called together at Saratoga in June 1873, and after a long session the association was dissolved. There was loud exultation in the unthinking part of the oil regions over the dissolution of the refiners. The junior anaconda was dead. The wiser part of the region did not exult. They knew that though the combination might dissolve, the Standard Oil Company of Cleveland still controlled its one-fifth of the capacity of the country, that not only had Mr. Rockefeller been able to hold the twenty refineries he had bolted so summarily at the opening of 1872, but he had assimilated them so thoroughly that he was making enormous profits. Mr. Rockefeller's contracts with the Central Railroad, alone in 1873 and 1874, obliged him for seven months of the year to ship at least 100,000 barrels of refined oil a month to the seaboard. As a matter of fact, he never shipped less than 108,000 barrels, and in one month of the period it rose to 180,000. Now, in 1873 he made, at the very lowest figure, three cents a gallon on his oil. Estimating his shipments simply at 700,000 barrels a year, and they were much more, his profits for that year were $1,050,000, 
and this accounts for no profits on about 35 per cent of the standard output which was sold locally or shipped westward. Little wonder that the Cleveland refiners who had been snuffed out the year before, and who saw their plants run at such advantage, grew bitter, or that gossip said the Daily Mail of the president of the Standard Oil Company was enlivened by so many threats of revenge that he took extraordinary precautions about appearing unguarded in public. It is worth noticing that these great profits were not being used for private purposes. In 1872 the Standard Oil paid a dividend of 37%, but in 1873 they cut it to 15%. The profits were going almost solidly into the extension and solidification of the business. Mr. Rockefeller was building great barrel factories, thus cutting down to the minimum one of a refiner's heaviest expenses. He was buying tank cars that might be independent of the vagaries of the railroads in allowing cars. He was gaining control of terminal facilities in New York. He was putting his plants into the most perfect condition, introducing every improved process which would cheapen his manufacturing by the smallest fraction of a cent. He was diligently hunting methods to get a larger percentage of profit from crude oil. There was perhaps ten percent of waste at that period in crude oil. It hurt him to see it unused, and no man had a heartier welcome from the president of the Standard Oil Company than he who would show him how to utilize any portion of his residuum. In short, Mr. Rockefeller was strengthening his line at every point, and to no part of it was he giving closer attention than to transportation. End of chapter four. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks.com. Chapter Five, Part One of the History of Standard Oil, Volume One, by Ida Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Laying the Foundation of a Trust. Throughout 1872, while the producers and refiners were working out associations and alliances to regulate the output of crude and refined oil, the freight rates over the three great oil-carrying roads were publicly supposed to be those settled by the agreement of March 25. Except by the sophisticated it was believed that the railroads were keeping their contracts. The Lake Shore and Michigan Southern and the New York Central had never kept them, as we have seen. Mr. Flagler's statement that the Standard received a rebate of 25 cents a barrel from April 1 to November 15, 1872, would seem to show that while with one hand Mr. Clark and Mr. Vanderbilt signed the agreement with the oil men that henceforth freight should be on a basis of perfect equality to all shippers, producers, and refiners, and that no rebates, drawbacks, or other arrangements of any character should be made or allowed that would give any party the slightest difference in rates or discriminations of any character whatever. With the other they had signed an arrangement to give a twenty-five-cent rebate to Mr. Rockefeller. They certainly had a strong incentive for ignoring their pledge. Consider what Mr. Rockefeller could offer the road. Sixty carloads of oil a day, over four thousand barrels. General Devereux points out in the affidavit already mentioned what this meant. It permitted them to make up a solid oil train and run it out every day. By running nothing else they reduced the average time of a freight car from Cleveland to New York and return from thirty days to ten days. The investment for cars to handle their freight was reduced by this arrangement to about one-third what it would have been if several different persons were shipping the same amount every day. Promptness was ensured in forwarding and returning, a drawback of from fifty dollars to one hundred and fifty dollars a day accrued if it was late, so that the standard was bound to ship promptly and all the inconvenience of dealing with many shippers, each with his peculiar whim or demand, was avoided. It was certainly worth a rebate to the Central, and the Central not having any prejudices in favor of keeping agreements, because they were agreements naturally conceded what Mr. Rockefeller wanted. There was another point. If the Central did not concede to Mr. Rockefeller's terms, it undoubtedly would lose the freight. There was the lake and the canal, and there was the Erie. Now, it is not supposable that such an arrangement would go on long without leaking out in the upper oil circles. 
we have evidence that it did not. Indeed, there was among certain intelligent oil men a conviction when the agreement was signed that the New York roads would not regard it, that if they did it would ruin the refining business of Cleveland. W. T. Scheide, a member of the oil men's committee making this contract, the agent of one of the largest oil shippers in the country, Adna Nahart, in some frank and suggestive testimony given to the Hepburn Committee in 1879, said that at the time the arrangement was made he did not think anybody connected with the business expected it would last. My reason for that was that it was an impossible agreement, said Mr. Scheide. The immediate effect of it would have been to have utterly destroyed fifty-five per cent of the refining interest of the country. That is to say, Cleveland and Pittsburgh, which during the previous four years had shipped fifty-five per cent of all the oil out of the oil regions, they, in addition to paying the rates of freights which all other refiners would have had to pay, were required to pay fifty cents a barrel on their crude oil to their works. The refiners in Cleveland and Pittsburgh had, of course, always paid to get crude oil to their works. Even the South Improvement Company tariffs provided for that. And under that arrangement Cleveland had come to be, in 1871, the chief refining center of the country. The chairman of the committee examining Mr. Scheide suggested it was a temporary impossibility which would have adjusted itself, which Mr. Scheide admitted. Yes, sir, naturally it would have adjusted itself, I suppose, but the effect was very marked at the time. So strong was Mr. Scheide's conviction that the New York roads would not stand the new rates that, on the 10th of April, he went to the Pennsylvania Railroad and asked for a rebate on Mr. Nahart's crude shipments, and got it. What the rebate was he does not state, but Mr. Flagler tells us in his testimony that in December he discovered that the Pennsylvania was shipping for as low as a dollar five cents a barrel and for one month he got from Mr. Vanderbilt a rate of a dollar five cents on his four thousand barrels a day. Mr. Scheide was also shipping refined oil over the Erie. George R. Blanchard, who in October 1872 became the general freight agent of the Erie, told the Hepburn Committee in 1879 that he found on entering his position that seven thousand dollars in rebates had been paid Mr. Scheide for Mr. Nahart in the month of September 1872, on this refine. He does not say how long this had been going on. Mr. Blanchard found at the same time the March 25 agreement. He asked why it was not observed, and the reply convinced him that it had not been kept more than two weeks by the Pennsylvania and Central Systems. The representations made to me, says Mr. Blanchard, also convinced the Atlantic and Great Western as to what our rivals were doing, and that railway company and our own decided to continue to pay the twenty-four cents for barrel drawback than being paid on the rate of a dollar thirty-five cents provided by their producers' agreement of March twenty-five, eighteen seventy-two. But Mr. Blanchard was shipping only Mr. Nahart's refined, and naturally he looked for more business and was willing to give a rebate to get it. He soon had some from another of the oil men who had signed the agreement of March 25. This was Mr. Bennett of Titusville, who with J. D. Archbold and his other partners entered into a contract with Mr. Blanchard to ship their entire product for a year at a rate considerably below the one agreed upon on March 25. The contract was a short-lived one, for in November Mr. Bennett and his partners turned their shipments over to the Pennsylvania. The Erie had some compensation, however, in the fact that in July 1873 Mr. Nahart's crude shipments had all come to them. Mr. Scheide, Mr. Nahart's agent, explained to the Hepburn Commission that he left the Pennsylvania because of what he considered very bad treatment, a discrimination against us in furnishing us cars. The Pennsylvania had indeed undertaken to carry out the clause in the agreement of March 25, which stipulated that there should be no discrimination in furnishing cars. Mr. Scheide, considering himself their shipper, that is, shipping larger quantities more regularly than anybody else, and as a consequence having better rates, thought it unfair that the car should be prorated, and left the road giving his business to the Erie, where presumably he got assurances that cars would be furnished to shippers according to the quantity and regularity of shipments. 
Mr. Shiny's excellent testimony is good evidence of how deep a hold the principle that the large shippers are to have all the advantages had taken hold of some of the best men in the oil country, although the oil country as a whole utterly repudiated the rebate business. These details, all drawn from sworn testimony, show how, before a year had passed after the end of the oil war, all the roads were practicing discrimination, how a few shippers were again engaged in a scramble for advantages, and how the big shippers were bent on re-establishing the principles supposed to have been overthrown by the oil war, that one shipper is more convenient and profitable for a road than many, and this being so, the matter of a road's duty as a common carrier has nothing to do with the question. This was the situation when in June 1873, General Devereux, whom we have met on the Lakeshore Road, became president of the Atlantic and Great Western. Now, at this time, Peter H. Watson, the president of the South Improvement Company, was president of the Erie. The two at once looked into the condition of their joint oil traffic. They found the rebate system abolished a year before, again well entrenched. Nevertheless, the Erie was not doing much business. The entire shipments of oil over the Erie for 1873 were but 762,000 barrels out of a total of 4,963,000. Naturally, they went to work to build up a trade, and their relations being what they had been with the Standard, the company controlling a third of the country's refining capacity, they went to them to see if they could not get a percentage of their seaboard shipments from Cleveland. Mr. Rockefeller was willing to give them shipments if they would make the rates as low as were given to any of his competitors on any of the roads, and if they would deliver his oil at Hunter's Points, Brooklyn, where he had oil yards, and where the Central delivered, or if they would not do that, if they would lease their own oil yards to him. There was an excellent business reason for making the latter demand, which Mr. Blanchard explained to the Hepburn Commission. The Standard, said Mr. Blanchard, had a force of men, real estate, houses, tanks, and other facilities at Hunter's Point for receiving and coopering the oil, and they had their cooperage materials delivered over there. The arrangement prior to that time was that the Erie Company performed this service for its outside refiners at Weehawken, for which the Erie Company made specific charges and added them to their rates for freight. The Standard Company said to us, We do the business at low cost at Hunter's Point, because we are expert oil men and know how to handle it. We pay nobody a profit, and cannot and ought not to pay you a profit for a service that is not transportation any more than inspecting flour or cotton, and the New York Central delivers our oil at that point. Now, if you will deliver our oil at Hunter's Point and permit us to do this business, you may do so. We want to do that business and we cannot pay to the Erie Railway Company at Weehawken a profit on all those staves, heads, cooperage, filling, refilling, and inspection, for we have our own forces of men and our own yards necessary for this work in another part of the harbor of New York, and it is not a part of your business as a carrier anyway. In lieu thereof, and for the profits that we could have made from the aggregate of these charges, we said to them, If you will pay us a fixed profit upon each one of these barrels of oil arriving here, you may take the yards and run them subject to certain limitations as to what you shall do for other people who continue to ship oil to the same yards. They were only able to make this arrangement with us because of their controlling such a large percentage of shipment and because of permanent facilities in Brooklyn. If the larger percentage of shipments had belonged to outside parties and they had no yards of their own, we would probably have retained the yards ourselves. A contract was signed on April 7, 1874. By it, the Standard agreed to ship 50% of the products of its refineries by the Erie at rates no higher than is paid by the competitors of the Standard Oil Company from competing Western refineries to New York by all rail lines, and to give all oil patrons of the Erie system a uniform price and fair and equal facilities at the Weehawken Yards. It was a very wise business deal for both parties. It made Mr. Rockefeller the favored shipper of a second trunk line, the central system was already his, and it gave him the control of that road's oil terminal so that he could know exactly what other oil patrons of the road were doing, 
one of the advantages the Southern Improvement Contract looked out for, it will be remembered. As for the Erie, it tied up to them an important trade and again put them into a position to have something to say about the division of the oil traffic, the bulk of which outside of the Standard Oil Company, the Pennsylvania, was handling. In connection with the Central, the Erie now said to the Pennsylvania that henceforth they proposed to maintain their position as oil shippers. The natural result of the determination of the Central and Erie to get from the Pennsylvania a percentage of its freight was, of course, increased cutting, and it looked as if a rate war was inevitable. At this juncture, Colonel Potts of the Empire Transportation Company, handling all of the Pennsylvania freight, suggested to his rivals that it would be a favorable time for the three trunk lines to pool their seaboard oil freight. In the discussions of this proposition, which, of course, involved a new schedule of rates, there being now practically none, it was suggested that henceforth freights be so adjusted that they would be equal to all refiners on crude and refined from all points. Such an equalization seems at first glance an unsolvable puzzle. The agents found it intricate enough. Throughout the summer of 1874 they worked on it, holding meetings at Long Branch and Saratoga, and calling into their councils a few of the leading refiners, pipeline men, and producers whom they could trust to keep quiet about the project. By the 1st of September they had an agreement worked out by which each of the three roads was to have a fixed percentage of eastern shipments. The rates to the seaboard were to amount to the same for all refiners wherever located, that is, to use one of the illustrations employed by Mr. Blanchard in explaining this scheme to the Hepburn Commission. Suppose 100 barrels of refined oil to have been sent from Cleveland to New York by rail. The consignee was required to first pay freight, therefore, at New York upon delivery $1.90. To make this quantity of refined oil at that time, he had already paid freight on, say, 133 and a half barrels of crude oil, from the pipes to Cleveland at 35 cents per barrel, or, say, $46.67. He had, therefore, paid out from the pipes to the refinery, and thence to New York by transportation only, on 100 barrels refined and the quantity of crude oil required to make it, $236.67, or $2.37 per barrel. Therefore, at the end of the month, we refunded the $46.67 already paid on the crude oil, so that the rate paid net was $1.90 to him and all other refiners. In case of the refineries situated at the seaboard, the cost of carrying from the oil regions the 133.5 barrels of crude oil required to make 100 barrels of refined was made exactly the same as carrying the 100 barrels of refined made in the West and transported East. This really amounted to charging nothing for getting the crude oil to a refinery wherever it was situated, as the following clause in the agreement shows. The roads transporting the refined oil shall refund to the refiners, as a drawback, the charges paid by them upon the crude oil reaching their refineries by rail. This paragraph provided for this crude rebate contained a second clause which read, And the roads transporting through crude oil to the eastern seaboard shall refund to the shippers twenty-two cents per barrel, both of said drawbacks to be paid only on oil reaching the initial points of rail shipment, through pipes, the owners of which maintain agreed rates of pipage. The paragraph announced two new and startling intentions on the part of the oil-carrying roads. First, that they intended to strip the oil regions of the advantage of geographical position at the wells by sending oil free to Cleveland and Pittsburgh, New York and Philadelphia, at the same time leaving these cities the advantages accruing from their position as manufacturing centers and close to domestic markets. Second, that they had entered into a combination with certain pipelines to drive certain others out of existence. Mr. Blanchard gave the reasons of these two revolutionary moves to the Hepburn Committee. It was urgently represented to the trunk lines, he said, by some refiners at the West as well as by others at the seaboard, and also by crude shippers and receivers and by owners of pipelines, that it was in every way desirable that the refiners of Cleveland and Pittsburgh and those at the seaboard be put upon a basis of equalization in the gross rates of transportation 
to and from the refineries. Now, to do this, the element of distance had to be disregarded. Cleveland was 150 miles west of the oil regions, but she must be treated as if she were at the same distance from the seaboard. As soon as the proposition was made, certain of the refiners and producers objected unless the railroads went further, and equalized rates on coal, acids, cooperage, etc. This, however, the roads declined to do. As for the second clause, the rebate on all oil coming from pipes which kept up a fixed pipage, it came about in this way. While the railroad men were in conference at Long Branch, Henry Harley, the president of the Pennsylvania Transportation Company, came to them and said that he believed the scheme of equalization could not be carried out unless some kind of an alliance was made with the pipelines. There had been a large increase in the number of pipes in the four or five years preceding, and a situation had arisen not unlike that in every other branch of the oil business. There was perhaps twice the pipe capacity needed for gathering all the oil produced, and as the pipes were under at least a dozen different managements, each fighting for business, the result was, of course, just what it had been on the railroads and in the markets. Severe cutting of prices, rebates, special secret arrangements, confusion, and loss. It had been only nine years since the first pipeline had been a success, and considering the phenomenal growth of the business and the important part the pipe played in it, it was, of course, a situation natural enough. Like the overgrowth of refining and of production, it was something only time and solidification of business could remedy. Mr. Harley laid the situation before the railroad men and said to them, We want you to help us keep up an even and equal pipage rate. Here we are representatives of the nine most important lines in the oil regions. We want to put a stop to cutting and keep up a rate of 30 cents. Can't you help us? Now, up to this time, the railroad had had nothing to do with pipeline charges. It was, and still is, the custom for the buyer of the oil to pay the pipage. That is, the oil producer on running the oil into the pipeline received a credit certificate for the oil. If he held it in the line long, he paid a storage charge. When he sold the oil, the line ran it, and the buyer paid the charge for running. Now, the United Pipelines proposed to the railroads a through rate from the wells to the seaboard as low as they currently made from the receiving points on the railway, the pipes to get 20% of this through rate. The railroads were to agree not to receive oil from buyers except at as high a rate as the pipes charged, and to allow no pipeline outside of the alliance a through rate from the wells. The memorandum said squarely that the intent and purpose of this was to make the United Pipes the sole feeders of the railroads. It was a plan not unlike the South Improvement Company in design, to put everybody but yourself out of business, and it had the merit of stating its intent and purpose with perfect candor. The railroad men seemed not to have objected to the purpose, only to the terms of the proposed arrangement. Mr. Blanchard told the Pipe Committee that he regarded it as the most violent attempt on the part of the tail to wag the dog that he had ever seen and the representatives of the other roads agreed. They saw at once, however, how much more solid their own position would be if they could be sure that no pipeline delivering to them would cut its rate, if there could be in effect a through rate from the wells, and after some discussion they proposed to the pipelines to add twenty-two cents a barrel to the rail charges. That is, if the rate to the seaboard was a dollar twenty-five cents, to collect from the shipper a dollar forty-seven cents, and in case he would show that he had taken his oil from one of the United Pipes to give him a rebate of twenty-two cents. Mr. Blanchard said that they proposed to do this until proof was had that the associated pipelines were acting in good faith. Of course, this arrangement did not change the pipeline's method of collecting in the least. It simply forced a uniform charge, and this charge was to be, it should be noticed, regardless of distance. The charge for collecting and delivering oil was to be 30 cents a barrel, whether it was carried one or ten miles, a practice which prevails today. While these negotiations were going on, the oil regions as a whole was troubled by a vague rumor that freight rates were to be advanced. In the two years since the oil war, 
the region as a whole had adjusted itself to the tariff schedule of March 25, 1872, and was doing very well though working on a very much smaller margin of profits than ever before. The margin was sufficient, however, to keep the refineries in the valley running most of the time, and several of the large ones were increasing their plants. Detailed accounts of the condition of the works are to be had in the newspapers of the day. Thus, in the summer of 1874, an editor of the Oil City Derrick made a tour of the creek refineries and reported all of the larger ones in Titusville and Oil City as prosperous and growing, and the small ones in the little towns between these two points as jogging along pleasantly. The keen competition between the different refining points made it necessary to do business with economy, and a rumor of a raise of freight rates naturally was looked on with dread. It was not until September 12, however, that the new arrangements were made known, and this was some time earlier than was intended. The slip came about in this way. The general freight agent of the New York Central Road, James H. Rudder, sent out on September 9 a private circular announcing the new arrangement, an advance of fifty cents a barrel on refined oil shipped to the seaboard, no corresponding advance for Cleveland and Pittsburgh, a rebate of the cost of getting oil to the refineries, and a rebate of twenty-two cents to those who patronize certain pipelines. And to this new schedule was appended this consoling paragraph. You will observe under this system the rate is even and fair to all parties, preventing one locality taking advantage of its neighbor by reason of some alleged or real facility it may possess. Oil refiners and shippers have asked the roads from time to time to make all rates even and they would be satisfied. This scheme does it, and we trust will work satisfactorily to all. Among the refiners to whom the circular went was M. N. Allen of Titusville. Now, Mr. Allen was the editor of an aggressive and lively newspaper, The Courier. He had fought rings and deals from the beginning of his career as a refiner and as an editor. He had been one of the strong opponents of the South Improvement Company and of the Refiners Association which followed and he saw at once the cloven foot in the rudder circular and hastened to denounce it in a strong editorial. If, by an agreement of the New York Central, the Erie, and the Pennsylvania Railroad Companies, crude oil, delivered from the Titusville pipe, should be hauled from Titusville to Chicago and there refined, and the refined product then hauled to New York, all at two dollars a barrel for the refined thus carried, it would be placing by the railroad companies Chicago refiners upon the same level with the Titusville refiners, who on or after October 1 shall ship to New York refined made from crude oil taken from the Titusville pipe. The new freight arrangement does not make such provision for refiners at Chicago, but a Cleveland refiner may come to Titusville and buy oil for delivery from the Titusville, the Pennsylvania, the church run, or the Ockham pipes. At this point, take it to Cleveland and after refining carried the product to the seaboard at the same expense of freight all told that a refiner here taking his crude oil directly from the above pipes would have in placing his refined oil at the seaboard. This is stating the matter exactly, and we see no necessity for comment hereupon. Again, one thousand barrels of crude oil are to be carried to the seaboard for the same amount of money that will be required for carrying there seven hundred and fifteen barrels of refined notwithstanding that crude oil is a much more hazardous article of freight from fire than refined. If this is not a very large discrimination in favor of seaboard refiners, for which there is no compensation given to refiners in the oil regions, our perceptions are utterly weak. Now, before putting into effect this new freight arrangement, it may be well for the railway officials having the matter in charge to take into consideration a certain little article of agreement which the people of Pennsylvania on the 16th day of December last entered into among themselves respecting railroads in this state. In Article 17, Section 7 of our new Constitution, is the following decree of the sovereign people of this commonwealth. No discrimination in charges or facilities for transportation shall be made between transportation companies and individuals or in favor of either by abatement, drawback, or otherwise. Petroleum is a product of this state, and transportation companies in taking it away must respect the fundamental law of the state. And while we ask for no favors, also supporting free trade from principle, 
speaking in behalf of the refining interests of the oil region, we do not propose quietly to submit to any discrimination by transportation companies doing business in the state against our interests. If by some reason of our position we possess advantages for refining oil here over refineries outside, we have strong objections against the action of the railway companies in taking from us such advantages by requiring us to pay for hauling a given quantity of oil as much as they require of Cleveland refiners for hauling the same amount of oil 300 miles greater distance, or for requiring us to pay as much for hauling 715 barrels of refined oil as they require for hauling 1,000 barrels of crude oil the same distance. If the railroad companies will make all expenses of refining oil equal to all points, we shall be satisfied. If they will make the price of sulfuric acid one and a half cents a pound, the same as it is in New York, instead of two and a half cents, if they will deliver caustic soda here, free of freight from New York, if they will put paints and glues here at the same prices as those articles sell for in New York, if they will put staves and heading and hoops for barrels here at the same figures those articles cost in Cleveland, whether they do all these by giving us rebates sufficient to cover all differences now against us, or in any other way that will bring the same results, we will accept the new arrangement without complaint. Until this is done, we shall ask the railway companies in hauling oil to confine themselves to legitimate business and to obey the new constitution in letter and spirit. It will behoove our citizens to see that their new constitution is carefully respected. We are opposed to the new arrangement for the large advance in the price of freight upon oil. If the railroad companies have lost money in carrying oil for the Cleveland refineries during several years past, let not the whole petroleum interest, in its depressed condition, be required to sustain the penalty. We submit to the railway managers whether it is not right to charge for hauling goods in proportion to the distance hauled, allowing a small discount, perhaps, upon the rate per mile for the greater distance. Our remarks upon this subject may have the color of assurance, but, from the large majority given last winter in favor of the new constitution of this state, we have great confidence that the people will not part with their sovereign rights, nor allow themselves to be ruled by King Poole. At first the oil region was puzzled by the rudder circular. It certainly was plausible. Was it not true that every man shared equally under it? As the days passed, the day's mental condition into which it had thrown the oil men cleared up. Mr. Allen's editorials began to take effect. The pipelines left out of the pool began to ask how it could be legal that the railroads should enter into an arrangement which obviously would drive them out of business. The creek refiners began to ask by what right the advantage of geographical position at the well should be taken from them, and Cleveland be allowed to retain the advantages of her proximity to the western market, Pittsburgh her position on the Ohio River and the market it commanded all of the cities the advantage of their proximity to great local markets and to such necessary supplies as barrels and acids. Besides, was it constitutional for the railroads thus to regulate interstate commerce? Was not the arrangement, as far as the Pennsylvania was concerned, plainly prohibited by the new constitution of the state of Pennsylvania? The producers slowly began to realize, too, that the rudder circular, like the South Improvement Charter and contracts, did not recognize them as a body. The contract of March 25, 1872, provided that the rates fixed should not be liable to any change, either for increase or decrease, without first giving to William Hassan, president of the Producers' Union at Oil City, at least ninety days' notice in writing of such contemplated change. This agreement was totally ignored. It was an insolent equalization, the oil men concluded, and the sum total of their dissatisfaction finally found expression at a mass meeting at Parker's Landing on October 2nd. Directly after this meeting, a committee appointed sent to Messrs. Scott, Vanderbilt, and Jewett, the new president of the Erie, letters calling their attention to the rudder circular and stating the objections of the producers to it. These letters sent on October 6th received no attention from any of the railroad presidents addressed for over three weeks, when the following was received from the Pennsylvania. Gentlemen, your communication on 6th 
to Thomas A. Scott President was received and has been referred to me. In establishing the recent rates and arrangements for the transportation of oil, the object which was at all times kept in view was to place all interest on an equality giving to no one an undue advantage over another. We believe this object has been accomplished, and that by adhering to our present rates, the interests both of the producers, refiners, and transporters will be promoted. Very truly yours, A. J. Cassett. Brief, tardy, and unsatisfactory was the Derrick's characterization of Mr. Cassett's letter. It was evidence to the oil men that if anything was to be done to break the new tariff, it would have to be done in court, for the railroads meant to stand by their creation. In this discussion of the rudder circular, Mr. Rockefeller's name scarcely appeared. It was known that he had been admitted to the conferences at which the tariff was arranged. This was taken as a matter of course. There was nothing which concerned the oil business which John Rockefeller was not on the inside of. Mr. Blanchard later stated that the crude equivalent scheme was suggested by certain Western refiners. The tremendous advantage Cleveland secured by the new arrangement, practically three hundred miles of free transportation, seemed to prove, too, that Mr. Rockefeller had not been inactive during the conference. Whether he had or had not suggested the points in the rudder circular, so advantageous to his interest, he used them now to aid him in accomplishing one of the shrewdest and most far-reaching moves of his life, the move which was to lead at last to the realization of his great purpose, the concentration of the oil business in his own hands. For Mr. Rockefeller, quiet as he had been since the breaking up of the Refiners' Association in the summer of 1873, had by no means given up the idea of doing for the refining interest of the whole country what he had done for that of Cleveland through the South Improvement Company. Mr. Rockefeller has shown repeatedly in his conquering business career remarkable ability to learn from experience. The breaking up of the Refiners' Association may have seemed a disaster to him. He did not allow it to be a profitless disaster. He extracted useful lessons from the experience, and armed with this new wisdom, bent his whole mind to working out a third plan of campaign. He now knew that he could not hope to make again so rich a haul as he had made through the defunct South Improvement Scheme. The experience of the past year with the refiners convinced him that it would take time to educate them to his idea of combination, but he had learned who of them were capable of this education. As far as the producers, the alliance attempted with them was enough to demonstrate that they would never endure long the restraints of any association. Besides, the bulk of them still held, to him, on practical belief that rebates were wrong. Mr. Rockefeller had also relearned in those eighteen months what he knew pretty well before, that the promise to give or take away a heavy freight traffic was enough to persuade any railroad king of the day to break the most solemn compact. With all these reflections fresh in mind, Mr. Rockefeller again bent over a map of the refining interests of the United States. Here was the world he sighed to conquer. If we may suppose him to have begun his campaign as a great general with whom he has many traits in common, the first Napoleon, used to begin his by studying a map with red-hearted pegs marking the points he must capture, Mr. Rockefeller's chart would have shown in and around Boston perhaps three pegs representing a crude capacity of 3,500 barrels, in and around New York 15 pegs, a capacity of 9,790 barrels, in and around Philadelphia 12 pegs, a capacity of 2,061 barrels, in Pittsburgh 22 pegs, a capacity of 6,090 barrels, on the creek 27 pegs, a capacity of 9,231 barrels. His work was to get control of this multitude of red pegs and to fly above them the flag of what the irreverent call the Holy Blue Barrel. Sometime in the summer of 1874, after it had become certain that Colonel Potts's plan for an equalization of oil freights would be carried out, Mr. Rockefeller wrote to his former colleague in the South Improvement Company, W. G. Warden of Philadelphia, telling him he wanted to talk over the condition of the oil business with him. 
and inviting him to bring Charles Lockhart of Pittsburgh to that mecca of American schemers, Saratoga, for a conference with him and Mr. Flagler. Mr. Warden hesitated. He had been much abused for his relation with the South Improvement Company. He had seen the National Refiners Association fail. He had begun to feel a distaste for combination. Besides, he was doing very well in Philadelphia. However, after some hesitation, he and Mr. Lockhart went to Saratoga. The four gentlemen breakfasted together and later strolled out to a pavilion. Here they discussed again, as they had nearly three years before, when they prepared the South Improvement Assault, the condition of the oil business. End of Chapter 5, Part 1 Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com. Chapter Five, Part Two of the History of Standard Oil, Volume One by Ida Tarbell. Recording by Tom Weiss. Laying the Foundations of a Trust. Mr. Rockefeller now had something besides a theory to present to the gentleman he wished to go into his third scheme. He had the most persuasive of all arguments, an actual achievement. Three years ago, he could tell them, I took over the Cleveland refineries. I have managed them so that today I pay a profit to nobody. I do my own buying. I make my own acid and barrels. I control the New York terminals of both the Erie and Central Roads and ship such quantities that the railroads give me better rates than they do any other shipper. In 1873 I shipped over 700,000 barrels by the Central, and my profit on my capitalization, $2,500,000, was over $1,000,000. This is the result of combination in one city. The railroads now have arranged a new tariff by which they mean to put us all on an equal footing. They say they will give no rebates to anyone, but if we can join with Cleveland, the strongest forces in other great shipping points, and apply to them the same tactics I have employed, we shall become the largest shipper and can demand a rebate in return for an equal division of our freight. We proved in 1872 and 1873 that we could not do anything by an open association let us who see what a combination strictly carried out will effect unite secretly to accomplish it. Let us become the nucleus of a private company, which gradually shall acquire control of all refineries everywhere, become the only shippers, and consequently the master of the railroads in the matter of freight rates. It was six hours before the gentlemen in conference left the pavilion, and when they came out, Mr. Warren and Mr. Lockhart, had agreed to transfer their refineries in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh to the Standard Oil Company of Cleveland, taking stock in exchange. They had also agreed to absorb, as rapidly as persuasion or other means could bring it about, the refineries in their neighborhood. Their union with the Standard was to remain an absolute secret, the concerns operating under their respective names. On October 15, 1874, Mr. Rockefeller consummated another purchase of as great importance. He bought the works of Charles Pratt & Company of New York City. As before, the purchase was secret. The strategic importance of these purchases for one holding Mr. Rockefeller's vast ambition was enormous. It gave him as allies men who were among the most successful refiners, without doubt, in each of the three great refining centers of the country, outside of Cleveland, where he ruled, and of the creek where he had learned that neither he nor any member of the South Improvement Company could do business with facility. To meet these purchases the stock of the Standard Oil Company was increased on March 10, 1875, to $3,500,000. The value of the concern as a money earner at this early date, 1874, is shown by the fact that Pratt & Company paid not less than two sixty five for the standard stock they received in exchange for their works. The first intimation that the oil region had that Mr. Rockefeller was pushing another combination was in March of 1875, when it was announced that an organization of refiners called the Central Association, of which he was president, had been formed. 
Its main points were that if a refiner would lease to the association his plant for a term of months, he would be allowed to subscribe for stock of the new company. The lease allowed the owner to do his own manufacturing, but gave Mr. Rockefeller's company irrevocable authority to make all purchases of crude oil and sales of refined, to decide how much each refinery should manufacture, and to negotiate for all freight and pipeline expenses. The Central Association was a most clever device. It furnished the secret partners of Mr. Rockefeller a plausible proposition with which to approach the firms of which they wished to obtain control. Little as the oil regions knew of the real meaning of the Central Association, the news of its organization raised a cry of monopoly, and the advocates of the new scheme felt called upon to defend it. The defense took the line that the condition of the trade made such a combination of refineries necessary. Altogether, the ablest explanation was that of H. H. Rogers, of Charles Pratt & Company, to a reporter of the New York Tribune. There are five refining points in the country, said Mr. Rogers, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Cleveland, the oil regions, and New York City. Each of these has certain local advantages which may be briefly stated as follows. Pittsburgh, cheap oil. Philadelphia, the seaboard. Cleveland, cheap barrels and canal as well as railroad transportation. The oil regions, crude oil at the lowest figure and all the products of petroleum have the best market in New York City. The supply of oil is three or four times greater than the demand. If the oil refineries were run to their full capacity, the market would be overstocked. The business is not regular but spasmodic. When the market is brisk and oil is in demand, all the oil interests are busy and enjoy a fair share of prosperity. At other times the whole trade is affected by the dullness. It has been estimated that not less than twenty millions of dollars are invested in the oil business. It is therefore to the interest of every man who has put a dollar in it to have the trade protected and established on a permanent footing. Speculators have ruined the market. The brokers heretofore have been speculating upon the market with disastrous effects upon the trade, and this new order of things will force them to pursue their legitimate calling and realize their profits from their industry and perseverance. Two years ago an attempt was made to organize an oil refiners' association, but it was subsequently abandoned. There was no cohesion of interest and agreements were not kept. The movement at the present time is a revival of the former idea, and it is believed has already fully secured nine-tenths of the oil refiners in the country in its favor. I do not believe there is any intention among the oil men to fool the market. The endeavor is to equalize all around and protect the capital invested. If by common consent, in good faith, the refiners agree to reduce the quantities to an allotment for each, made in view of the supply and demand, and the capacity for production, the market can be regulated with a reasonable profit for all. The price of oil today is fifteen cents per gallon. The proposed allotment of business would probably advance the price to twenty cents. To make an artificial increase with immense profits would be recognized as speculative instead of legitimate, and the oil interest would suffer accordingly. Temporary capital would compete with permanent investment and ruin everything. The oil producers today are bankrupt. There have been more failures during the last five months than in five years previously. An organization to protect the oil capital is imperatively needed. Oil to yield a fair profit should be sold for twenty-five cents per gallon. That price would protect every interest and cover every outlay for getting out the crude petroleum, transporting by railroad, refining, and the incidental charges of handling, etc. The foreign markets will regulate the price to a great extent because they are the greatest consumers. The people of China, Germany, and other foreign countries cannot afford to pay high prices. Kerosene oil is a luxury to them, and they do not receive sufficient compensation for their labor to enable them to use this oil at an extravagant price. The price, therefore, must be kept within reasonable limits. The oil regions refused flatly to accept this view of the situation. The world would not buy refined at twenty-five cents, they argued. You injured the foreign market in 1872 by putting up the price. Our only hope is in increasing consumption. The world is buying more oil today than ever before, because it is cheap. 
we must learn to accept small profits as other industries do. The formation of the Refiners' Association has thrust upon the trade an element of uncertainty that has unsettled all sound views as to the general outlook, said the Derrick. The scope of the association, wrote a Pittsburgh critic, is an attempt to control the refining of oil with the ultimate purpose of advancing its price and reaping a rich harvest in profits. This can only be done by reducing the production of refined oil, and this will in turn act on crude oil, making the stock so far in excess of the demand as to send it down to a lower figure than it has yet touched. The most important feature of this contract, said a veteran refiner, is perhaps that part which provides that the executive committee of the Central Association are to have the exclusive power to arrange with the railroads for the carrying of the crude and refined oil. It is intended by this provision to enable the executive committee to speak for the whole trade in securing special rates of freight, whereby independent shippers of crude oil and such refiners as refuse to join the combination and any new refining interest that may be started may be driven out of the trade. The whole general purpose of the combination is to reap a large margin by depressing crude and raising the price of refined oil, and the chief means employed is the system of discrimination in railroad freights to the seaboard. The veteran refiner was right in his supposition that Mr. Rockefeller intended to use the enormous power his combination gave him to get a special rate. As a matter of fact, he had seen to that before the veteran refiner expressed his mind. It will be remembered that in April 1874 Mr. Rockefeller had made a contract with the Erie by which he was to ship 50% of his refined oil over that road at a rate as low as any competing line gave any shipper, and he was to have a lease on the Weehawken Oil Terminal. Now this contract remained in force until the 1st of March 1875, when a new one was made with the Erie, guaranteeing the road the same percentage of freight and giving the standard a 10% rebate on whatever open tariff should be fixed. This rebate, Mr. Blanchard says, was quite independent of what the Central might be giving the Standard. He says that one reason the Standard was given the rebate was that it was suspected the Pennsylvania was allowing the Empire Transportation Company an even larger one. If true, this would not affect any refiner necessarily, as the Empire was not a refiner in March 1875. The real reason, of course, was what Mr. Blanchard gives later that by this rebate they kept the standard trade, now greatly increased by the purchase of the outside works already mentioned, although it should be noticed the Erie officials knew nothing of the standard having control of any refinery than that of Charles Pratt & Company. The announcement of the Central Association put an altogether new feature on oil transportation. If this organization succeeded, and the refiners in it claimed nine-tenths of the capacity of the country, it gave Mr. Rockefeller irrevocable authority to negotiate freights. The Pennsylvania Road immediately felt the pressure. The oil they had carried for big firms like those of Charles Lockhart in Pittsburgh and of Warden Frew and Company in Philadelphia was in the hands of the Standard Oil Company, and Mr. Rockefeller asked the rebate of 10% on open rates. The road demurred. Colonel Potts objected strenuously. Three years later in a paper discussing this rebate and its consequences, he said, The rebate was a modest one, as was its recipient. Yet the railway Cassandras prophesied from it a multitude of evils, a gradual destruction of all other refiners and a gradual absorption of their property by the favorite, who, with this additional armament, would rapidly progress towards the control of all cars, all pipes, all production, and finally of the roads themselves. Their prophecies met but little faith or consideration. The standard leaders themselves were especially active in discouraging any such radical purpose. Their little rebate was enough for them. Everybody else should prosper, as would be shortly seen. They needed no more refineries. They had already more than they could employ. Why should they hunger after greater burdens? It was the railroads they chiefly cared for and next in their affections stood the one hundred rival refineries. Such beneficent longings as still remained, and their bosoms overflowed with them, spread out their steady waves toward the poor producers whom, not to be impious, they had always been ready to gather under their wings, 
yet they would not. This unselfish language soothed all alarm into quiet slumbering. It resembles the gentle fanning of the vampire's wings, and it had the same end in view, the undisturbed abstraction of the victim's blood. Colonel Potts's argument against the rebate, doubtless clothed in much less picturesque language in 1875 than his feelings stirred him to in 1878, for a good enough reason to it, we shall see, failed to convince the Pennsylvania officials. They decided to yield to the standard. Mr. Cassatt, then third vice president of the road, in charge of transportation, said in 1879 that the rebate was given because they found the standard was getting very strong, that they had the backing of the other roads, and that if the Pennsylvania wanted to retain its full share of business and at fair rates, they must make arrangements to protect themselves. No one of the roads knew certainly what the others were doing for the standard until October 1, 1875. The freight agents then met to discuss again the freight pool they had formed in 1874. It had not been working with perfect satisfaction. The clause granting the rebate of 22 cents to the pipelines, which sustained an agreed rate of pipage, had been abandoned after about five months' experiment. It was thought to stimulate new pipes. The roads, in making a new adjustment, made no effort to regulate pipeline tariffs. The crude rebate, as it was called, carrying oil to a refinery for nothing, was left in force. At this meeting Mr. Blanchard found that both of the Erie's big rivals were granting the Standard a 10% rebate. He also found that he was not getting 50% of the Standard's business as the contract called for, that the Standard controlled not only for the Cleveland and New York works of which he knew, but large works in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. Mr. Rockefeller was certainly now in an excellent condition to work out his plan of bringing under his own control all the refineries of the country. The Standard Oil owned in each of the great refining centers, New York, Pittsburgh, and Philadelphia, a large and aggressive plant run by the men who had built it up. These works were, so far as the public knew, still independent, and their only relation that of the Central Association. As a matter of fact, they were the Central Association. Not only had Mr. Rockefeller brought these powerful interests into his concern, he had secured for them a rebate of ten per cent, on a rate which should always be as low as any one of the roads gave any of his competitors. He had done away with middlemen, that is, he was paying nobody a profit. He was undeniably a force wonderfully constructed for what he wanted to do, and one made practically impregnable as things were in the oil business then, by virtue of its special transportation rate. As soon as his new line was complete, the work of acquiring all outside refineries began at each of the oil centers. Unquestionably the acquisitions were made through persuasion when this was possible. If the party approached refused to lease or sell, he was told firmly what Mr. Rockefeller had told the Cleveland refiners when he went to them in 1872 with the South Improvement contracts, that there was no hope for him, that a combination was in progress which was bound to work, and that those who stayed out would inevitably go to the wall. Naturally the first fruits to fall into the hands of the new alliance were those refineries which were embarrassed or discouraged by the conditions which Mr. Rogers explains above. Take as an example the case of Citizens Oil Refining Company of Pittsburgh, as it was explained in 1888 to the House Committee on Manufactures in its trust investigation. A. H. Tack, a partner in the company, told the story. We began in 1869 with a capacity of 1,000 barrels a day. At the start everything was couleur de ruse, so much so that we put our works in splendid shape. We manufactured all the products. We even got it down to making wax and using the very last residuum in the boilers. We got the works in magnificent order and used up everything. We began to feel the squeeze in 1872. We did not know what was the matter. Of course we were all affected the same way in Pennsylvania, and of course we commenced shifting about and meeting together and forming delegations and going down to Philadelphia to see the Pennsylvania Railroad meeting after meeting and delegation after delegation. We suspected there was something wrong, and told those men there there was something wrong somewhere, 
that we felt so far as our position was concerned we had the cheapest barrels, the cheapest labor, and the cheapest coal, and the route from the crude district was altogether in our favor. We had a railroad and a river to bring us our raw material. We had made our investment based on the seaboard routes, and we wanted the Pennsylvania Railroad to protect us. But none of our meetings or delegations ever amounted to anything. They were always repulsed in some way, put off, and we never got any satisfaction. The consequence was that in two or three years there was no margin or profit. In order to overcome that we commenced speculating, in the hope that there would be a change some time or other for the better. We did not like the idea of giving up the ship. Now, during these times the Standard Oil Company increased so perceptibly and so strong that we at once recognized it as the element. Instead of looking to the railroad, I always looked to the Standard Oil Company. In 1874 I went to see Rockefeller to find if we could make arrangements with him by which we could run a portion of our works. It was a very brief interview. He said there was no hope for us at all. He remarked this. I cannot give the exact quotation. There is no hope for us, and probably, he said, there is no hope for any of us. But he says, the weakest must go first. And we went. All over the country the refineries in the same condition as Mr. Tack's firm sold or leased. Those who felt the hard times and had any hope of weathering them resisted it first. With many of them the resistance was due simply to their love of their business and their unwillingness to share its control with outsiders. The thing which a man has begun, cared for, led to a healthy life, from which he has begun to gather fruit, which he knows he can make greater and richer, he loves as he does his life. It is one of the fruits of his life. He is jealous of it, wishes the honor of it, will not divide it with another. He can suffer heavily his own mistakes, learn from them, correct them. He can fight opposition, bear all, so long as the work is his. There were refiners in 1875 who loved their business in this way. Why one should love an oil refinery the outsider may not see. But to the man who had begun with one still and had seen it grow by his own energy and intelligence to ten, who now sold five hundred barrels a day where he once sold five, the refinery was the dearest spot on earth save his home. He walked with pride among its evil-smelling places, watched the processes with eagerness, experimented with joy, and recounted triumphantly every improvement. To ask such a man to give up his refinery was to ask him to give up the thing which, after his family, meant most in life to him. To Mr. Rockefeller this feeling was a weak sentiment. To place love of independent work above love of profits was as incomprehensible to him as a refusal to accept a rebate because it was wrong. Where persuasion failed them, it was necessary in his judgment that pressure be applied, simply a pressure sufficient to demonstrate to these blind or recalcitrant individuals the impossibility of their long being able to do business independently. It was a pressure varied according to locality. Usually it took the form of cutting their market. The system of predatory competition was no invention of the Standard Oil Company. It had prevailed in the oil business from the start. Indeed, it was one of the evils Mr. Rockefeller claimed his combination would cure, but until now it had been used spasmodically. Mr. Rockefeller never did anything spasmodically. He applied underselling for destroying his rival's market with the same deliberation and persistency that characterized all his efforts, and in the long run he always won. There were other forms of pressure. Sometimes the independents found it impossible to get oil. Again they were obliged to wait days for cars to ship in. There seemed to be no end to the ways of making it hard for men to do business, of discouraging them until they would sell or lease, and always at the psychological moment a purchaser was at their side. Take as an example the case of the Harkness Refinery in Philadelphia, a story told to the same committee as that of Mr. Tack. I was the originator of the enterprise, said William W. Harkness, believing that there was no better place than Philadelphia to refine oil, particularly for export. We commenced then as near as I can now recollect, about 1870, and we made money up to probably 1874. 
we managed our business very close and did not speculate in oil. We bought and we sold, and we paid a great deal of attention to the statistical part of our business so as to save waste, and we did a nice business. But we found in some years that probably five months out of a year we could not sell our oil unless it would be at a positive loss, and then we stopped. Then, when we could sell our oil, we found a difficulty about getting cars. My brother would complain of it, but I believed that the time would come when that would be equalized. I had no idea of the iniquity that was going on. I could not conceive it. I went on in good faith until about 1874, and then the trouble commenced. We could not get our oil and were compelled to sell at a loss. Then Warden Frew and Company formed some kind of running arrangement where they supplied the crude, and we seemed to get along a little better. After a while the business got complicated, and I got tired and handed it over to my brother. I backed out. That was about 1875. I was dissatisfied and wanted to do an independent business, or else I wanted to give it up. In 1876, I recollect that very well because it was the year of the Centennial Exposition, we were at the Centennial Exposition. I was sitting in front of the great Corliss engine, admiring it, and he told me there was a good opportunity to get out. Warden Frew and Company, he said, were prepared to buy us out, and I asked him whether he considered that as the best thing to do, whether we had not better hold on and fight it through, or I believed that these difficulties would not continue, that we would get our oil. I knew he was a competent refiner, and I wanted to continue business, but he said he thought he had better make this arrangement, and I consented, and we sold out. We got our investment back. Here we have a refiner discouraged by the conditions which Mr. Rockefeller claims his aggregation will cure. Under the rudder circular and the discrimination in freight to the standard which followed, his difficulty in getting oil increases, and he consents to a running arrangement with Mr. Rockefeller's partner in Philadelphia, but he wants to do an independent business. Impossible. As he sits watching the smooth and terrible power of that famous Corliss engine of 1876, an engine which showed to thousands for the first time what great power properly directed means, he realized that something very like it was at work in the oil business, something resistless, silent, perfect in its might, and he sold out to that something. Everywhere men did the same. The history of oil refining on Oil Creek from 1875 to 1879 is almost uncanny. There were, at the beginning of that period, twenty-seven plants in the region, most of which were in a fair condition, considering the difficulties in the business. During 1873 the demand for refined oil had greatly increased, the exports nearly doubling over those of 1872. The average profit on refined that year in a well-managed refinery was not less than three cents a gallon. During the first half of 1874 the oil business had been depressed, but the oil refiners were looking for better times when the rudder circular completely demoralized them by putting fifty cents extra freight charges on their shipments without an equivalent raise on competitive points. It was not only this extra charge enough to cut off their profits, as business then stood, but it was that the same set of men who had thrown their business into confusion in 1872 was again at work. The announcement of the Central Association with Mr. Rockefeller's name at its head confirmed their fears. Nevertheless, at first none of the small refiners would listen to the proposition to sell or lease made them in the spring of 1875 by the representative first sent out by the Central Association. They would have nothing to do, they said bluntly, with any combination engineered by John D. Rockefeller. The representative withdrew, and the case was considered. In the meantime conditions on the creek grew harder. All sorts of difficulties began to be strewn in their way cars were hard to get. The markets they had built up were cut under them. A demoralizing conviction was abroad in the trade that this new and mysterious combination was going to succeed, that it was doing rapidly what its members were reported to be saying daily. We mean to secure the entire refining business of the world. Such was the state of things on the creek when in early fall of 1875, an energetic young refiner and oil buyer well known in the oil regions, J. D. Archbald, 
appeared in Titusville as the representative of a new company, the Acme Oil Company, a concern which everybody believed to be an offshoot of the Standard Oil Company of Cleveland, though nobody could prove it. As a matter of fact, the Acme was capitalized and controlled entirely by Standard men, its stockholders being, in addition to Mr. Archibald, William Rockefeller, William G. Warden, Frank Q. Barstow, and Charles Pratt. It was evident at once that the Acme Oil Company had come into the oil regions for the purpose of absorbing the independent interest as Mr. Rockefeller and his colleagues were absorbing them elsewhere. The work was done with a promptness and dispatch which do great credit to the energy and resourcefulness of the engineer of the enterprise. In three years, by 1878, all but two of the refineries of Titusville had retired from the business gloriously, as Mr. Archibald, flushed with victory, told the Council of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in 1879, when the state authorities were trying to find what was at work in the oil interest to cause such a general collapse. Most of the concerns were bought outright, the owners being convinced that it was impossible for them to do an independent business and being unwilling to try combination. All down the creek, the little refineries which for years had faced every difficulty with stout hearts collapsed sold out, dismantled, shut down is the melancholy record of the industry during those four years. At the end, practically nothing was left in the oil regions but the Acme of Titusville and the Imperial of Oil City, both of them now under standard management. To the oil men, this sudden wiping out of the score of plants with which they had been familiar for years seemed a crime which nothing could justify. Their bitterness of heart was only intensified by the sight of the idle refiners thrown out of business by the sale of their factories. These men had, many of them, handsome sums to invest, but what were they to put them in? They were refiners, and they carried a pledge in their pockets not to go into that business for a period of ten years. Some of them tried to discourage oil man's fatal resource, the market, and as a rule left their money there. One refiner who had, according to popular report, received $200,000 for his business, speculated the entire sum away in less than a year. Others tried new enterprises, but men of forty learned new trades with difficulty, and failure followed many of them. The scars left in the oil regions by the Standard Combination of 1875 to 1879 are too deep and ugly for men and women of this generation to forget them. In Pittsburgh, the same thing was happening. At the beginning of the work of absorption, 1874, there were between 22 and 30 refineries in the town. As we have seen, Lockhart and Frew sold to the Standard Oil Company of Cleveland sometime in 1874. In the fall of that year, a new company was formed in Pittsburgh called the Standard Oil Company of Pittsburgh. Its president was Charles Lockhart. Its directors, William Frew, David Bushnell, H. M. Flagler, and W. G. Warden, all members of the Standard Oil Company, and four of them stockholders in the South Improvement Company. This company at once began to lease or buy refineries. Many of the Pittsburgh refiners made a valiant fight to get rates on their oil, which would enable them to run independently. To save expense they tried to bring oil from the oil fields by barge, the pipelines in the pool refused to run oil to barges, the railroad to accept oil brought down by barge. An independent pipeline attempted to bring it down to Pittsburgh, but to reach the works, the pipeline must run under a branch of the Pennsylvania Railroad. It refused to permit this, and for months the oil from the line was hauled in wagons from the point where it had been held up, over the railroad track, and there re-piped and carried to Pittsburgh. At every point they met interference until finally, one by one, they gave in. According to Mr. Frew, who in 1879 was examined as to the condition of things in Pittsburgh, the company began to acquire refiners in 1875. In 1877 they bought their last one, and at the time Mr. Frew was under examination, he could not remember but one refinery in operation in Pittsburgh not controlled by his company. Nor was it refiners only who sold out. All departments of the trade began to yield to the pressure. There was in the oil business a class of men known as shippers. 
They brought crude oil, sent it east, and sold it to refineries there. Among the largest of these was Adnan Nehart, whose active representative was W. T. Scheide. Now, to Mr. Rockefeller, the independent shipper was an incubus. He did a business which, in his judgment, a firm ought to do for itself, and reaped a profit which might go direct into the business. Besides, so long as there were shippers to supply crude to the eastern refineries at living prices, so long these concerns might resist offers to sell or lease. Sometime in the fall of 1872 Mr. Scheide began to lose his customers in New York. He found that they were making some kind of a working arrangement with the Standard Oil Company. Just what he did not know. But at all events they no longer bought from him but from the Standard Buyer, J. A. Boswick and Company. At the same time he became convinced that Mr. Rockefeller was after his business. I knew that they were making some strenuous efforts to get our business, he told the Hepburn Commission in 1879, because I used to meet Mr. Rockefeller in the Erie office. At the same time that he was facing the loss of customers and the demoralizing conviction that the Standard Oil wanted his business, he was experiencing more or less disgust over business conditions in New York. I did not like the character of my customers there, Mr. Scheide told the committee. I did not think they were treating us fairly and squarely. There was a strong competition in handling oil. The competition had got to be so strong that outside refiners, as they called themselves then, used to go around bidding up the price of their works on the Standard Oil Company, and they were using me to sell the refineries to the Standard. They would say to refiners, Nahart will do so and so, and we are going to continue running. And they would say to us that the Standard was offering lower prices. I recollect one instance in which they, after having made a contract to buy oil from me if I would bring it over the Erie Railway, broke that contract for one one hundred and twenty-eighth part of a cent of a gallon. I sold out the next week. When Mr. Scheide went to the freight agent of the Erie Road, Mr. Blanchard, and told him of his decision to sell, Mr. Blanchard tried to dissuade him. During the conversation he let out a fact which must have convinced Mr. Scheide more fully than ever that he had been wise in determining to give up his business. Mr. Blanchard told him as a reason for his staying and trusting to the Erie Road to keep its contracts with him that the Standard Oil had been offering him five cents more barrel than Mr. Scheide was paying them, and would take all their cars and load them all regularly if they would throw him over and give them the business. It is interesting to note that when Mr. Scheide sold in the spring of 1875 it was, as he supposed, to Charles Pratt and Company. Well informed as he was in all the intricacies of the business, and there were few abler or more energetic men in trade at the time, he did not know that Charles Pratt and Company had been part and parcel of the Standard Oil Company since October 1874. Of course, securing a large crude shipping business like Mr. Nahart's was a valuable point for the Standard. It threw all of the refiners whom he had supplied out of crude oil and forced several of them to come to the standard buyer, a first step, of course, toward a lease or sale. At every point, indeed, making it difficult for the refiner to get his raw product was one of the favorite maneuvers of the combination. It was not only to crude oil it was applied. Factories which worked up the residuum or tar into lubricating oil and depended on standard plants for their supply were cut off. There was one such in Cleveland, the firm of Moorhouse and Freeman. Mr. Moorhouse had begun to experiment with lubricating oils in 1861, and in 1871 the report of the Cleveland Board of Trade devoted several of its pages to a description of his business. According to this account, he was then making oils adapted to lubricating all kinds of machinery. He held patents for several brands and trademarks, and had produced that year over 25,000 barrels of different lubricants besides 120,000 boxes of axle grease. At this time he was buying his stock or residuum from one or another of the 25 Cleveland refiners. Then came the South Improvement Company and the concentration of the town's refining interest in Mr. Rockefeller's hands. Mr. Moorhouse, according to the testimony he gave the Hepburn Commission in 1879, went to Mr. Rockefeller after the consolidation to arrange for supplies. He was welcomed, the Standard Oil Company had not at that time begun to deal in lubricating oils, 
and encouraged to build a new plant. This was done at a cost of $41,000, and a contract was made with the Standard Oil Company for a daily supply of 85 barrels of residuum. Sometime in 1874 this supply was cut down to 12 barrels. The price was put up too, and contracts for several months were demanded so that Mr. Moorhouse got no advantage from the variation in crude prices. Then the freights went up on the railroads. He paid one dollar and fifty cents and two dollars for what he says he felt sure his big neighbor was paying but seventy or seventy-five cents. There is no evidence of any such low rate to the standard from Cleveland to New York by rail. Now it was impossible for Mr. Moorhouse to supply his trade on twelve barrels of stock. He begged Mr. Rockefeller for more. It was there in the standard oil works. Why could he not have it? He could pay for it. He and his partner offered to buy five thousand barrels and store it. But Mr. Rockefeller was firm. All he could give Mr. Moorhouse was twelve barrels a day. I saw readily what that meant, said Mr. Moorhouse. That meant squeeze you out. Buy your works. They have got the works and are running them. I am without anything. They paid about fifteen thousand dollars for what cost me forty-one thousand dollars. He said that he had facilities for freighting and that the coal oil business belonged to them, and any concern that would start in that business they had sufficient money to lay aside a fund to wipe them out. These are his words. At every refining center in the country, this process of consolidation, through persuasion, intimidation, or force, went on. As fast as a refinery was brought in line, its work was assigned to it. If it was an old and poorly equipped plant, it was usually dismantled or shut down. If it was badly placed, that is, if it was not economically placed in regard to a pipeline and railroad, it was dismantled even though in excellent condition. If it was a large and well-equipped plant advantageously located, it was assigned a certain quota to manufacture, and it did nothing but manufacture. The buying of crude, the making of freight rates, the selling of the output remained with Mr. Rockefeller. The contracts under which all the refineries brought into line were run were of the most detailed and rigid description and they were executed as a rule with a secrecy which baffles description. Take, for example, a running arrangement made by Rockefeller in 1876 with the Cleveland refiner, that of Schofield, Shermer, and Teagle. The members of this concern had all been in the refining business in Cleveland in 1872 and had all handed over their works to Mr. Rockefeller when he notified them of the South Improvement Company's contracts. Mr. Shermer declared once in an affidavit that he alone lost $20,000 by that maneuver. The members of the firm had not stayed out of business, however. Recovering from the panic caused by the South Improvement Company, they had united in 1875, building a refinery worth $65,000 with a yearly capacity of 180,000 barrels of crude. On the first year's business they made $40,000. Although this was doing well, they were convinced they might do better if they could get as good freight rates as the Standard Oil Company, and in the spring of 1876 they brought suit against the Lakeshore and Michigan Southern and the New York Central and Hudson River Railroads for unlawful and unjust discrimination, partialities and preferences made, and practice in favor of the Standard Oil Company, enabling the said Standard Oil Company to obtain to a great extent the monopoly of the oil and naphtha trade of Cleveland. The suit was not carried through at the time. Mr. Rockefeller seems to have suggested a sure way to the firm of getting the rates they wanted. This was to make a running arrangement with them. He seems to have demonstrated to them that they could make more money under his plan than outside, and they signed a contract for a remarkable joint adventure. According to this document, Schofield, Shermer, and Teagle put into the business a plant worth at that time about $73,000 and their entire time. Mr. Rockefeller put in $10,000 and his rebates. That is, he secured for the firm the same preferential rates on their shipments that the Standard Oil Company enjoyed. The firm bound itself not to refine over 85,000 barrels a year, and neither jointly nor separately to engage in any other form of oil business for ten years, the life of the contract. 
Schofield, Shermer, and Teagle were guaranteed a profit of $35,000 a year. Profits over $35,000 went to Mr. Rockefeller up to $70,000. Any further profits were divided. The making of this contract and its execution were attended by all the secret rights peculiar to Mr. Rockefeller's business ventures. According to the testimony of one of the firm given a few years later on the witness stand in Cleveland, the contract was signed at night at Mr. Rockefeller's house on Euclid Avenue in Cleveland, where he told the gentlemen that they must not tell even their wives about the new arrangement, that if they made money they must conceal it, they were not to drive fast horses, put on style, or do anything to let people suspect there were unusual profits in oil refining. That would invite competition. They were told that all accounts were to be kept secret. Fictitious names were to be used in corresponding, and a special box at the post office was employed for these fictitious characters. In fact, smugglers and housebreakers never surrounded their operations with more mystery. But make his operations as thickly as he might in secrecy, the effect of Mr. Rockefeller's steady and united attack on the refining business was daily becoming more apparent. Before the end of 1876, the alarm among oil producers, the few independent refineries still in business, and even in certain railroad circles, was serious. On all sides talk of a united effort to meet the consolidation was heard. End of Chapter 5, Part 2 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's Audiobooks dot com Chapter six Part one of the History of Standard Oil Volume One by Ida Tarbell This Librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Tom Weiss Strengthening the Foundations from the time the Central Association announced itself, independent refiners and the producers as a body watched developments with suspicion. They had little to go on. They had no means of proving what was actually the fact that the Central Association was the Standard Oil Company working secretly to bring its competitors under control or drive them out of business. They had no way of knowing what was actually the fact that the Standard had contracts with the Central Erie and the Pennsylvania, which gave them rebates on the lowest tariff which others paid. That this must be the case, however, they were convinced, and they determined early in 1876 to call on Congress for another investigation. A hearing was practically ensured, for Congress since 1872 had given serious attention to the transportation troubles. The Wyndham Committee of 1874 had made a report, the sweeping recommendations of which gave much encouragement to those who suffered from the practices of the railroads. Among other things, this committee recommended that all rates, drawbacks, etc., be published at every point, and no changes allowed in them without proper notification. It recommended the Bureau of Commerce, which in 1902, 28 years later, was created. So serious did the Wyndham Committee consider the situation in 1874 that it made the following radical recommendations. The only means of securing and maintaining reliable and effective competition between railways is through national or state ownership or control of one or more lines which, being unable to enter into combinations, will serve as a regulation of other lines." One or more double-track freight railways honestly and thoroughly constructed, owned or controlled by the government, and operated at a low rate of speed would doubtless be able to carry, at a much less cost than can be done under the present system of operating fast and slow trains on the same road, and, being incapable of entering into combinations, would no doubt serve as a very valuable regulator of existing railroads within the range of their influence." With Congress in such a temper, the oil men felt that there might be some hope of securing the regulation of interstate commerce they had asked for in 1872. The agitation resulted in the presentation in the House of Representatives, in April, of the first interstate commerce bill which promised to be effective. The bill was presented by James H. Hopkins of Pittsburgh. Mr. Hopkins had before his eyes the uncanny fate of the independent oil interests of Pittsburgh, 
some twenty-five factories in that town having been reduced to two or three in three and one-half years. He had seen the oil-refining business of the state steadily reduced, and he thought it high time that something was done. In aid of his bill a house investigation was asked. It was soon evident that the Standard was an enemy of this investigation. Through the efforts of a good friend of the organization, Congressman H. B. Payne of Cleveland, the matter was referred to the Committee on Commerce, where a member of the House, J. N. Camden, whose refinery, the Camden Consolidated Oil Company, if it had not already gone, soon after went into the Standard Oil Alliance, appeared as adviser of the chairman. Now what Mr. Hopkins wanted was to compel the railroads to present their contracts with the Standard Oil Company. The committee summoned the proper railroad officers, Messrs. Cassett, Devereux, and Rudder, and O. H. Payne, treasurer of the Standard Oil Company. Of the railroad men, only Mr. Cassett appeared, and he refused to answer the questions asked or to furnish the documents demanded. Mr. Payne refused also to furnish the committee with information. The two principal witnesses of the oil men were E. G. Patterson of Titusville, to whose energy the investigation was largely due, and Frank Rockefeller of Cleveland, a brother of John D. Rockefeller. Mr. Patterson sketched the history of the oil business since the South Improvement Company identified the Standard Oil Company with that organization and framed the specific complaint of the oil men as follows. The railroad companies have combined with an organization of individuals known as the Standard Ring. They give to that party the sole and entire control of all the petroleum refining interests and petroleum shipping interest in the United States, and consequently place the whole producing interest entirely at their mercy. If they succeed, they place the price of refined oil as high as they please. It is simply optional with them how much they give to us for what we produce. Frank Rockefeller gave a pretty complete story of the trials of an independent refiner in Cleveland during the preceding four years. His testimony in regard to the South Improvement Company has already been quoted. He declared that, at the moment, his concern, the Pioneer Oil Company, was unable to get the same rates as the Standard. The freight agent frankly told him that, unless he could give the road the same amount of oil to transport that the Standard did, he could not give the rate the Standard enjoyed. Mr. Rockefeller said that, in his belief, there was a pooling arrangement between the railroads and the Standard, and that the rebate given was divided up between the Standard Oil Company and the railroad officials. He repeatedly declared to the committee that he did not know this to be a positive fact, that he had no proof, but that he believed such was the truth. Among the railroad officials whom he mentioned as in his opinion enjoying spoils were W. H. Vanderbilt, Thomas Scott, and General Devereux. Of course the newspapers had it that he had sworn that such was the fact. Colonel Scott promptly wired the following denial. The papers of this morning published that a man named Rockefeller stated before your committee that myself and others of this company were participants in rebates made to the Standard Oil Company. So far as the statement relates to myself and the officers of this company, it is unqualifiedly false, and I have to ask that you will summon the officers of the Standard Oil Company or any other parties that may have any knowledge of that subject in order that such villainous and unwarranted statements may be corrected. General Devereux published in the Cleveland Press an equally emphatic denial. Although Mr. Rockefeller promptly declared that he had stated to the committee that he had no personal knowledge that there was such a pool as he had intimated between the railroad men and the Standard, that he had only given his suspicions, there were plenty of people to overlook his explanation and assert that he had given proof of such a division of spoils. The belief spread and is met even today in oil circles. Now, the only basis for any such assertion was the fact that W. H. Vanderbilt, Peter H. Watson, and Amasa Stone were at that time, 1876, stockholders in the Standard Oil Company. There is no evidence of which the writer knows that General Devereux or Colonel Scott ever held any stock in the concern. Indeed, in 1879, when A. J. Cassett was under examination as to the relations of the Pennsylvania Railroad and the Standard Oil Company, his own lawyer took pains to question him on this point, an effort, no doubt, to silence the accusation, which at that date was constantly repeated. Mr. Cassett, 
Mr. McVeigh said. I want to direct your attention to a personal matter which was asked you to a certain extent. You were asked whether you had any knowledge that Mr. Vanderbilt, representing the New York Central, or Mr. Jewett, representing the Erie, had any interest whatever in the Standard Oil Company or any of its affiliated companies. I wish to extend that question to the other trunk lines. I wish you would state whether or not, to your knowledge, Mr. Garrett or anybody representing the Baltimore and Ohio had any such interest. They have not, to my knowledge. Then I wish you would state whether Mr. Scott or yourself, or any officers of the Pennsylvania Railroad, had any such interest. Never to my knowledge. I speak of absolute knowledge as to myself, but as to Mr. Scott, to the best of my knowledge and belief. Of course, after this controversy, the railroads were more obdurate than ever. Mr. Payne and Mr. Camden were active, too, in securing the suppression of the investigations, and they soon succeeded not only in doing that, but in pigeonholing for the time Mr. Hopkins' interstate commerce bill. But the oil men had not been trusting entirely to congressional relief. From the time that they became convinced that the railroads meant to stand by the terms of the Rudder Circular, they began to seek an independent outlet to the sea. The first project to attract attention was the Columbia Conduit Pipeline. This line was begun by one of the picturesque characters of western Pennsylvania, Dr. David Hostetter, the maker of the famous Hostetter's Bitters. Dr. Hostetter's Bitters' headquarters were in Pittsburgh. He had become interested in oil there and had made investments in Butler County. In 1874 he found himself hampered in disposing of his oil and conceived the idea of piping it to Pittsburgh, where he could make a connection with the Baltimore and Ohio Road, which up to this time had refused to go into the oil pool. Now, at that time, the right of eminent domain for pipes had been granted in but eight counties of western Pennsylvania. Allegheny County, in which Pittsburgh is located, was not included in the eight, a restriction which the oil men attributed rightly, no doubt, to the influence of the Pennsylvania Railroad in the state legislature. That road could hardly have been expected to allow the pipes to go to Pittsburgh and connect with a rival road if it could help it. Dr. Hostetter succeeded in buying a right-of-way through the county, however, and laid his pipes within a few miles of the city to a point where he had to pass under a branch of the Pennsylvania Railroad. The spot chosen was the bed of a stream over which the railroad passed by a bridge. Dr. Hostetter claimed he had bought the bed of the run and that the railroad owned simply the right to span the run. He put down his pipes, and the railroad sent a force of armed men to the spot, tore up the pipes, fortified their position, and prepared to hold the fort. The oil men came down in a body, and, seizing an opportune moment, got possession of the disputed point. The railroad had thirty of them arrested for riot, but was not able to get them committed. It did succeed, however, in preventing the relaying of the pipes, and a long litigation over Dr. Hostetter's right to pass under the road ensued. Disgusted with this turn of affairs, Dr. Hostetter leased the line to three young independent oil men, of whom we are to hear more later. They were B. D. Benson, David McElvey, and Major Robert E. Hopkins, all of Titusville. Resourceful and determined, they built tank wagons into which the oil from the pipe was run and was carted across the tracks on the public highway, turned into storage tanks, and again repiped and pumped to Pittsburgh. They were soon doing a good business. The fight to get the Columbia conduit line into Pittsburgh aroused again the agitation in favor of a free pipeline bill, and early in 1875 bills were presented in both the Senate and House of the State, and bitter and long fights over them followed. It was charged that the bills were in the interest of Dr. Hostetter. He wants to transport his blood bitters cheaply, sneered one opponent. Many petitions for the bill were circulated, but there were even stronger remonstrances, and the source of some of them was suspicious enough. For instance, that of the Pittsburgh refiners, representing about one-third of the refining capacity of the Pennsylvania district, and nearly one-third of the entire capacity now in business. As the Pittsburgh refiners were nearly all either owned or leased by the standard concern, and the few independents had no hope save in a free pipeline, there seems to be no doubt about the origin of that remonstrance. Although the bills were strongly supported, 
they were defeated, and the Columbia Conduit Line continued to break bulk and cart its oil over the railroad track. Another route was arranged which for a time promised success. This was to bring crude oil by barges to Pittsburgh, then to carry the refined down the Ohio River to Huntington, and thence by the Richmond and Chesapeake Road to Richmond. This scheme started in February, was well under way by May, and on to Richmond was the cry of the independence. Everything possible was done to make this attempt fail. An effort was even made to prevent the barges which came down the Allegheny River from unloading, and this actually succeeded for some time. There seemed to be always some hitch in each one of the channels which the independents tried, some point at which they could be so harassed that the chance of a living freight rate which they had seen was destroyed. Some time in April 1876 the most ambitious project of all was announced. This was a seaboard pipeline to be run from the oil regions to Baltimore. Up to this time the pipelines had been used merely to gather the oil from the wells and carry it to the railroads. The longest single line in operation was the Columbia Conduit, and it was built thirty miles long. The idea of pumping oil over the mountains to the sea was regarded generally as chimerical. To a trained civil engineer it did not, however, present any insuperable obstacles, and in the winter of 1875 and 1876 Henry Harley, whose connection with the Pennsylvania Transportation Company has already been noted, went to his old chief in the Hoosick Tunnel, General Herman Haupt, and laid the scheme before him. If it was a feasible idea, would General Haupt take charge of the engineering for the Pennsylvania Transportation Company? At the same time Mr. Harley employed General Benjamin Butler to look after the legal side of such an undertaking. Both General Haupt and General Butler were enthusiastic over the idea and took hold of the work with a will. It was not long before the scheme began to attract serious attention. The Eastern papers in particular took it up. The references to it were as a whole favorable. It was regarded everywhere as a remarkable undertaking. Worthy, the New York Graphic said, to be coupled with the Brooklyn Bridge, the blowing up of Hell Gate, and the tunneling of the Hudson River. As General Haupt's plans show, it was a tremendous undertaking, for the line would be, when finished, at least five hundred miles long, and it would be worked by thirty or more tremendous pumps. On July 25 a meeting was held at Parker's Landing, presenting publicly the reports of General Haupt and General Butler. The authority and seriousness of the scheme as set forth at this meeting alarmed the railroads. If this seaboard line went through, it was farewell to the railroad standard combination. Oil could be shipped to the seaboard by it at a cost of sixteen and two-thirds cents a barrel, General Haupt estimated. All of the interest, little and big, which believed they would be injured by the success of the line, began an attack. Curiously enough, one of the first points of hostility was General Haupt himself. An effort was made to discredit his estimate in order to scare people from taking stock. They recalled the Hoosac Tunnel scandal and the fact that the General once built a bridge which had tumbled down, ridiculed his estimate of the cost, etc., etc. The card in which General Haupt answered his chief critic, one who signed himself Vitty, was admirable. A card from General Haupt. What are the charges that I am requested to smash? They are, as I understand them from others, from some I have not seen, that I once built a bridge that tumbled down, that I was connected with the Hoosac Tunnel that cost seventeen millions of dollars, that my estimates of cost of transportation are ridiculously low and unreliable. 1. I did design a bridge some twenty years ago, and constructed a span near Greenfield in Massachusetts, which gave way owing to a defective casting while being tested. The bridge was not finished, had not been opened to the public, had not been accepted from the contractor who repaired the damage in such a manner that a recurrence of a break would have been impossible. I have built spans of bridges and tested them until they broke, to ascertain their ultimate strength, but I suppose that this was a matter that concerned myself and not the public. If the bridge had been thrown open for public use, and an accident had then occurred from defective design or material, the engineer might have been censurable, but not otherwise. In an experience of nearly forty years I have never had a bridge to fail, after being open for travel, or a piece of masonry to give way. 
no accident occurred even upon the temporary military bridges constructed during the war, which President Lincoln used to say were built of bean poles and corn stalks. 2. How about the Hoosick Tunnel? In 1856 I undertook to build the Hoosick Tunnel, at that time ridiculed as visionary and utterly impracticable. I carried it on until 1862, when its practicability was so fully demonstrated that it was considered some discredit to Massachusetts to allow the work to proceed under engineers from another state, and honorable members of the legislature declared that Massachusetts had engineers as comp as any that could be found in Pennsylvania. The work in my hands, as was proved by reports of investigating committees, was costing less than two million dollars, and the trouble then was that the margin was considered too large, and that I was making too much money on the two million dollars which the state had agreed to advance. In 1862 the state took the work out of my hands and put it under control of state commissioners and engineers. The result was that instead of getting the Hoosac Tunnel completed for two million dollars, which was amply sufficient in the hands of H. Halpin Company, it has now cost, under state management, nearly seventeen million dollars. I hope this explanation will be considered sufficient to smash number two. As to number three, the insufficiency of my estimate. The items which enter into such an estimate are pure and simple. There has been but one omission, and that is malicious mischief or deviltry, and this item is so uncertain that, without a more intimate acquaintance with Viddy and his supporters, I could not undertake to estimate it. I have put coal at five dollars per ton, or eighteen cents per bushel, now worth five cents at Brady's, and eight at Pittsburgh. Is this not enough? I have allowed fifty per cent greater consumption at each station that has been estimated by others. I have allowed a thousand dollars a year for each of two engine men at each station. Will anyone say this is not sufficient? And I have, to be safe, estimated the work down below the results given by any of the ordinary hydraulic formula. It would be absurd to tell experienced pipemen that oil cannot be pumped fifteen miles under nine hundred pounds pressure through a four-inch pipe with a discharge of five thousand barrels a day, which is all that the estimate is based upon, and it allows sixty-five days' stoppage besides. Please, gentlemen, let me alone. I have had enough of newspaper controversy in former years. I am sick of it. H. Howe. At the same time that General Haupt was attacked, the Pennsylvania Transportation Company was criticized for bad management. A long letter to the Derrick, August 14, 1876, claimed that the company in the past had been mismanaged, that the credit it asked could not be given safely, that its management had been such that it had scarcely any business left. Indeed, this critic claimed that the last pipeline organized, a small line known as the Keystone, had during the last six months done almost double the business of the Pennsylvania. Under the direction of the Pennsylvania Railroad, it was believed, the Philadelphia papers began to attack the plan. Their claim was that the charters under which the Pennsylvania Transportation Company expected to operate would not allow them to lay such a pipeline. The opposition became such that the New York papers began to take notice of it. The Derrick on September 16, 1876, copies an article from the New York Bulletin, in which it is said that the railroads and the Standard Oil Company now stand in gladiatorial array with shields poised and sword ready to deal the cut. An opposition began to arise, too, from farmers through whose property an attempt was being made to obtain right of way. In Indiana and Armstrong counties the farmers complained to the Secretary of Internal Affairs saying that the company had no business to take their property for a pipeline. One of the common complaints of the farmers' newspapers was that leakage from the pipes would spoil the springs of water, curdle milk, and burn down barns. The matter assumed such proportions that the secretary referred it to the attorney general for a hearing. In the meantime, the Pennsylvania Transportation Company made the most strenuous efforts to secure the right-of-way. A large number of men were sent out to talk over the farmers into signing the leases. Handbills were distributed with an appeal to be generous and to free the oil business from a monopoly that was crushing it. These same circulars told the farmers that a monopoly had hired agents all along the route misrepresenting the facts about their intentions. 
Mr. Harley, under the excitement of the enterprise and the opposition it aroused, became a public figure, and in October the New York Graphic gave a long interview with him. In this interview Mr. Harley claimed that the pipeline scheme was gotten up to escape the Standard Oil monopoly. Litigation, he declared, was all his scheme had to fear. John D. Rockefeller, president of the Standard Monopoly, he said, is working against us in the country newspapers, prejudicing the farmers and raising issues in the courts, and seeking also to embroil us with other carrying lines. It was not long, however, before something more serious than the farmers and their complaints got in the way of the Pennsylvania Transportation Company. This was a rumor that the company was financially embarrassed. Their certificates were refused on the market, and in November a receiver was appointed. Different members of the company were arrested for fraud, among them two or three of the best-known men in the oil regions. The rumors proved only too true. The company had been grossly mismanaged, and the verification of the charges against it put an end to this first scheme for a seaboard pipeline. While all these efforts doomed to failure or to but temporary success were making, a larger attempt to meet Mr. Rockefeller's consolidation was quietly underway. Among those interested in the oil business who had watched the growing power of the Standard with most concern was the head of the Empire Transportation Company, Colonel Joseph D. Potts. In connection with the Pennsylvania Railroad, Colonel Potts had built up this concern, founded in 1865, until it was the most perfectly developed oil transporter in the country. It operated 500 miles of pipe, owned a thousand oil tank cars, controlled large oil yards at Communipaw, New Jersey, was in every respect indeed a model business organization, and it had the satisfaction of knowing that what it was it had made itself from raw material, that its methods were its own, and that the practices it had developed were those followed by other pipeline companies. While the empire had far outstripped all its early competitors, there had grown up in the last year a rival concern which Colonel Potts must have watched with anxiety. This concern, known as the United Pipeline, was really a standard organization, for Mr. Rockefeller, in carrying out his plan of controlling all the oil refineries of the country, had been forced gradually into the pipeline business. His first venture seems to have been in 1873. In that year the oil shipping firm of J. A. Bostwick and Company laid a short pipe in the lower field, as the oil country along the Allegheny River was called. Now J. A. Bostwick was one of the charter members of the South Improvement Company, and when Mr. Rockefeller enlarged his business in 1872, because of the power that enterprise gave him, he took Mr. Bostwick into the standard. This alliance, like all the operations of that venture, was secret. The bitterness of the oil regions against the members of the South Improvement Company was so great for many months after the oil war that Mr. Bostwick and Mr. Rockefeller seem to have concluded in 1873 that it would be a wise precautionary measure for them to lay a pipeline upon which they could rely for a supply of oil in case the oil men attempted again to cut them off from crude, as they had succeeded in doing in 1872. Accordingly, a line was built and put in the charge of a man who has since become known as one of the strong men of the Standard Oil Company. This man, Daniel O'Day, was a young Irishman who had first appeared in the oil country in 1867, and had at once made so good a record for himself as transporting agent that in 1869, when the oil shipping firm of J. A. Bostwick needed a man to look after its shipments, he was employed. The record he made in the next two years was such that it reached the ear of Jay Gould himself, the president of the Erie, over which Mr. Bostwick was doing most of his shipping. Now the Erie at this time was making a hard fight to meet the growth of the Empire Transportation Company. So important did Jay Gould think this struggle that in 1871 he himself came to the oil regions to look after it. One of the first men summoned to his private car, as it lay in Titusville, was the young Irishman, O'Day. He came as he was, begrimed with the oil of the yards, but Mr. Gould was looking for men who could do things and was big enough to see through the grime. When the interview was concluded, Daniel O'Day had convinced Jay Gould that he was the man to divert the oil traffic from the Pennsylvania to the Erie Road, 
and he walked out with an order in his pocket which lifted him over the head of everybody on the road, so far as that particular freight was concerned, for it gave him the right to seize cars wherever he found them. For weeks after this he practically lived on the road, turning from the Pennsylvania in this time a large volume of freight and making it certain that it would have to look to its laurels as it never had before. The next year after this episode came the oil war. The anger of the oil men was poured out on everyone connected in any way with the stockholders of the South Improvement Company, and among others on Mr. O'Day. He knew no more of the South Improvement Company at the start than the rest of the region, but he did know that it was his business to take care of certain property entrusted to him. Resolutions calling on him to resign were passed by oil exchanges and producers' unions. Mobs threatened his cars, his stations, his person, but with the grit of his race he hung to his post. There was perhaps but one other man in the employ of members of the South Improvement Company who showed the same courage, and that was Joseph Seep of Titusville. Almost every other employee fled, the principals in the miserable business took care to stay out of the country, but Mr. O'Day and Mr. Seep polished their shillelaghs and stood over their property night and day until the war was over. Their courage did not go unrewarded. They were made the chief executive representatives in the region of the consolidated standard interest which followed the war, though neither of them knew at the time that they were in the standard employ. They supposed that the shipper Bostwick was an independent concern. It was a man of grit and force and energy then who took hold of the standard's pipeline in 1873. Rapid growth went on. The little line with which they started became the America Transfer Company, gradually extending its pipes to seventy or eighty miles in Clarion County, and in 1875 building lines in the Bradford field. The American Transfer Company was soon working in harmony with the United Pipelines, of which Captain J. J. Vandergrift was the president. This system had its nucleus, like all the others of the country, in a short private line built in 1869 by Captain Vandergrift. It had grown until in 1874 it handled 30 percent of the oil of the region. Now in 1872, after the oil war, Captain Vandergrift had become a convert to Mr. Rockefeller's theory of the good of the oil business, and, as we have seen, had gone into the National Refiners Association as vice president. Later he became a director in the Standard Oil Company. In 1874 he sold a one-third interest of his great pipeline system to Standard Men, and the line was reorganized in the interest of that company. That is, the Standard Oil Combination in 1876 was a large transporter of oil, for the directors and leading stockholders owned and operated fully forty percent of the pipeline of the oil regions, owned all but a very few of the tank cars on both the Central and Erie Roads, and controlled under leases two great oil terminals, those of the Erie and Central Roads. It was little wonder that Colonel Potts watched this rapid concentration of transportation and refining interests with dread. It was more dangerous than the single shipper, and he had always fought that idea on the ground of policy. In the first place, it concentrates great power in the hands of one party over the trade of the road, he told an investigating committee of Congress in 1888 they can remove it at pleasure. In the second place, I think a large number of parties engaged in the same trade are very apt to divide themselves into two different classes as to the way of viewing markets. One class will be hopeful, and the other the reverse. The results will be there will always be one or the other class engaged in shipping some of the traffic. The whole question seems to me to resolve itself into determining what policy will bring the largest volume in the most regular way to the carrier, and it is my opinion, based upon such experiences as I have had, that a hundred shippers of a carload a day would be sure to give to a carrier a more regular volume of business, and I think probably a larger total volume of business in a year's time than one shipper of a hundred cars a day. Holding this theory, Colonel Potts had opposed the rebate to the standard granted by the Pennsylvania in 1875. Three years later he described in a communication, published anonymously, the effect of the rebates granted at that time. The final agreement with the railways was scarcely blotted dried 
ere stealthy movements towards the whole line of outside refiners were evident, although rather felt than seen. As long as practicable, they were denied as mere rumors, but as they gradually became accomplished victories, as one refiner after another, through terror, through lack of skill in ventures, through financial weakness, fell shivering with dislike into the embrace of this commercial octopus, a sense of dread grew rapidly among those independent interests which yet lived, and notably among a portion of the railroad transporters. The chief railroad transporter who shared with the independents the sense of dread which Mr. Rockefeller's absorption of refineries awakened was Mr. Potts himself. As he saw the independents of Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, New York, and the Creek shutting down, selling out, going into bankruptcy, while the Standard and its allies grew bigger day by day, as he saw the Standard interest developing a system of transportation greater than his own, he concluded to prevent, if possible, the one shipper in the oil business. We reached the conclusion, said Colonel Potts in 1888, that there were three great divisions in the petroleum business, the production, the carriage of it, and the preparation of it for market. If any one party controlled absolutely any one of those three divisions, it practically would have a very fair show of controlling the others. We were particularly solicitous about the transportation, and we were a little afraid that the refiners might combine in a single institution, and some of them expressed a strong desire to associate themselves permanently with us. We therefore suggested to the Pennsylvania Road that we should do what we did not wish to do, associate ourselves. That is, our business was transportation and nothing else. But, in order that we might reserve a nucleus of refining capacity to our lines, we suggested we should become interested in one or more refineries, and we became interested in two, one in Philadelphia and one in New York. It was incidental merely to our transportation. The extreme limit was 4,000 barrels a day only. It was in the spring of 1876 that the Empire began to interest itself in refineries. No sooner did Mr. Rockefeller discover this than he sought Mr. Scott and Mr. Cassett, then the third vice president of the Pennsylvania in charge of transportation. It was not fair, Mr. Rockefeller urged. The Empire was a transportation company. If it went into the refining business, it was not to be expected that it would deal as generously with rivals as with its own factories. Besides, it would disturb the one shipper who, they had all agreed, was such a benefit to the railroads. Mr. Scott and Mr. Cassett might have reminded Mr. Rockefeller that he was as truly a transporter as the Empire, but if they did, they were met with a prompt denial of this now well-known fact. He was an oil refiner, only that and nothing more. They tell us they do not control the United Pipelines, Mr. Cassett said in his testimony in 1879. Besides, urged Mr. Rockefeller, if they have refineries, of course they will give them better terms than they do us. Mr. Flagler told the Congressional Committee of 1888 that the Standard was unable to obtain rates through the Empire Transportation Company over the Pennsylvania Railroad for the Pittsburgh or Philadelphia refineries as low as were given by competing roads, and added he, from the fact that the business during those years was so very close as to leave scarcely any margin of profit under the most advantageous circumstances. And we, finding ourselves undersold in the markets by competitors whom we knew had not the same facilities in the way of mechanical appliances for doing the business, knew that there was but one conclusion to be reached, and that was that the Empire Transportation Company favored certain other shippers. I would say favored its own refineries to our injury. As the Standard Oil Company paid a dividend of about 14% in both 1875 and 1876, besides spending large sums in increasing its plants and facilities, the margin of profit cannot have been so low as it seemed to Mr. Flagler in 1888 to have been, naturally enough, for he saw dividends up from 50 to nearly 100% later. Mr. Vanderbilt and Mr. Jewett soon joined their protest to Mr. Rockefeller's. The steps, if, the empire was then taking, said Mr. Jewett, unless checked, would result in a diversion largely of the transportation of oil from our roads. The New York Central Road and our own determined that we ought not to stand by and permit those improvements and arrangements to be made which, when completed, would be beyond our control. 
These protests increased in vehemence, until finally the Pennsylvania officials remonstrated with Mr. Potts. We endeavored, says Mr. Cassatt, to try to get those difficulties harmonized, talked of getting the Empire Transportation Company to lease its refineries to the Standard Oil Company or put them into other hands, but we did not succeed in doing that. Rather than do that, Colonel Potts told Mr. Cassatt, when he proposed that the Empire sell its refineries, we had rather you would buy us out and close our contract with you. When the Standard Oil Company and its allies, the Erie and Central, found that the Pennsylvania would not or could not drive the Empire from its position, they determined on war. Mr. Jewett, the Erie president, in his testimony of 1879 before the Hepburn Commission, takes the burden of starting the fight. Whether the Standard Oil Company was afraid of the Empire Line as a refiner, he said, I have no means of knowing. I never propounded the question. We were opposed to permitting the Empire Line, a creature of the Pennsylvania Railroad, to be building refineries to become the owners of pipelines leading into the oil field and leading to the coast without a contest, and we made it without regard to the Standard Oil Company or anybody else. But when we did determine to make it, I have no doubt we demanded of the Standard Oil Company during the contest to withdraw its shipments from the Pennsylvania. Mr. Flagler gave the following version of the affair to the Congressional Committee of 1888. We made an agreement with the Empire Transportation Company for shipments over the Pennsylvania Railroad on behalf of the Pennsylvania interests, which were then owned by the Standard Oil Company simply because there was no alternative. It was the only vehicle by which these Pittsburgh refineries and the Philadelphia refineries carried their crude oil over the Pennsylvania Railroad. There was no other medium by which business could be done over the Pennsylvania Railroad except through the Empire Transportation Company, a subsidiary company of the Pennsylvania Railroad. The Empire Transportation Company was not only the owner of pipelines in the oil regions and tank cars on the Pennsylvania Railroad, but also of refineries at Philadelphia and New York, and to that extent were our competitors. We, having no interest whatever in transportation, naturally felt jealous of the Empire Transportation Company and drew the attention of the northern lines. By that I mean the New York Central and the Erie Railroads. With the peculiar position of the oil business on the Pennsylvania Railroad, their attention was called to this very soon after the Empire Transportation Company began the business of refining. The position taken by the two northern trunk lines in their intercourse with the Pennsylvania Railroad, as was admitted by Mr. Cassett in his testimony, and stated to me by the representatives of the two northern roads, Mr. Vanderbilt and Mr. Jewett, was that it was unfair to them that the Pennsylvania Railroad did not divest itself of the manufacturing business. Backed by the Erie and Central, Mr. Rockefeller, in the spring of 1877, finally told Mr. Cassett that he would no longer send any of his freight over the Pennsylvania unless the Empire gave up its refineries. The Pennsylvania refused to compel the Empire to this course. According to Mr. Potts's own story, the road was partially goaded to its decision by a demand for more rebates, which came from Mr. Rockefeller at about the time he pronounced his ultimatum on the Empire. They swooped upon the railways, says Colonel Potts, with a demand for a vast increase in their rebate. They threatened, they pleaded, it has been said they purchased, however that may be, they conquered. Minor officials entrusted with the vast power of according secret rates conceded all they were asked to do, even to concealing from their superiors for months the real nature of their illegal agreements. Probably it was at this time that there took place the little scene between Mr. Vanderbilt and Mr. Rockefeller and his colleagues, of which the former told the Hepburn Commission in 1879. The standard people were after more rebates. They affirmed other roads were giving larger rebates than Mr. Vanderbilt, and that their contract with him obliged him to give as much as anybody else did. Gentlemen, he told them, you cannot walk into this office and say we are bound by any contract to do business with you at any price that any other road does that is in competition with us. It is only on a fair competitive basis, a fair competition for business at a price that I consider will pay the company to do it. Soon after this interview, so rumor says, Mr. Vanderbilt sold the standard stock he had acquired as a result of the deals made through the South Improvement Company. 
"'I think they are smarter fellows than I am, a good deal,' he told the commission, somewhat ruefully. "'And if you come in contact with them, I guess you will come to the same conclusion.' Spurred on, then, by resentment at the demands for new rebates, as well as by the injustice of Mr. Rockefeller's demand that the Empire give up its refineries, the Pennsylvania accepted the standard's challenge, resolved to stand by the Empire, and henceforth to treat all its shippers alike. No sooner was its resolution announced in March 1877 than all the freight of the standard, amounting to fully 65 percent of the road's oil traffic, was taken away. An exciting situation, one of out-and-out -out war, developed, for the Empire at once entered on an energetic campaign to make good its loss by developing its own refineries and by forming a loyal support among the independent oil men. Day and night the officers worked on their problem and with growing success. When Mr. Rockefeller saw this, he summoned his backers to action. The Erie and Central began to cut rates to entice away the independents. It is a sad reflection on both the honor and the foresight of the body of oilmen who had been crying so loudly for help that as soon as the rates were cut of the standard lines, many of them began to attempt to force the Pennsylvania to follow. They found the opportunity for immediate profits by playing one belligerent against the other too tempting to resist, says Colonel Potts. We paid them large rebates, says Mr. Cassatt. In fact, we took anything we could get for transporting their oil. In some cases we paid out rebates more than the whole freight. I recollect one instance where we carried oil to New York for Mr. Olin or someone he represented. I think at eight cents less than nothing. I did not say any large quantities, but oil was carried at that rate. End of chapter six, part one. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com. Chapter Six, Part Two of the History of Standard Oil, Volume One, by Ida Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Six, Part Two, Strengthening the Foundations. While the railroads were waging this costly war, the Standard was carrying the fight into the refined market. The Empire had gone systematically to work to develop markets for the output of its own and of the independent refineries. Mr. Rockefeller's business was to prevent any such development. He was well equipped for the task by his system of predatory competition, for in spite of the fact that Mr. Rockefeller claimed that underselling to drive a rival from a market was one of the evils he was called to cure, he did not hesitate to employ it himself. Indeed, he had long used his freedom to sell at any price he wished for the sake of driving a competitor out of the market with calculation and infinite patience. Other refiners burst into the market and undersold for a day, but when Mr. Rockefeller began to undersell, he kept it up day in and day out, week in and week out, month in and month out, until there was literally nothing left of his competitor. A former official of the Empire Transportation Company, who in 1877 took an active part in the war his company was waging against the Standard, once told the writer that in every town, north or south, east or west, in which they already had a market for the refined oil, or attempted to make one, they found a Standard agent on hand ready to undersell. The Empire was not slow in underselling. It is very probable that in many cases it began it, for, as Mr. Cassett says, they endeavored to injure us and our shippers all they could in that fight, and we did the same thing. In spite of the growing bitterness and cost of the contest, the Empire had no thought of yielding. Mr. Potts's hope was in a firm alliance with the independent oil men, many of the strongest of whom were rallying to his side. At the beginning of the fight, he had very shrewdly enlisted in his plan one of the largest independent producers of the day, B. B. Campbell of Butler. Being a pleasure and a duty to me, says Mr. Campbell, I entered into the service with all the zeal and power that I have. I made a contract with the Empire Line wherein I bound myself to give all my business to this line. At the same time, Mr. Potts sought the help of the man who was generally accepted as the coolest, most intelligent, 
and trustworthy adviser in matters of transportation the oil regions had, E.G. Patterson of Titusville. Mr. Patterson was a practical railroad man, and an able and logical opponent of the rebate and one-shipper systems. He had been prominent in the fight against the South Improvement Company, and since that time he had persistently urged the independents to wage war only on the practice of rebates, to refuse them themselves and to hold the railroads strictly to their duty in the matter. Several conferences were held, and finally in the early summer Mr. Potts read the two gentlemen a paper he had drawn up as a contract between the producers and the empire. It speaks well for the fair-mindedness of Mr. Potts that when he read this document to Mr. Campbell and Mr. Patterson, both of whom were skilled in the ways of the transporter, they accepted it in a moment. It was made the duty of Mr. Patterson and myself to get signatures of producers to this agreement, says Mr. Campbell, in a sufficient amount to warrant the Pennsylvania Road entering into a permanent agreement. The contract, I think, was for three years. The attempt to enlist a solid body of oil men in the scheme was at once set on foot, but hardly was it under way before troubles of the most serious import came upon the Pennsylvania Road. A great and general strike on all its branches tied up its traffic for weeks. In Pittsburgh hundreds of thousands of dollars' worth of property were destroyed by a mob of railroad employees. It is not too much to say that in these troubles the Pennsylvania lost millions of dollars. It is certain that as a result of them the company that fall and the coming spring had to pass its dividends for the first time since it commenced paying them, and that its stock fell to $27 a share, par being $50. Overwhelmed by the disasters, Mr. Scott and Mr. Cassett felt that they could not afford any longer to sustain the empire in its fight for the right to refine as well as transport oil. While the coffers of the Pennsylvania were empty, those of the Standard were literally bursting with profits. For the Standard, the winter before this fight came on, had carried to completion for the first time the work which it had been organized to accomplish, that is, it had put up the price of refined oil, in defiance of all laws of supply and demand, and held it up for nearly six months. The story of this dramatic commercial hold-up is told in the next chapter. It is enough for present purposes to say that in the winter of 1876 and 1877 millions of gallons of oil were sold by Mr. Rockefeller and his partners, at a profit of from fifteen to twenty-five cents a gallon. The curious can compute the profits. They certainly ran into multi-millions. A dividend of fifty per cent was paid for the year following the scoop, and there was plenty of money made to throw that dividend out twice over and make a profit, Samuel Adams, one of the Standard's leading men, told an Ohio investigating committee in 1879. The Standard then had a war budget big enough for any opposition, and it is not to be wondered at that the Pennsylvania, knowing this and finding its own treasury depleted, was ready to quit. It was August when Mr. Scott and Mr. Cassett decided to give up the fight. Peace negotiations were at once instituted, Mr. Cassett going to Cleveland to see Messrs. Rockefeller and Flagler, and Mr. Warden, who was visiting them there. Later the same gentleman met Mr. Scott and Mr. Cassett at the St. George Hotel in Philadelphia. The subject of discussion at these meetings, said Mr. Cassett in 1879, when under examination, was whether we could not make some contract or agreement with the Standard Oil Company by which this contest would cease. They insisted that the first condition of their coming back on our line to ship over our road must be that the Empire Transportation Company which company represented us in the oil business, must cease the refining of oil in competition with them. The Empire Transportation Company objected to going out of the refining business. The result of this objection Colonel Potts stated in 1888. Our contract with the Pennsylvania Road gave to them the option, at any time they saw proper, upon reasonable notice, of buying our entire plant. They exercised that option. Was that at your request or desire? the chairman asked the colonel. No, sir. It was at the request of the Pennsylvania Road through their officials. The question then came up as to who should buy the plant of the Empire Transportation Company. The Standard wanted us to do so, says Mr. Cassett. They wanted us to buy the pipelines and cars. 
we objected to buying the pipelines, and it resulted in their buying them and the refining plants. The negotiations were carried on in Philadelphia, Mr. Rockefeller and Mr. Flagler mainly representing the standard. A substantial agreement was reached about the last of October. The agreement would have been probably perfected about that time, except that the Council for the Empire Line thought it was necessary that they should advertise the fact that they were going to sell their property, and have a meeting of their stockholders and get their assent to the sale before the papers were finally signed. The meeting of which Mr. Cassett speaks was held on October 17. Colonel Potts made a statement to the stockholders, which he began by a brief review of the growth of the company from the point when, twelve years before, it had started as a new route charged with the duty of meeting formidable competitors. He pointed out that at the close of the twelfth year the company was the owner of a large fleet of lake vessels, of elevators and docks at the city of Erie, of improved piers in New York City of nearly five thousand cars, of over five hundred miles of pipelines, of valuable interest in refineries, of all the appliances of a great business. In these twelve years, Colonel Potts told his stockholders, the organization had collected more than one hundred million dollars, and in the last year their cars had moved over thirty thousand miles of railway. He explained to the stockholders the conditions of the oil business which had made it necessary, in his judgment, for the Empire Transportation Company to go into the refining business. It was done with the greatest reluctance, Colonel Potts declared, but it was done because he and his colleagues believed that there was no other way for them to save to the Pennsylvania Road permanently the proportion of the oil traffic which they had acquired in the twelve years in which they had been in business. He reviewed dispassionately the circumstances which had led the Pennsylvania Road to ask the company to give up its refineries. He stated his reasons for deciding that it was wiser for the Empire to resign its contracts with the Pennsylvania and go into liquidation than to submit to the demands of the standard interests. Colonel Potts followed his statement by an abstract of the agreements which had been made between the standard people and the Empire. By these agreements the Standard Oil Company bought of the Empire Transportation Company their pipeline interest for the sum of one million ninety four thousand eight hundred and five dollars and fifty six cents their refining interest in new york and philadelphia for the sum of five hundred and one thousand six hundred and fifty two dollars seventy eight cents nine hundred thousand dollars worth of oil tank car trust and they also settled with outside refiners and paid for personal property to the extent of nine hundred thousand dollars more making a total cash payment of three million four hundred thousand dollars. Two millions and a half of this money, Colonel Potts told the stockholders, would be paid that evening by certified checks if the agreements were ratified. Not knowing what your action might be at this meeting, he concluded, we are still in active business. We could not venture to do anything that would check our trade, that would repel customers, that would drive any of them away from us. We must be prepared, if you said no, to go right along with our full machinery under our contract, or under such modification of that as we could fight through. We could not stop moving a barrel of oil. We must be ready to take any offer to us. We must supply parties taking oil. There was nothing we could do but what was done. Nothing is stopped. Everything is going on just as vigorously at this moment through as wide an extent of the country as ever it did, and it will continue to do so until after you take action, until after we get the securities or the money. That, we suppose, will be about six o'clock today, if you act favorably, and at that time we shall, if everything goes through, telegraph to every man in our service and to the heads of departments what has been done, and at twelve o'clock tonight we shall cease to operate anything in the Empire Transportation Company. The stockholders accepted the proposition, and that night at Colonel Potts's office on Gerard Street, Philadelphia, Mr. Scott and Mr. Cassett of the Pennsylvania Railroad, Colonel Potts and two of his colleagues in the Empire, and two of the refiners with whom he was affiliated, met William Rockefeller, Mr. Flagler, Mr. Warden, Mr. Lockhart, Charles Pratt, Jabez A. Bostwick, Daniel O'Day, and J. J. Vandergrift and their counsel, and the papers and checks were signed and passed 
wiping out of existence a great business to which a body of the best transportation men the state of Pennsylvania has produced had given twelve years of their lives. After the meeting was over, there were sent out from Philadelphia to scores of employees of the Empire Transportation Company scattered throughout the state, telegrams stating that at twelve o'clock that night the company would cease to exist. For twelve years the organization had been doing a growing business. On the date of this telegram its operations were more extensive, its opportunities more promising under fair play than they had ever been before in its history. The band of men who had built it up to such healthy success were not giving it up because they had lost faith in it or because they believed there were larger opportunities for them in some other business. They were giving it up because they were compelled to, and probably men never went out of business in this country with a deeper feeling of injustice than that of the officials of the Empire Transportation Company on October 17, 1877, when they sent out the telegrams which put their great creation into liquidation. The pipelines thus acquired were at once consolidated with the other standard lines. Only a few independent lines, and only one of these of importance, the Columbia Conduit, now remained in the oil regions. This company had been doing business since 1875, under the difficulties already described. Dr. Hostetter, the chief stockholder, had become heartily sick of the oil business and wanted to sell. He had approached the Empire Line, and there had been some negotiations. Then came the fall of the Empire, and Dr. Hostetter sought the United Pipeline. Intent on stopping every outlet of oil not under their control, the Standard people bought the Columbia Conduit. By the end of the year the entire pipeline system of the oil regions was in Mr. Rockefeller's hands. He was the only oil gatherer. Practically not a barrel of oil could get to a railroad without his consent. He had set out to be simply the only oil refiner in the country, but to achieve that purpose he had been obliged to make himself an oil transporter. In such unforeseen paths do great ambitions lead men. The first effect of the downfall of the empire was a new railroad pool. Indeed, when it became evident that the Pennsylvania would yield, the Erie Central and the Standard had begun preparing a new adjustment, and the papers for this were ready to be signed on October 17, with those transferring the pipeline property. Never had there been an arrangement which gathered up so completely the oil outlets, for now the Baltimore and Ohio Road came into a pool for the first time. Mr. Garrett had always refused the advances of the other roads, but when he saw that the Columbia Conduit Line his chief feeder was sure to fall into standard hands, when he began to suspect the Baltimore refiners were going into the combination, he realized that if he expected to keep an oil traffic he must join the other roads. The new pool, therefore, was between four roads. Sixty-three percent of the oil traffic was conceded to New York, and of the sixty-three percent going there the Pennsylvania Road was to have twenty-one percent. 37% of the traffic was to go to Philadelphia and Baltimore, and of this 37% the Pennsylvania had 26%. The standard guaranteed the road not less than 2 million barrels a year, and if it failed to send that much over the road it was to pay it a sum equal to the profits it would have realized upon the quantity and deficit. In return for this guarantee of quantity the standard was to pay such rates as might be fixed from time to time by the four trunk lines, which rates it was understood should be so fixed by the trunk lines as to place them on a parity as a cost of transportation by competing lines, and it was to receive weekly a commission of ten per cent on its shipments it controlled. No commission was to be allowed any other shipper unless he should guarantee and furnish such a quantity of oil that after deducting any commission allowed the road realized from it the same amount of profits as it did from the standard trade. The points in the agreement were embodied in a letter from William Rockefeller to Mr. Scott. This letter and the answer declaring the arrangement to be satisfactory to the company are both dated October 17. Four months later Mr. Rockefeller was able to take another step of great advantage. He was able to put into operation the system of drawbacks on other people's shipments which the South Improvement Company contracts had provided for 
and which up to this point he seems not to have been securely enough placed to demand. There were no bones about the request now. Mr. O'Day, the general manager of the American Transfer Company, a pipeline principally in Clarion County, Pennsylvania, which, including its branches, was from eighty to one hundred miles in length, a company now one of the constituents of the United Pipeline, wrote to Mr. Cassett. I here repeat what I once stated to you, and which I wish you to receive and treat as strictly confidential that we have been for many months receiving from the New York Central and Erie Railroads certain sums of money, in no instance less than twenty cents per barrel, on every barrel of crude oil carried by each of these roads. Continuing, Mr. O'Day says, cooperating as we are doing with the Standard Oil Company and the trunk lines in every effort to secure for the railroads paying rates of freight on the oil they carry, I am constrained to say to you that, in justice to the interest I represent, we should receive from your company at least twenty cents on each barrel of crude oil you transport. In submitting this proposition, I find that I should ask you to let this date from November 1, 1877, but I am willing to accept as a compromise, which is to be regarded as strictly a private one between your company and ours, the payment by you of twenty cents per barrel on all crude shipments, commencing with February 1, 1878. Mr. Cassett complied with Mr. O'Day's request. In a letter to the comptroller of the road, he said that he had agreed to allow this commission, after having seen the receipted bills, showing that the New York Central allowed them a commission of thirty-five cents a barrel, and the Erie Railroad a commission of twenty cents a barrel on Bradford oil, and thirty cents on all other oils. Thus the Standard Oil Company, through the American Transfer Company, received in addition to rebates on its own shipments from twenty to thirty cents drawback a barrel on all crude oil, which was sent over the trunk lines by other people as well as by itself. The effect of this new concentration of power was immediate in all the refining centers of the country. Most of the Baltimore refiners, some eight in number, which up to this time had remained independent, seeing themselves in danger of losing their oil supply, were united at the end of 1877 into the Baltimore United Oil Company, with J. N. Camden at their head. Mr. Camden was president of the Camden Consolidated Company of Parkersburg, West Virginia, a concern already in the Standard Alliance, and he and his partners held the majority stock in the Baltimore concern. The method of reaching the Baltimore independents who looked with dislike or fear on the Standard was a familiar one. An officer of one of the concerns owned by the Standard Oil Company would approach the outsider who was feeling the pressure and propose a sale or a lease to himself personally. It was an escape, and it usually ended in the complete absorption of the plant by the Standard. A few of the Baltimore interests refused to go into the Baltimore United Oil Company. Among them was a woman, a widow, Mrs. Sylvia C. Hunt, who had conducted a successful refinery there for several years, and whose business ability and energy had been the admiration of all those with whom she had come in contact. Her interest had been particularly cherished by the Empire Line, Mrs. Hunt's cars being given precedence many a time by agents at Titusville or other shipping points who knew her story. In the summer of 1877 her works burned out. With a courage which was generally commented on at the time, Mrs. Hunt at once rebuilt, and in less than six months had her plant in running order. Then came the fall of the Empire Transportation Company, the sale of the Columbia Conduit Company, and the entrance of the Baltimore and Ohio into the oil pool. Every refiner in Baltimore knew what that meant and the wise sold when Mr. Camden proposed it. Mrs. Hunt, however, did not want to sell. She distrusted the new company. Finally, with many misgivings, she leased for five years at $5,000 a year. It was less than half she had been making, so she claimed, and among her old friends there was much indignation. Colonel Potts, indeed, in telling her story in his brief history of the Standard Oil Company, said, it could fairly have been expected that something of chivalrous feeling would be inspired by the sight of this indomitable spirit who had wrought so noble a work against such great odds. But though fine sentiments and generous words find frequent exodus from the lips of the standard managers, they are never seconded by generous deeds. They crushed her business and her spirit as remorselessly as they would have killed a dog. 
These are bitter words written when Colonel Potts was still smarting from his defeat. They were written, too, without reflection that Mrs. Hunt, if allowed to have all the oil she wanted, allowed equal rates, allowed to use her ability and experience, allowed freedom to sell in the market she had built up, would undoubtedly have increased her business. She would have profited by the high prices of refined oil which Mr. Rockefeller was taking all this trouble to secure. She might have grown a formidable competitor even, and disturbed the steadiness of the working of the great machine. Colonel Potts forgot that if the great purpose was realized, nobody must do business except under Mr. Rockefeller's control. In New York City, the new tariff and pooling arrangement caused the greatest uneasiness, for here was the largest group of prosperous independent refiners. They had all allied themselves with the Empire Transportation Company in the spring of 1877 when its fight with the Standard had begun. But they had been dropped immediately when peace negotiations were begun, and a letter of remonstrance they sent Mr. Scott at the time was never answered. The experiences of several of these independents have been recorded in court testimony. One or two will suffice here. For instance, among the eastern refiners was the firm of Denslow and Bush. Their works were located in South Brooklyn. They had begun in a very small way in 1870, and by 1879 were doing a business of nearly 1,000 barrels of crude a day. They had transported nearly all their oil by the Empire Line. After that line went out of business in October 1877, the contract with Denslow and Bush was transferred to the Pennsylvania Railroad Company. This contract terminated on the first day of May 1878. Sometime in March they received formal notice of its expiration and solicited an interview with the officers of the Pennsylvania Railroad in order to make some arrangements for the further transportation of their oil. Mr. Cassett named New York. The meeting was held at Mr. Denslow's office, 123 Pearl Street. Besides Mr. Bush, there were present to meet Mr. Cassett, Messrs. Lombard, Gregory King, H. C. Olin, and C. C. Burke, all independents. When Mr. Bush was under examination in the suit against the Pennsylvania Railroad in 1879, he gave an account of what happened at this interview. We asked Mr. Cassett what rate of freight we should have after the expiration of these contracts, whether we should have as low a rate of freight as the Standard Oil Company or any other shipper. He said no. We asked why. Well, in the first place, you can't ship as much oil as the Standard Oil Company. Well, if we could ship as much oil, I think Mr. Lombard put this question, would we then have the same rate? He said no. Why? Why, you could not keep the road satisfied. It would make trouble. And he remarked in connection with that, that the Standard Oil Company was the only party that could keep the roads harmonized or satisfied. He intimated, I believe, that each road had a certain percentage of the oil business, and they could divide that up and give each road its proportion, and in that way keep harmony, which we could not do. Right after that he made the remark that he thought that we ought to fix it up with the Standard, we ought to do something so as to all go on and make some money and I think we gave him very distinctly to understand that we didn't propose to enter into any fix-up where we would lose our identity, or sell out, or be under anybody else's thumb. I believe that he went so far as to say that he would see the standard and do everything he could to bring that thing about. We told him very clearly that we didn't want any interference in that direction, and if there was anything to be done, we thought we were quite capable of doing it. The interview perhaps lasted an hour. There was a great deal of talk of one kind and another, but this is, I think, the substance. This interview was in March 1878, I think. Another interview at which I was present was either in June or July. Mr. Scott was present. This interview was brought about because we had been deprived, as we believed, of getting a sufficient number of cars we were entitled to. We had telegraphed or written to Mr. Cassett at least Mr. Olin, our agent, had on several occasions, and tried to get an interview, and finally this one was appointed, at which Mr. Scott would be present. When we arrived there we found Mr. Bundret from Oil City, and Mr. Scott went on to state that he thought that we were receiving our fair proportion of cars. They tried to make us believe and feel, I suppose, that we were getting our due proportion, 
when for some considerable time previous to this we had not been able to do any business in advance. We could only do business from hand to mouth. We could not sell any refined oil unless we absolutely had the crude oil in our possession in New York, and Mr. Lombard, one of our number, had sold a cargo of crude oil, I think of 9,000 barrels, and Denslow and Bush absolutely stopped their refinery for three weeks consequently in order to let their oil go to Ayers and Lombard to finish their vessel, because they would only get three or four cars a day, and we stopped our place for three weeks to give them our crude oil, all we could give, our proportion, in order to lift them out and get their vessel cleared. After trying to impress upon us that we were getting our proportion of cars, we asked Mr. Scott substantially the same question we asked Mr. Cassett in New York, whether we could have, if there was any means by which we could have, the same rate of freight as other shippers got, and he said flatly, no, and we asked him then if we shipped the same amount of oil as the standard, and he said, no, and gave the same reasons Mr. Cassett had in New York that the Standard Oil Company were the only parties that could keep peace among the rogues. We stated to Mr. Scott that we would like to know to what extent we would be discriminated against, because we wanted to know what disadvantage we would have to work under, and we went away very much dissatisfied. All the information we got on that point was from Mr. Cassett in New York, when he stated that the discrimination would be larger on a high rate of freight than on a low rate of freight which led us to infer that it was a percentage discrimination. That is all the point that I recollect we ever got as to the amount of the commission. We told Mr. Scott that if they hadn't sufficient cars on their road we would like to put some on, and he told us flatly that they had just bought out one line and they would not allow another one to be put on, that if they hadn't cars enough they would build them. He seemed to show considerable feeling that afternoon, and he said, well, you have cost us in fighting for you now a million dollars, or a million and a half, something like that, a very large sum, and we don't propose to go into another fight. Strange as it may seem, there were not only men in the refining business who were willing to fight under these conditions, they were men among the very ones who had succumbed at the opening of the Standard's onslaught who were ready to try the business again. Among these was William Harkness, whose experience up to 1876 was related in the preceding chapter. Mr. Harkness's next experience in the oil business was related to the same committee as that already mentioned. When I was compelled to succumb, he said, I thought it was only temporary, that the time would come when I could go into the business I was devoted to. We systematized all our accounts and knew where the weak points were. I was in love with the business. I selected a site near three railroads and the river. I took a run across the water. I was tired and discouraged and used up in 1876 and was gone three or four months. I came back refreshed and ready for work and had the plans and specifications and estimates made for a refinery that would handle 10,000 barrels of oil a day right on this hundred acres of land. I believed the time had arrived when the Pennsylvania Railroad would see their true interest as common carriers and the interest of their stockholders and the business interest of the city of Philadelphia, and I took those plans, specifications, and estimates, and I called on Mr. Roberts, president of the Pennsylvania Railroad Company. I had consulted one or two other gentlemen whose advice was worth having, whether it would be worth my while to go to see President Roberts. I went there and laid the plans before him and told him I wanted to build a refinery of 10,000 barrels capacity a day. I was almost on my knees begging him to allow me to do that. He said, What is it you want? I said, I simply ask to be put upon an equality with everybody else, and especially the Standard Oil Company. I said, I want you to agree with me that you will give me transportation of crude oil as low as you give it to the Standard Oil Company or anybody else for ten years, and then I will give you a written assurance that I will do this refining of ten thousand barrels of oil a day for ten years. I asked him if it was not an honest position for us to be in, I as a manufacturer, and he the president of a railroad. Mr. Roberts said there was a great deal of force in what I said, but he could not go into any written assurance. He said he would not go into any such agreement and I saw Mr. Cassett. He said, in his frank way, that is not practicable, and you know the reason why. 
as this work of absorption went on steadily, persistently, the superstitious fear of resistance to proposals to lease or sell which came from parties known or suspected to be working in harmony with the Standard Oil Company, which had been strong in 1875, grew almost insuperable. In Cleveland this was particularly true. A proposal from Mr. Rockefeller was certainly regarded popularly as little better than the command to stand and deliver. The coal oil business belongs to us, Mr. Rockefeller had told Mr. Morehouse. We have facilities. We must have it. Any concern that starts in business we have sufficient money laid aside to wipe out. And people believed him. The feeling is admirably shown in a remarkable case still quoted in Cleveland, and which belongs to the same period as the foregoing cases, 1878, a case which took the deeper hold on the public sympathy because the contestant was a woman, the widow of one of the first refiners of the town, a Mr. B., who had begun refining in Cleveland in 1860. Mr. B.'s principal business was the manufacture of lubricating oil. Now, at the start, the Standard Oil Company handled only illuminating oil, and accordingly a contract was made between the two parties that Mr. B. should sell to Mr. Rockefeller his refined oil, and that the Standard Oil Company should let the lubricating business in Cleveland alone. This was the status when, in 1874, Mr. B. died. What happened afterwards has been told in full in affidavits made in 1880, and they shall tell the story. The only change made in the documents being to transfer them for the sake of clarity from the legal third person to the first, and to condense them on account of space. Mrs. B.'s story, as told in her affidavit, is as follows. My husband, having contracted a debt not long ago prior to his death for the first time in his life, I, for the interest of my fatherless children as well as myself, thought it my duty to endeavor to continue the business, and accordingly took $92,000 of the stock of the B. Oil Company, and afterwards reduced it to 72000 or 75000 the whole stock of the company being 100000 and continued business from that time until November 1878, making handsome profits out of the business during perhaps the hardest years of the time since Mr. B. had commenced. Sometime in November 1878, the Standard Oil Company sent a man to me by the name of Peter S. Jennings, who had been engaged in the refining business and had sold out to the Standard Oil Company. I told Mr. Jennings that I would carry on no negotiations with him whatever, but that if the Standard Oil Company desired to buy my stock, I must transact the business with its principal officer, Mr. Rockefeller. Mr. Jennings, as representing the Standard Oil Company, told me that the president of the company, Mr. Rockefeller, said that said company would control the refining business, and that he hoped it could be done in one or two years, but if not it would be done anyway, if it took ten years to do it. After two or three days' delay Mr. Rockefeller called upon me at my residence to talk over the negotiation with regard to the purchase of my stock. I told Mr. Rockefeller that I realized the fact that the B. Oil Company was entirely in the power of the Standard Oil Company and that all I could do would be to appeal to his honor as a gentleman and to his sympathy to do with me the best that he could do, and I begged of him to consider his wife in my position, that I had been left with this business and with my fatherless children and with a large indebtedness that Mr. B. had just contracted for the first time in his life, that I felt that I could not do without the income arising from this business, and that I had taken it up and gone on and been successful and I was left with it in the hardest year since my husband commenced the business. He said he was aware of what I had done, and that his wife could never have accomplished so much. I called his attention to the contract that my husband had made with him in relation to carbon oil, whereby the Standard Oil Company agreed not to touch the lubricating branch of the trade carried on by my husband, and reminded him that I had held to that contract rigidly at a great loss to the B. Oil Company but did so because I regarded it a matter of honor to live up to it. I told him that I had become alarmed because the Standard Oil Company was getting control of all the refineries in the country, and that I feared that the said Standard Oil would go into the lubricating trade, and reminded him that he had sent me word that the Standard Oil would not interfere with that branch of the trade. He promised with tears in his eyes that he would stand by me in this transaction.
and that I should not be wronged, and he told me that, in case the sale was made, I might retain whatever amount of the stock of the B Oil Company I desired, his object appearing to be only to get the controlling stock of the company. He said that while the negotiations were pending he would come and see me, and I thought that his feelings were such on the subject that I could trust him and that he would deal honorably by me. Seeing that I was compelled to sell out, I wanted the Standard Oil Company to make me a proposition, and endeavored to get them to do so, but they would not make a proposition. I then made a proposition that the whole stock of the B Oil Company, with accrued dividends, should be sold to said Standard Oil Company for two hundred thousand dollars, which was in fact much below what the stock ought to have been sold for. But they ridiculed that amount, and at last offered me only seventy-nine thousand dollars, not including accounts, and required that each stockholder in the B Oil Company should enter into a bond that within the period of ten years he or she would not directly or indirectly engage in or in any way be concerned with the refining, manufacturing, producing, piping, or dealing in petroleum, or in any of its products within the county of Cayuga and state of Ohio, nor at any other place whatever. Seeing that the property had to go, I asked that I might, according to the understanding with the president of the company, retain fifteen thousand dollars of my stock but the reply to this request was, No outsiders can have any interest in this concern. The Standard Oil Company has dallied as long as it will over this matter. It must be settled up today or go, and they insisted upon my signing the bond above referred to. The promises made by Mr. Rockefeller, president of the Standard Oil Company, were none of them fulfilled. He neither allowed me to retain any portion of my stock nor did he in any way assist me in my negotiations for the sale of my stock, but, on the contrary, was largely instrumental in my being obliged to sell the property much below its true value, and requiring me to enter into the oppressive bond above referred to. After the arrangements for the sale of the refinery and of my stock were fully completed, and the property had been sold by myself and the other stockholders, and after I had made arrangements for the disposition of my money, I received a note from Mr. Rockefeller in reply to one I had written to him threatening to make the transaction public, saying that he would give me back the business as it stood, or that I might retain stock if I wished to, but this was after the entire transaction was closed, and such arrangements had been made for my money that I could not then conveniently enter into it, and I was so indignant over the offer being made at that late date, after my request for the stock having been made at the proper time that I threw the letter into the fire, and paid no further attention to it. The letter which Mrs. B. destroyed was included in the affidavit in which Mr. Rockefeller answered Mrs. B.'s statement. It reads, November 13, 1878. Dear Madam, I have held your note of 11th received yesterday until today, as I wish to thoroughly review every point connected with the negotiations for the purchase of the stock of the B. Oil Company to satisfy myself as to whether I had unwittingly done anything whereby you could have any right to feel injured. It is true in the interview I had with you I suggested that, if you desire to do so, you could retain an interest in the business of the B Oil Company by keeping some number of its shares, and that I understood you to say that, if you sold out, you wished to go entirely out of the business. That being my understanding, our arrangements were made in case you concluded to make the sale that precluded any other interest being represented, and therefore when you did make the inquiry as to your taking some of the stock, our answer was given in accordance with the facts noted above, but not at all in the spirit in which you refer to the refusal in your note. In regard to the reference that you make as to my permitting the business of the B Oil Company to be taken from you, I say that in this, as all else that you have written in your letter of the 11th, you do me most grievous wrong. It was of but little moment to the interests represented by me whether the business of the B Oil Company was purchased or not. I believe that it was for your interest to make the sale, and am entirely candid in this statement, and beg to call your attention to the time, some two years ago, when you consulted Mr. Flagler and myself as to selling out your interest to Mr. Rose, at which time you were desirous of selling at considerably less price and upon time than you have now received in cash, and which sale you would have been glad to have closed if you could have obtained satisfactory security for the deferred payments. 
As to the price paid for the property, it is certainly three times greater than the cost at which we could construct equal or better facilities. But wishing to take a liberal view of it, I urged the proposal of paying the $60,000, which was thought much too high by some of our parties. I believe that if you would reconsider what you have written in your letter, to which this is a reply, you must admit having done me great injustice, and I am satisfied to await upon innate sense of right for such admission. However, in view of what seems your present feelings, I now offer to restore to you the purchase made by us, you simply returning the amount of money which we have invested and leaving us as though no purchase has been made. Should you not desire to accept this proposal, I offer to you one hundred, two hundred, or three hundred shares of the stock at the same price that we paid for the same, with this addition, that we keep the property we are under engagement to pay into the treasury of the oil company an amount which, added to the amount already paid, would make a total of $100,000, and thereby make the shares $100 each. That you may not be compelled to hastily come to the conclusion, I will leave open for three days these propositions for your acceptance or declination, and in the meantime, believe me, yours very truly, John D. Rockefeller. Mr. Rockefeller says further in the affidavit from which this letter is drawn, it is not true that I made any promises that I did not keep in the letter and spirit, and it is not true that I was instrumental to any degree in her being obliged to sell the property much below its true value, and I aver that she was not obliged to sell out, and that such was a voluntary one upon her part and for a sum far in excess of its value, and that the construction which was purchased of her could be replaced for a sum not exceeding $20,000. It is probably true, as Mr. Rockefeller states, that he could have reproduced Mrs. B.'s plant for $20,000, but the plant was but a small part of her assets. She owned one of the oldest lubricating oil refineries in the country, one with an enviable reputation for good work and fair dealing, and with a trade that had been paying an annual net income of from thirty to forty thousand dollars. It was this income for which Mr. Rockefeller paid seventy-nine thousand dollars this income with the old and honorable name of the B Oil Company, with not a few stills and tanks and agitators. It is undoubtedly true, as Mr. Rockefeller avers, that Mrs. B was not obliged to sell out, but the fate of those who in this period of absorption refused to sell was before her eyes. She had seen the twenty Cleveland oil refineries fall into Mr. Rockefeller's hands in 1872, she had watched the steady collapse of the independence in all the refining centers. She had seen every effort to preserve an individual business thwarted. Rightly or wrongly, she had come to believe that a refusal to sell meant a fight with Mr. Rockefeller, that a fight meant ultimately defeat, and she gave up her business to avoid ruin. End of chapter six. Recording by Tom Weiss. Tom's Audiobooks dot com. Chapter 7, Part 1 of The History of Standard Oil, Volume 1 by Ida Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Crisis of 1878 It was clear enough by the opening of 1878 that Mr. Rockefeller need no longer fear any serious trouble from the refining element. To be sure, there were scattered concerns still holding out, and some of them doing very well but his latest move had put him in a position to cut off or at least seriously to interfere with the very raw material in which they worked. It was hardly to be expected after the defeat of the Pennsylvania that any railroad would be rash enough to combine with even a strong group of refiners. As for independent pipelines, there were so many ways of discouraging their building that it did not seem probable that anyone would ever go far. It was only a matter of time, then, when all remaining outside refiners must come into his fold or die. Mr. Rockefeller's path would now have been smooth had it not been for the oil producers. But the oil producers, naturally his enemy, he being the buyer and they the seller, had become in the six years before Mr. Rockefeller had made himself the only gatherer of their oil irreconcilable opponents of whatever he might do. 
The South Improvement Company they regarded rightly enough as devised to control the price of their product, and that scheme they wrongfully laid entirely at Mr. Rockefeller's door. Mr. Rockefeller had been only one of the originators of the South Improvement Company, but the fact that he had become later practically its only supporter, that he was the only one who had profited by it, and that he had turned his Cleveland plant into a machine for carrying out its provisions, had caused the oil country to fix on him the entire responsibility. Then the oil men's experience with Mr. Rockefeller in 1873 had been unfortunate. They charged the failure of their alliance to his duplicity. There is no doubt that Mr. Rockefeller played a shrewd and false game with the oil men in 1873, but the failure of their alliance was their own fault. They did not hold together. They failed to limit their production as they agreed. They suspected one another, and at a moment when, if they had been as patient and wise as their great opponent, they would have had the game in their own hands and him at their feet as he had been in 1872 for the sake of immediate returns, they abandoned some of the best features of their organizations and allied themselves with a the man they distrusted. When that alliance failed, they threw on Mr. Rockefeller's shoulder a blame which they should have taken on their own. Another very real cause for their anxiety and dislike was that as the refiners' alliance progressed, the refiners made a much larger share of the profits than the producers thought fair. The abandoning of their alliance in 1873 had, of course, put an end to their measures for limiting production and for holding over production until it could be sold at the prices they thought profitable. The drill had gone on merrily through 1873, 1874, and 1875, regardless of consumption or prices. By the end of 1874 there were over three and a half million barrels of oil in stock more than twice what there had ever been before. Production was well to a million barrels a month, and prices that year averaged but one dollar and fifteen cents a barrel. For men who considered three dollars a starvation price, this was indeed hard luck. Things looked better by the end of 1875, for production was falling off. By March 1876, stocks had been so reduced that there was strong confidence that the price of crude oil must advance. By June the oil city Derrick began to prophesy three-dollar oil and to advise oil men to hold crude for that price. In August three dollars was reached in the oil city exchange. It had been nearly four years since that price had been paid for oil, and the day the point was reached, August 25, the brokers fairly went mad. They jumped on their chairs, threw up their hats, beat one another on the back, while the spectators in the crowded galleries most of them speculators yelled in sympathy. Before six o'clock that day, oil reached three dollars eleven and a quarter cents. Nobody thought of stopping because it was supper time. The exchange was open until nearly midnight, prices booming on to three dollars seventeen and a half cents. It seemed like old times in the oil region, the good old flush times when people made a fortune one day and threw it away the next. Of course, refined oil went up steadily with crude. Refined reached twenty-one and three-eighths cents in New York the day of this boom at Oil City. The day following the rise was one of the most exciting the oil exchange had ever seen. Never before, declared the Derrick in its report, was so much business done. From early in the morning until ten o'clock at night the exchange was crowded by frantic speculators. Their awful excitement was clear from their blanched faces and wild voices. Fully eight hundred thousand barrels of oil exchanged hands that day. The advance between the time the exchange opened and its close was over fifty-five cents. Refined in New York advanced in accordance with the market on the creek, closing at twenty-four cents. This went on for several days when a new element in the situation began to force itself on the oil men's attention. One of the chief reasons on which they based their confidence in high prices for crude oil was the fact that the foreigners were short of refined oil. It was the custom then, as now, for exporters to buy their oil for the winter European trade in the late summer and early fall. When the boom began, the harbor at New York was beginning to fill up with ships for cargoes. But to the consternation of the oil men intent on keeping up the boom, the exporters were refusing to buy. 
they were declaring the price to which refined had risen to be out of proportion to the price of crude. More, they declared the latter a speculative price. Only once, they argued, had it touched four dollars, and the refiners were not buying at that price for manufacture. They were holding refined too high. It was early in September when the realization came upon the oil regions that a new element was in the problem, a veritable blockade in exports. As the days went on they saw that this was no temporary affair. They saw that Mr. Rockefeller's combination was at last carrying out just what it had been organized to do, forcing the price it wanted or refined. Day after day refined was held at twenty-six cents. Day after day the exporters refused to buy. It was not until the end of September, in fact, that they began to yield, as it was inevitable they should do, for the game was certainly in the hands of the refiners, and Europe had to have its light. The exporters began to see, too, that if they held off longer they might have to pay higher prices, for it was rumored that the Standard Combination was shutting down its factories, literally making refined scarce, while crude oil was piling up in Pennsylvania. With the yielding of the exporter exactly what they feared occurred. The price was raised. The exporters balked again. The matter began to attract public attention. The New York Herald was particularly active in airing the situation and did not hesitate to denounce it as a petroleum plot. The leaders were interviewed, among them Mr. Rockefeller. Mr. Rockefeller still held to his theory that to make oil dear was worthy of public approval. They had aimed to control the price of oil in a perfectly legitimate way, he told the Herald reporter, and the exporters would have to yield to their prices. By the end of October New York Harbor was full of vessels, a mute protest against the corner, and it was not until November that the exporters finally gave in and began to take all the oil they could get at prices asked, which ranged from twenty-six to thirty-five cents and these prices were held all through the winter of 1876-77 up to February 22. They were held regardless of the price of crude, for, due to their utmost, the producers could not keep their oil up to the corresponding price of refined. According to the scale of relative prices then accepted, twenty-six cents a gallon for refined meant five dollars a barrel for crude, yet there was not a month in the entire period of this hold-up that crude averaged that price. In December, when the average price of refined was twenty-nine and three-eighths cents, crude was but three dollars seventy-eight and an eighth cents a barrel. The producers held meetings and passed resolutions, cursed the refiners, and talked of building independent refineries, filled the columns of the derrick with open letters advocating a shutdown, an alliance of their own restrictive legislation, an oil men's railway and what was more to the point some of them supported, with more or less fidelity, the efforts to build up counter-movements noted in the last chapter, the Columbia Conduit Line, the Seaboard Pipeline, and especially the alliance with the Empire Transportation Company attempted in the spring of 1877. There seemed more hope in this last combination than in any other movement, for they had faith in Colonel Potts, and besides they were accustomed to seeing the Pennsylvania Railroad get what it wanted. The defeat of the Pennsylvania was therefore the heavier blow. Indeed, the news of the sale of the Empire pipelines to the Standard was like the sounding of the toxin in the angry and baffled oil regions. It revived the spirit of 1872. But it was the spirit of 1872, with new dignity and a discretion such had never before been seen in the blatant region. In every town from McKean County southwest to Butler, the oil towns hastened to organize themselves into a secret society. Little by little it came out that a producer's union had been organized. From all that could be learned it looked very much as if the petroleum producer's union had come into existence to do business. On November 21, 1877, the first meeting of the new organization was held the Petroleum Parliament, or Congress, it was called. This Congress, which met in Titusville, was composed of a 172 delegates. It was claimed that it represented at least 2,000 oil producers and not less than 75 millions in money. It is certain it included the representative men of the oil regions 
those to whose daring hard work and energy the discovery and development of the oil fields, as they were known at that time, were entirely due. For four days the Congress was in session, and it is a remarkable comment on the seriousness with which it had undertaken its work that although reporters from all parts of the country interested in oil were present, nothing leaked out. In December a second session of four days was held in Titusville, but no announcement of what was doing was made to the press. Indeed, it was only as lines of action developed that the public became familiar with what the producers had resolved on in the days of secret session which they had held. Their resolutions had been eminently wise, and they undertook their support vigorously and intelligently. First and foremost, they resolved to stand by all efforts to secure an outlet to the independent seaboard of the Standard and the Allied Railroads. Two enterprises were put before them at once. The first was what was known as the Equitable Petroleum Company, an organization started by one of the most resourceful and active independent men in the oil country, one of whom we are to hear more, Lewis Emery, Jr., this company, in which some two hundred oil producers in the Bradford field had taken stock, proposed to lay a pipeline to Buffalo and to ship their oil thence by the Erie Canal. They had acquired a right-of-way to Buffalo and had capital pledged to carry out the project. The second enterprise to come before the newly formed union was much more ambitious. It was nothing less than a revival of Mr. Harley's enterprise, which had attracted so much attention in 1876. It was revived now by the three men who had been operating the Columbia Conduit Line under a lease, Messrs. Benson, McKelvey, and Hopkins, who had been set free by the sale of that property to the Standard. Their experience with the pipeline business had convinced them it was one of the most lucrative departments of the oil industry. They believed, too, that oil could be pumped over the mountains, and no sooner were they free than they took up Mr. Harley's old idea and engaged the same engineer he had brought into the enterprise, General Herman Haupt, to survey a route from Brady's Bend on the Allegheny River to Baltimore, Maryland, a distance of 235 miles. To both of these projects the General Council of the Union gave promise of support. The demand for interstate commerce legislation was renewed at once by the Union, and in December E. G. Patterson, the head of the committee having the matter in hand, prepared the first draft of an act which was put in formal shape by George B. Hibbert of Buffalo, counsel employed by the Union for this purpose. Mr. Hibbert also prepared a memorandum of the law on the subject. The bill prepared by Mr. Patterson and Mr. Hibbert was introduced into the House of Representatives in May 1878 by Lewis F. Watson, whose home was in Warren County, Pennsylvania. It was called into committee and came out as the Reagan Bill, and as such was passed by the end of the year by the House, but only to be smothered later in the Senate. At the same time that the effort was going on in Washington for relief, the legislature of Pennsylvania was being besieged again for a free pipeline bill and an anti-discrimination bill. Both of these projects failed, and the committee having them in charge said bitterly in its report to the Union, "'How well we have succeeded at Harrisburg you all know.' It would be in vain for your committee to describe the efforts of the Council in this direction. It has been simply a history of failure and disgrace. If it has taught us anything, it is that our present lawmakers, as a body, are ignorant, corrupt, and unprincipled, that the majority of them are, directly or indirectly, under the control of the very monopolies against whose acts we have been seeking relief. There has been invented by the Standard Oil Company no argument or assertion however false or ridiculous, which has not found a man in the Pennsylvania legislature mean enough to become its champion. On every side, indeed, the producers hastened to protect themselves against the lord of the oil regions, as Mr. Rockefeller, not inaptly, was called on the completion of his pipeline monopoly. That they were not merely alarmist in thinking that they must do something to protect their interests was demonstrated sooner than was anticipated. The demonstration was hurried by an unforeseen and difficult situation, a great outpouring of oil in a new field, the Bradford or Northern Field in McKean County, Pennsylvania. About the time that Mr. Rockefeller's lordship was realized, it became certain that a deposit of oil had been discovered which was going to lead soon to a production 
vastly in excess of the consumption as well as in excess of the then existing facilities for gathering and storing oil. If Mr. Rockefeller wished to keep his monopoly, he must, it was evident, enter upon a campaign of expansion calling for an immense expenditure of energy and money. He must lay pipes in a hundred directions to get the output of new wells. He must build tanks holding thousands of barrels to receive the oil. And all of this must be done quickly if rivals were to be kept out of the way. There was no hesitation on the part of the United Pipelines. One of the greatest construction feats the country has ever seen was put through in the years 1878, 1879, and 1880 in the Bradford oil field by the Standard Interest. It was a wonderful illustration of the surpassing intelligence, energy, and courage with which the Standard Oil attacks its problems. But while it was putting through this feat, it instituted a policy toward the producers which was regarded by them as tyrannical and unjustifiable. The first maneuver in this new policy hit the producer in a very tender spot, for it concerned the price he was to receive for oil. The method which prevailed at the time in handling and buying and selling oil was this. At the request of a well owner connected with his pipeline, his oil was run and credited to him in the pipeline office. Here he could hold it as long as he wished by paying a storage charge. If he wished to sell his credit balance, as oil to his account was called, he simply gave the buyer an order on the line for the oil, and it was transferred to the account of the new buyer. The pipelines frequently had hundreds of thousands of barrels of oil in hand, and they traded with this oil as banks do with their deposits. That is, they issued certificates for each 1,000 barrels of oil on hand, and these certificates were negotiable like any other paper. Now the United Pipelines acknowledged itself a common carrier and so was obliged to discharge the duty of collecting oil on demand, or at least within a reasonable time after the demand of its patrons. But in December 1877, after the monopoly was completed, they refused to discharge their obligations in the customary way. On the plea that they had not sufficient tankage to carry oil in the Bradford field, they issued an order that no oil would be run in that district for anyone unless it was sold for immediate shipment. That is, no oil would be taken to hold for storage, it would be taken for shipping only. At the same time the standard buyer, J. A. Bostwick, decreed that henceforth no Bradford oil would be bought for immediate shipment unless it was offered at less than the market price. No fixed discount was set. The seller was asked what he would take. His offer was, of course, according to his necessities. Even then, an answer was not always immediately given. The seller was told to come back in five or ten days, and he would be told if his oil would be taken. A feature of the new order, particularly galling to the oil men, was the manner in which it was enforced. Formerly, the buyer and seller had met freely in the oil exchanges and their business offices, and transactions had been carried on as among equals. Now the producers were obliged to form in line before the United Pipeline offices and to enter one at a time to consult the buyer. A line of a hundred men or more often stood during the hours set before the office, waiting their turn to dispose of their oil. It should be said in justice to Mr. Bostwick that he was not the first buyer to take oil at a discount. The producers themselves frequently offered oil at less than the market price when in need of money but Mr. Bostwick was the first buyer in a situation to force them to make the discount regularly. When these orders came, few of the producers had sufficient private tankage to take care of any amount of oil. Here was the situation, then. To keep oil from running on the ground, the producer must sell it. But if he sold it, he must take a price from two to twenty-five cents or more below the market. The immediate shipment order was not an invention of the United Pipelines. It had been enforced more than once for brief periods by various lines when they found their capacity overcrowded by some unexpected situation. In 1872, Episodic among the horses so upset things in the oil regions that for a short time an immediate shipment order was enforced. In 1872, when the pipelines were overtaxed by a great outpouring of oil in the lower field, immediate shipment had been attempted, 
but at that time there were still so many independent pipes struggling for business that the movement met no success. Now, however, the United Pipeline had things its own way. That they were not ready to meet the growing Bradford production is plain from a study of the figures. There were in the oil regions at the close of 1877, according to the Oil City Derrick, four million barrels of tankage. There was on hand at this time three million one hundred and twenty seven eight hundred and thirty seven barrels of oil, but the empty tankage was in the wrong place. In the Bradford field, where the daily production had suddenly increased from two thousand barrels in January to eight thousand four hundred and fifty one barrels in December, there was only a little over two hundred thousand barrels of tankage. In order to take care of the oil, the pipelines began to make nearly all their shipments from that field, and oil piled up in the lower region to the great dissatisfaction of the producers there. As soon as the situation of the Bradford field was realized, both the United Pipes and the producers began a furious campaign of tank building. By the beginning of April 1878, the tankage there had been increased to 1,152,028 barrels. Between April 1 and November 1, 70 tanks of from 10,000 to 25,000 barrels capacity were built in McKean County. The greater number of these belonged to the producers. According to the United Pipeline statement, there was under their control in the entire oil regions in October 5,200,000 barrels of tankage, two-thirds of which belonged to producers but was held by them under a lease. But oil poured from the ground faster than tanks could be built. In six months, that is, by July 1878, the daily output of Bradford had become over 18,000 barrels, an increase of 10,000 barrels a day over that of the previous December. That it was a most difficult situation for everybody is evident. There was but one way to prevent loss, shut down the wells and stop the drill. But this the producers refused to consider. Of course the price of oil went down rapidly, so far did the production exceed consumption. But why, cried the producer, when oil is already so low, take advantage of our necessity and force us into competition with each other? Why enforce this immediate shipment? They answered their question themselves, and began then to make a charge against the standard which they continue to make today that is, that it habitually meets the extraordinary expenses to which it is put by depressing the price of crude oil, taking it out of the producer. The Bradford region demanded great investments, therefore immediate shipment. The producer pays. The writer has no documentary proof that this is Mr. Rockefeller's policy, but there is no question that the oil region believes it is and this belief must be taken into account if one attempts to explain the long warfare of the oil country on him and his company. It is a common enough thing today, indeed, to hear oil producers in northwestern Pennsylvania remark facetiously when a new endowment to Chicago University is reported. Yes, I contributed so much on such a day. Don't you remember how the market slumped without a cause? The university needed the money and so Mr. Rockefeller called on us to stand and deliver. A few months after immediate shipment was begun, a new cause for dissatisfaction arose. More or less private tankage leased to the lines had always been in existence. It enabled the producer to carry his oil without paying storage, and of course it was the business of the company to empty this storage within a reasonable time after the owner demanded it. But in the spring the lines, under the same plea of undercapacity, refused to carry out this duty to the tank owner. That is, they refused to give him his tankage, although he had sold his oil. Thus A owns five thousand barrels of tankage. It is full. He sells a proportion of it to Mr. Bostwick and asks the United Pipelines to run the oil accumulated at his wells. But the United Pipelines refuses on the ground that the line is full. The loss to producers incident upon these orders was terrible. All over the Bradford field men saw their oil running on the ground, though they offered to sell it at ruinous prices, and though they might have thousands of barrels of tankage leased to the United Lines. Yet they did not riot, conscious that their own reckless drilling had brought on the trouble, they cursed the standard, and put down 
more wells. But in the spring of 1878, Mr. Rockefeller and his colleagues instituted a series of maneuvers which shattered the last remnant of confidence the oil men had in the sincerity of their claim that they were doing their utmost to relieve the distressed oil regions and that their measures were necessary to hold the producers in check. The pipelines began to refuse to load cars for the shippers who supplied the few independent refiners with oil. The experiences of many of these independent men have been told before the courts. For instance, W. H. Nicholson, the representative of Mr. Olin of New York, a shipper of petroleum, testified that in May 1878 he began to have difficulty in getting cars. At Olean one day Mr. Olin telegraphed to the officials of the Erie Road to know if he could get one hundred cars to run east. The reply came back, yes. About noon, Mr. Nicholson says, he saw Mr. O'Day, the manager of the United Pipelines, in which his oil was stored, and told him that he was waiting to have his cars loaded. Mr. Day at once said he could not load the cars. But I have an order from the Erie officials giving me the cars, Mr. Nicholson objected. That makes no difference, O'Day replied. I cannot load cars except upon an order from Pratt. Nor would he do it. The cars were not loaded for Mr. Nicholson, although at that time he had 10,000 barrels of oil in the United Pipelines and an order for 100 cars from the officials of the Erie Road in his hand. B. B. Campbell, at that time president of the Producers' Union, gave his experience at this time in the suit of the Commonwealth against the Pennsylvania Railroad. I never heard of a scarcity of cars until the early part of June 1878. I came to Parker about five o'clock in the evening and found the citizens in a state of terrible excitement. The pipelines would not run oil unless it was sold. The only shippers we had in Parker of any amount, viz. the agents of the Standard Oil Company, would not buy oil, stating that they could not get cars. Hundreds of wells were stopped to their great injury. Thousands more, whose owners were afraid to stop them for fear of damage by salt water, were pumping the oil on the ground. I used all the influence I had to prevent an outbreak and destruction of railroad and pipelines. I at once went over to the Allegheny Valley Railroad office and telegraphed to John Scott, president of the Allegheny Valley Railroad Company. The refusal of the United to run oil unless sold upon immediate shipment and of the railroad to furnish cars had created such a degree of excitement here that the more conservative part of the citizens will not be able to control the peace and I fear that the scenes of last July will be repeated on an aggravated scale. That message I left in the office about seven o'clock in the evening. I got up the next morning before seven and received an answer. What would you advise should be done? John Scott. I answered, Will you meet tomorrow morning, which would be Saturday? On Saturday morning I came in on an early train and met at the depot Mr. Shin, then, I believe, vice-president of the Allegheny Valley Railroad Company, David A. Stewart, one of the directors of the road, and Thomas M. King, assistant superintendent. I spoke very plainly to Mr. Shin, telling him that the idea of a scarcity of cars on daily shipments of less than 30,000 barrels a day was such an absurd barefaced pretense that he could not expect men of ordinary intelligence to accept it, as the preceding fall when business required the railroads could carry day after day from 50,000 to 60,000 barrels of oil. Mr. Shin stated clearly that I knew that the Allegheny Valley Railroad Company did not control the oil business over its line, but was governed entirely and exclusively by orders received from the Pennsylvania Railroad Company. I then requested him to be the vehicle of communicating to the Pennsylvania Railroad officials my views on the subject telling him that I was convinced that unless immediate relief was furnished and cars afforded there would be an outbreak in the oil regions. After further conversation we parted. My interview with them was not as officials of the Allegheny Valley Railroad Company, but as representatives of the oil traffic carried and controlled by the Pennsylvania Road. On the next Monday I returned to Parker. After passing Red Bank, where the low-grade road, the connecting link between the Valley Road and the Philadelphia and Erie Road, meets the Valley Road, between that point and Parker, the express train was delayed for over half an hour in passing through hundreds of empty oil cars. In June another exasperating episode occurred, growing out of the attempts of the oilmen to secure independent routes to the seaboard. 
As we have seen, two enterprises had been launched late in 1877 under the patronage of the Petroleum Producers' Union. As soon as the Equitable had acquired its right-of-way to Buffalo, Mr. Emery, the head of the company, his papers in hand, sought an interview with representatives of the Buffalo and McKean Road, and told them if they did not consent that the Equitable lay a pipeline to their road, and did not contract to carry the oil from that connection to Buffalo, the pipeline to Buffalo would be laid. After considerable negotiation, a contract was made with the railroad, and by June the new company was ready with pipeline, cars, and barges to carry oil to New York. But no sooner did they attempt to begin operations than the railroad, under pressure from the Pennsylvania Railroad, it was claimed, refused to carry out its contracts. The cars the Equitable ordered sent to the loading track were refused. A side track it had laid was torn up, the frog torn out. Everything indeed was done to prevent the Equitable doing business, though finally a vigorous appeal to the law brought the road to terms, and in July oil began to flow eastward by this indirect route. No sooner did the Standard find that the Equitable people were really doing business than they appealed to the railroads. A meeting of the representatives of the trunk lines was held in Saratoga in July, and the rates on crude eastward were dropped to eighty cents to meet the new competition. While this fight was going on against the Equitable, all sorts of interference were being put in the way of the seaboard line between Brady's Bend and Baltimore. It was ridiculed as chimerical to attempt to pump oil over the mountains, and General Haupt was declared to be a visionary engineer with a record of failures. All the old stories retailed in 1876 were dragged out again. The farmers were told that the leakage from the pipeline would ruin their fields and endanger their buildings, and an active campaign to excite prejudice was carried on again in the farmers' papers. Philadelphia and Pittsburgh both fought the plan, the press and chambers of commerce opposing the free pipe bill at that time before the legislature, and the project generally. In Pittsburgh the opposition created almost a riot, for the oil producers of the lower field, who had long bought their supplies there, now threatened to boycott the city if the pipeline was fought. So strong was the opposition that capital took fright, and the company found it most difficult to secure funds. This opposition to the pipeline was, of course, charged against the Standard and the Pennsylvania Railroad. Now, while the railroads were refusing cars to independent shippers, or if they gave an order for them, the United Pipelines were refusing to load them, while the Standard and the railroads were doing their utmost to prevent the Equitable Line doing business, and were discouraging in every way the seaboard pipeline, new routes which would take care of a proportion at least of the oil which they claimed they could not handle, thousands of barrels of oil were running on the ground in Bradford, and two of the independent refineries of New York shut down entirely in order that a third of their number might get oil enough to fill an order. This interference with the outside interests, thus preventing the small degree of relief which they would have afforded, and a growing conviction that the Standard meant to keep up the immediate shipment order, at least until it had built the pipes and tanks needed in the Bradford field, finally aroused the region to a point where riot was imminent. The long line of producers which filed into the United Pipeline's office day after day to sell their oil at whatever prices they could get for it, and who, having put in an offer which varied according to their necessities, were usually told to come back in ten days, and the buyer would see whether he wanted it or not. This long line of men began to talk of revolution. Crowds gathered about the offices of the Standard threatening and jeering. Mysterious things, crossbones and deathheads, were found plentifully sprinkled on the buildings owned by the Standard interests. More than once the slumber of the oil towns was disturbed by marching bodies of men. It was certain that a species of Ku Klux had hold of the Bradford region, and that a very little spark was needed to touch off the United Pipelines. In the meantime things were scarcely less exciting in the lower fields. The immediate shipment order was looked upon there as particularly outrageous, because there was no lack of lines or tanks in that field, and when in the summer of 1878 there was added to this cause an unjustifiable scarcity of cars, excitement rose to fever heat. End of Chapter 7, Part 1 Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com
Chapter Seven, Part Two of the History of Standard Oil, Volume One, by Ida Tarbell. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Crisis of eighteen seventy eight. The only thing which prevented a riot at this time and great destruction of property, if not of life, was the strong hand the Petroleum Producers Union had on the country. Fearing that if violence did occur, the different movements they had underway would be prejudiced, they sent a committee of twenty-five men to Harrisburg to see Governor Hartramp. They laid before him and the Attorney General of the State the grievance of the oil producers in an appeal reviewing the history of the industry. They demanded that the United Pipelines be made to perform its duty as a public carrier, and the railroads be made to cease their discrimination against shippers both in the matter of rebates and in furnishing cars. They called the governor's attention to the fact that there were already existing laws touching these matters, which in their judgment met the case, and if the existing laws did not give them relief, that it was the plain duty of the executive to call a meeting of the legislature and pass such acts as would do so. Governor Hartranft was much stirred by the story of the producers. He went himself to the oil regions to see the situation and in August directed the producers to put their demands into the form of an appeal. This was done, and it was decided to bring proceedings by writ of quo waranto against the United Pipelines, and by separate bills in equity against the Pennsylvania Railroad and the other lines doing business in the state. It was September before the state authorities began their investigation of the United Pipelines, the hearings being held in Titusville. Many witnesses summoned failed to appear but enough testimony was brought out in this investigation to show that the railroads had refused to furnish cars for independence when they had them empty, and that the United Pipelines had clearly violated its duty as a common carrier. In his report on this investigation, the Secretary of Internal Affairs, William McCandless, rendered a verdict that the charges of the oil producers had not been substantiated in any way that demanded action. The indignation which followed this report was intense. It found a vent in the hanging and effigy of McCandless, who was universally known in the state as Buck. In the oil exchange at Parker on the morning of October 19, the figure of a man was found hanged by the neck to a gallows, and the producers left it hanging there all day so that they might jeer and curse it. Across the forehead of the effigy, in large blood-red letters, were the words, Pennsylvania Railroad. Pinned to the gallows there was a card bearing a quotation from Secretary McCandless's report. The charges of the oil producers have not been substantiated in any way that demands action. In Bradford a huge effigy hung in the streets all day, and in the village of Tarport nearby another swayed on the gallows. They pulled down the effigy at Bradford and drew from a pocket what purported to be a check signed by John D. Rockefeller, president of the Standard Oil Company, in favor of Buck McCandless, for $20,000, and endorsed by the Pennsylvania Railroad Company. That represented the price, they said, that McCandless got for signing the report. Throughout the oil country there was hardly an oil producer to be found not associated with the Standard Oil Company who did not believe that McCandless had sold himself and his office to the Standard Oil Combination for $20,000 and used the money to help in his congressional canvass. The excitement in the oil regions spread all over the country. Something of the importance the press attached to it may be judged from the way the New York Sun handled the question. For six weeks it kept one of the ablest members of its staff in the oil regions. Six columns of the first page of the issue for November 13 was taken up with the story of the excitement coupled with the full account of the South Improvement Company and the development of the Standard Oil Company out of that concern. On November 23 the first page contained four columns more under blazing headlines. Early in 1879 the hearing of the suits in equity brought by the Commonwealth against the various transportation companies, of which the producers had been complaining, were begun. The witnesses subpoenaed failed at first to appear, and when on the stand they frequently refused to reply. But it soon became apparent to them that the state authorities were in earnest, and that they must answer or go to Europe. By March 1879 
an important array of testimony had been brought out. Among the standard men who had appeared had been John D. Archbald, William Frew, Charles Lockhart, and J. J. Vandergrift. A score or more of producers also appeared. The most important witness from the railroad circles, and indeed the most important witness who appeared, was A. J. Cassett. Mr. Cassett's testimony was startling in its candor and its completeness, and substantiated in every particular what the oil men had been claiming, that the Pennsylvania Railroad had become the creature of the Standard Oil Company, that it was not only giving that company rates much lower than to any other organization, but that it was using its facilities with a direct view of preventing any outside refiner or dealer in oil from carrying on an independent business. The same or similar conditions, not only in oil but in other products which led to these suits, led to investigations in other states. Toward the end of 1878 the Chamber of Commerce of New York City demanded from the legislature of the state an investigation of the New York railroads. This investigation was carried on from the beginning of 1879. The revelations were amazing. Before the Hepburn Commission, as it was called from the name of the chairman, was through with its work, there had appeared before it to give testimony in regard to the conduct of the Standard Oil Company and of the relation of the Erie and the Central Roads to it, H. H. Rogers, J. D. Archbald, Yabez A. Bostwick, and W. T. Scheide. A large number of independent oil men had also appeared. William H. Vanderbilt had been examined, and G. H. Blanchard, the freight agent of the Erie Road, had given a full account of the relation of the Erie to the Standard, perhaps the most useful piece of testimony after that of Mr. Cassett belonging to this period of the Standard's history. At the same time that the Pennsylvania suits were going on, and the Hepburn Commission was doing its work, the legislature of Ohio instituted an investigation. It was commonly charged that this investigation was smothered, but it was not smothered until H. M. Flagler had appeared before it and given some most interesting facts concerning rebates. A number of gentlemen who were finding it hard to do oil business also appeared before the Ohio Committee and told their stories. By April 1879 there had been brought out in these various investigations a mass of testimony sufficient in the judgment of certain of the producers to establish the truth of a charge which they had long been making, and that was that the standard was simply a revival of the South Improvement Company. Now the verdict of the Congressional Committee had been that the South Improvement Company was a conspiracy. Therefore, said the producers, the Standard Oil Company is a conspiracy. Their hope had been, from the first, to obtain proof to establish this charge. Having this they believed they could obtain judgment from the courts against the officials of the company, and either break it up or put its members in the penitentiary. The more hot-headed of the producers believed they now had this evidence. If one will examine the testimony which had been given thus far in the course of the various examinations, one will see that there was reason for their belief. In the first place, it had been established that all the stockholders of the South Improvement Company, excepting four, were now members of the Standard Oil Combination. Indeed, the only persons holding high positions in the new combination at this date who were not South Improvement Company men were Charles Pratt, J. J. Vandergrift, H. H. Rogers, and John D. Archibald. The South Improvement Company had been a secret organization. So was the new Standard Alliance. That is, the most strenuous efforts had been made to keep it secret. For instance, the sale of the works of Lockhart, Warden, and Pratt to the Standard was kept from the public. Indeed, it was a year after these sales before even the Erie Railroad knew that Mr. Rockefeller had any affiliations besides those with Pratt and Company, and it made its contracts with him on this assumption. When purchases of refineries were made, it was the custom to continue the business under the name of the original concern. Thus, when Mrs. B. of Cleveland sold in 1878, as recounted in the last chapter, the persons selling were obliged to keep the sale secret even from the employees of the concern. The understanding was with regard to the sale of the property to the Standard Oil Company, said the shipping clerk in his affidavit, that it should not be known outside of their own parties that it was to be kept a profound secret 
and that the business was to be carried on as if the B Oil Company was still a competitor. The secret rights with which the contract was made in 1876 between Mr. Rockefeller and Schofield, Shermer, and Teagle have already been described. To keep the relations of the various standard concerns secret, Mr. Rockefeller went so far in 1880 as to make an affidavit like the following. It is not true, as stated by Mr. Teagle in his affidavit, that the Standard Oil Company, directly or indirectly through its officers or agents, owns or controls the works of Warden Prue and Company, Lockhart Prue and Company, J. A. Bostwick and Company, C. Pratt and Company, Acme Refining Company, Imperial Refining Company, Camden Consolidated Company, and the DeVoe Manufacturing Company. Nor is it true that the Standard Oil Company, directly or indirectly through its officers or agents, owns or controls the refinery at Hunters Point, New York. It is not true that the Standard Oil Company, directly or indirectly through its officers or agents, purchased or acquired the Empire Transportation Company, or furnished the money therefor. Nor is it true that the Standard Oil Company inaugurated or began or induced any other person or corporation to inaugurate or begin a war upon the Pennsylvania Railroad Company or the Empire Transportation Company, as stated in the affidavit of Mr. Teagle. There may be a technical explanation of this affidavit, although the writer knows of none. There is certainly abundant testimony in existence that the works of Messrs. Pratt, Lockhart, and Warden, at least, had been bought long before this affidavit was made and paid for in Standard Oil Company stock and that they were working in alliance with that company. It was shown in the last chapter that on October 17, 1877, the Standard Oil paid $2,500,000 in certified checks on the purchasing price of the plant of the Empire Transportation Company. While none of the other members of the Standard Oil Company examined in 1879 was quite so sweeping in his denials, all of them evaded direct answers. The reason they gave for this evasion was that the investigations were an interference with their rights as private citizens, and that the government had no business to inquire into their methods. Consequently, when asked questions, they refused to answer by advice of counsel. Ultimately, the gentlemen did answer a great many questions. But taking the testimony all in all, through these years, it certainly is a mild characterization to say that it totally lacks in frankness. The testimony of the Standard officials before the Hepburn Commission was so evasive that the committee, in making its report, spoke bitterly of the company as a mysterious organization whose business and transactions are of such a character that its members decline giving a history or description of it lest this testimony be used to convict them of a crime. The producers certainly were right in claiming that secrecy was a characteristic of the Standard as it had been of the South Improvement Company. The new Standard Combination, like the South Improvement Company, aimed at controlling the entire refining interest. The coal oil business belongs to us, Mr. Rockefeller once told a recalcitrant refiner. His associates were saying the same on all sides. The object of the Standard Oil Company is to secure the entire refining business of the world, a member of the concern told B.F. Nye, an Ohio producer. The method the Standard depended upon to secure this control was the same as the method of the South Improvement Company, special privileges in transportation. We have seen how intelligently and persistently Mr. Rockefeller worked to secure these special privileges until, in 1877, he had made with all the trunk lines contracts which in every particular paralleled the contracts which in January 1872 Messrs. Scott, Gold, Vanderbilt, and McClellan made with the South Improvement Company. He now had a rebate on every barrel of oil he shipped, and this was given with the understanding that the railroad should allow no rebate to any other shipper unless that shipper could guarantee and furnish a quantity of oil for shipment which would, after deduction of his commission, realize to the road the same amount of profit realized from the standard trade. He also had a drawback on every barrel his rival shipped. No clause in the South Improvement Company's contract with railroads had given more offense to the oil world than that which called for a drawback to the company on the oil shipped by outsiders. It will be remembered that the beneficiaries of this contract were to receive drawbacks of a dollar six cents a barrel on all crude oil that 
outside parties shipped from the oil regions to New York, and a proportionate drawback on that shipped from other points. The rebate system was considered illegal and unjust, but men were more or less accustomed to it. The drawback on other people's shipment was a new device, and it threw the oil region into a frenzy of rage. It did not seem possible that the Standard would attempt to revive this practice again, and yet when it had got its hands strongly on the four trunk lines it made a demand for the drawback. It has already been recounted how, on February 5, 1878, four months after the Pennsylvania succumbed to the standard's demand, Mr. O'Day wrote to Mr. Cassett, I here repeat what I once stated to you, and which I wish you to receive and treat as strictly confidential, that we have been for many months receiving from the New York Central and Erie Railroads certain sums of money, in no instance less than twenty cents per barrel, on every barrel of crude oil carried by each of these roads. Cooperating as we are doing with the Standard Oil Company and the trunk lines in every effort to secure for the railroads, paying rates of freight on the oil they carry, I am constrained to say to you that in justice to the interests I represent, we should receive from your company at least twenty cents on each barrel of crude oil you transport and Mr. Cassett, after seeing the freight bills showing that both the Central and Erie allowed a drawback, gave orders that the Pennsylvania pay one of twenty-two and a half cents. When Mr. Cassett was under examination in 1874, the examiner remarked, I understand, Mr. Cassett, that this twenty-two and a half cents paid to the American Transfer Company is not restricted to all oil that passed through their lines. No, sir. It is paid on all oil received and transferred by us. Among the interesting documents presented at this inquiry was a statement of the crude oil shipments over the Pennsylvania Road for February and March, 1878. They footed up to a total of 343,767.5 barrels. On this amount, a discount of 20 cents a barrel was allowed to the Standard Oil Company through its agent, the American Transfer Company. Among other agents who shipped this oil was H. C. Olin. In all, Mr. Olin shipped 29,876 barrels, and on this the Standard Oil Company received 20 cents a barrel. That is, after Mr. Olin had paid for his oil, paid for having it carried by the pipeline to the railroad, and paid the railroad the full rate of freight without the commission the Standard received, the Pennsylvania was obliged to turn over to the Standard Oil Company twenty cents of the amount he had paid on each barrel. The examiner tried very hard to find out if there was a legitimate question why such an allowance should have been made to the American Transfer Company on oil it did not handle. We pay that, Mr. Cassett said, as a commission to them to aid in securing us our share of the trade. We pay it, said the comptroller, for procuring oil to go over the lines in which the Pennsylvania Railroad is interested as against the New York lines and the New York Central. Do you understand, the examiner questioned of one of the auditors, that the American Transfer Company secured to the Pennsylvania Road the traffic of the outside refiners of New York, mentioned in the statement quoted above? I never raised a question of that kind in my mind, answered the adroit auditor. But the answer was evident. The American Transfer Company had nothing whatever to do with the oil shipped by Mr. Olin or Ayers Lombard and Company or J. Rousseau or any one of the other independents mentioned in the statement, unless perchance that oil had come originally from the lines of the American Transfer Company. In that case, the shipper had paid the line for the service rendered at the time he bought the oil, the custom then and now. The tax was paid by the Pennsylvania solely because the Standard Oil Company had the power to demand it. The demand was made in the name of the American Transfer Company as a blind. Naturally, the proof that the Standard had revived the most obnoxious feature of the South Improvement Company aroused intense bitterness and disgust among the oil men. Another offensive clause of the 1872 contracts was that pledging the railroads to lower or raise the gross rates of transportation for such times and to such extent as might be necessary to overcome competition. Now, the new contracts of the Standard provided the same arrangement. That is, they stipulated that the rates were to be lowered if necessary, so as to place the Standard on a parity with shippers by competing lines. 
The workings of the clause were illustrated when the producers got the equitable line through in 1878, the railroads dropping their charge to 80 cents a barrel, and in some cases even less. The producers certainly had evidence enough for their claim that the contracts of the South Improvement Company and the Standard Oil Company with the railroads were similar in every particular as far as principles were concerned, that they differed alone in the amounts of the rebates and drawbacks. There was plenty of evidence brought out also to show that the object of the Standard operations was like that of the South Improvement Company, keeping up the price of refined oil. Both combinations were formed to keep the refined article scarce on the market by controlling all the refineries and by refusing to sell under competition. The officials of the South Improvement Company stated under oath that they had hoped to raise the price 50%. The central organization hoped to put up the price of refined from 15 to 25 cents. As a matter of fact, that organization, when it finally got control of the market, put up the price considerably more. The spectacular demonstration in the winter of 1876 and 1877 of what could be done in keeping up the price of refined was still rankling in the minds of the oil men. They saw that it was by that coup that the Standard had gotten the ready money to pay for the plant of the Empire Transportation Company, the money to buy in whatever it wanted, the money to pay the 50% dividend to which one of its members testified in the Ohio investigation. They remembered that while the refiners had been selling refined around 30 cents a gallon, they had sold crude at less than $4 a barrel. Little wonder, then, that they felt they had evidence that the Standard had actually done what they had always claimed it would do if it got hold of the refining interest as it planned. Even in the case where certain large producers had entered into a partnership with the Standard on condition that they paid them prices for crude commensurate with the price of refined, these producers claimed the agreement had not been kept. One of these cases came to light in a suit instituted in 1878. It seems that sometime in December 1874, the large oil company of H. L. Taylor & Company sold one-half interest in its property to the Standard Oil Company. The reason for the sale the plaintiffs stated in their complaint to be as follows. The extent of their, the Standard's business and control over pipelines and refineries, had enabled them to procure, and they had procured from the railways, more favorable terms for transportation than others could obtain. These advantages and facilities placed it within their power to obtain, and they did obtain, far better and more uniform prices of petroleum than could be obtained by the plaintiffs. The said organization and firms, by virtue of their monopoly of the business of refining and transportation of oil, had been at times almost the only buyers in the market, and at such times had been enabled to dictate and establish a price for crude oil far below its actual value as determined by prices of refined oil at same dates, and they thus obtained a large share of the profits which should have fallen to the plaintiff and other purchasers. The sale was made, and in consideration of the foregoing premises, and upon the promise and agreement on the part of the defendants that the partnership thus formed, should have the benefit of the advantage and facilities of the said defendants, and the organizations and firms managed and controlled by defendants in marketing its oil that the firm should have to the extent of its production the advantage of the sales of refined by the defendants or said standard oil company either for present or future delivery so that there should be at no time any margin or difference between the ruling price of refined oil and the price which defendants would pay the partnership for crude by it produced beyond the necessary cost of refining this thing formed the inducement and the larger part of the consideration for the sale of said property to the defendants the amount actually received for said interest was far beneath its actual value, and without the agreement on the part of the defendants to pay to the partnership for its product prices at all times commensurate with the prices of refined oil, they would not have sold the said interest nor entered into said partnership. The defendants also requested to do so have not only failed, neglected, and refused to comply with this agreement, but have, by false and erroneous statements, misled the plaintiffs and induced them to consent to the sale to them and to the Standard Oil Company of large quantities of crude petroleum produced by the partnership at prices far below its actual value, to the great loss and damage of the orators. 
that on or about December 6, 1876, refined was selling at a price equivalent to $7 for crude oil, at which time plaintiffs called upon defendants for a compliance with their agreement and asked that they take or purchase 210,000 barrels of the production of the partnership at a price commensurate with the price of refined at that time. This defendants neglected and refused to do, and the partnership was forced to sell the same at prices varying from three to four dollars, making a loss to the partnership upon this one transaction of from six hundred thousand to one million dollars, for which said defendants neglect and refuse to account. That the said defendants for themselves and for the said Standard Oil Company and other organizations and firms aforesaid have since the formation of the partnership received from the railways a rebate or drawback in the shape of wheelage or otherwise at times as high as one dollar per barrel upon all oil shipped by them to the seaboard that instead of using these advantages which they possess for the benefit and profit of the partnership as they covenanted to do they have used them against its interest by restraining trade preventing competition and forcing plaintiffs to accept any price which defendants the said standard oil company or the other organizations aforesaid might offer for their production. That the amount of oil produced and sold by the partnership for the three years beginning with the date of its formation and ending December 1, 1877, was 2,657,830 barrels of oil. That the profits of defendants upon oil refined by them during said period, taking into consideration the rebates and drawbacks received from the railways, have averaged at least one dollar per barrel over and above the cost of refining, and at times as high as four and five dollars. That these profits under the partnership agreement that no margin should exist between crude and refined prices should to the extent of the production of the partnership have been paid by defendants to the partnership. That the amount lost by the partnership and realized by the defendants, by reason of the failure and refusal of said defendants to comply with their agreement, is not less than two million five hundred thousand dollars for one half of which defendants should account to your orders but which they neglect and refuse to do so naturally enough the producers now pointed out that the case of the h l taylor company was a demonstration of what they had claimed in eighteen seventy two when the south improvement company alarmed at the uprising offered them a contract and what they had always claimed since when the Standard Oil offered contracts for oil on a sliding scale, viz. that such contracts were never meant to be kept, that they were obliged to enable the Standard to make scoops such as they had made in the winter of 1876 and 1877. Taking all these points into consideration, first, that the Standard Oil Company, like the South Improvement Company, was a secret organization. Second, that both companies were composed in the main of the same parties. Third, that it aimed, like its predecessors, at getting entire control of the refining interests. Fourth, that it used the power the combination gave it to get rebates on its own oil shipments and drawbacks on the shipments of other people. Fifth, that it had arranged contracts which compelled the railroads to run out all competition by lowering their rates. Sixth, that it aimed to put up the price of refined without allowing the producer a share of the profits. Taking all these points into consideration, many of the producers, including the president of the Petroleum Producers Union, B. B. Campbell, and certain members of his council, came to the conclusion that, as they had sufficient evidence against the members of the Standard Combination, to ensure conviction for criminal conspiracy, they should proceed against them. Strenuous opposition to the proceedings, as hastily and ill-advised, developed in the council and the legal committee, but the majority decided that the prosecution should be instituted. Mr. Scott and Mr. Cassett were omitted from the proposed indictment on the ground that they were already weary of the standard and would cease their illegal practices gladly if they could. On the twenty-ninth day of April, 1879, the grand jury of the county of Clarion found an indictment against John D. Rockefeller, William Rockefeller, Jabez A. Bostwick, Daniel O'Day, William G. Warden, Charles Lockhart, Henry M. Flagler, Jacob J. Vandergrift, and George W. Gerty. Gerty was the cashier of the Standard Oil Company. There were eight counts in the indictment and charged in brief 
a conspiracy for the purpose of securing a monopoly of the business of buying and selling crude petroleum, and to prevent others than themselves from buying and selling and making a legitimate profit thereby, a combination to oppress and injure those engaged in producing petroleum, a conspiracy to prevent others than themselves from engaging in the business of refining petroleum, and to secure a monopoly of that business for themselves a combination to injure the carrying trade of the Allegheny Valley and Pennsylvania Railroad Companies by preventing them from receiving the natural petroleum traffic, to divert the traffic naturally belonging to the Pennsylvania carriers to those of other states by unlawful means, and to extort from railroad companies unreasonable rebates and commissions, and by fraudulent means and devices to control the market prices of crude and refined petroleum and acquire unlawful gains thereby. Four of the persons mentioned in the indictment, Messrs. O'Day, Warden, Lockhart, and Vandergrift, all citizens of Pennsylvania, gave bail, and early in June application was made to Governor Hoyt of Pennsylvania to issue a requisition before the Governor of New York for the extradition of the other five gentlemen. With damaging testimony piling up day by day in three states, and with an indictment for conspiracy hanging over the heads of himself and eight of his associates, matters looked gloomy for John D. Rockefeller in the spring of 1879. The good of the oil business certainly seemed to be in danger. End of chapter 7. Recording by Tom Weiss, tomsaudiobooks.com. Chapter 8 of the History of Standard Oil, Volume 1, by Ida M. Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter 8. The Compromise of 1880. No doubt the indictment of Mr. Rockefeller in the spring of 1879 seemed to him the work of malice and spite. By seven years of persistent effort, he had worked out a well-conceived plan for controlling the oil business of the United States. Another year, and he had reason to believe that the remnant of refiners who still rebelled against his intentions would either be convinced or dead, and he could rule unimpeded. But here, at the very threshold of empire, a certain group of people, people with a private grievance, mossbacks naturally left in the lurch by the progress of this rapidly developing trade, his colleagues described them to the Hepburn Commission, stood in his way. You have taken deliberate advantage of the iniquitous practices of the railroads to build up a monopoly, they told him. We combined to overthrow those practices so far as the oil business was concerned. You not only refused to support us in this contention, you persuaded or forced the railroads to make you the only recipient of their illegal favors. More than that, you developed the unjust practices, forcing them into forms unheard of before. Not only have you secured rebates of extraordinary value on all your own shipments, you have persuaded the railroads to give you a commission on the oil that other people ship. You are guilty of plotting against the prosperity of an industry. And they indicted him with eight of his colleagues for conspiracy. The evidence on which the oil men based this serious charge has already been analyzed. At the moment they brought their suit for conspiracy, what was their situation? They had several months before driven the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to bring suits against four railroads operating within its borders and against the standard pipelines for infringing their duties as common carriers. Partial testimony had been taken in the case against the Pennsylvania Road and in that against the United Pipelines. These suits, though far from finished, had given the producers' union the bulk of the proof on which they had secured the indictment of the standard officials for conspiracy. Now, since the railroads and the pipelines were the guilty ones, that is, as it was they who had granted the illegal favors, and as they were the only ones that could surely be convicted, it seems clear that the only wise course for the producers would have been to prosecute energetically and exclusively these first suits. But evident as the necessity for such persistency was, and just after Mr. Cassett had startled the public and given the Union material with which it certainly in time could have compelled the Commonwealth to a complete investigation, 
The producers interrupted their work by bringing their spectacular suit for conspiracy, a suit which perhaps might have been properly instituted after the others had been completed, but which introduced now completely changed the situation, for it gave the witnesses from whom they were most anxious to hear a loophole for escape. For instance, the officials of the Standard Pipelines had been instructed to appear on the 14th of May, 1879, to answer questions which earlier in the trial they had refused to answer on advice of counsel. Now the president of the United Pipelines, J. J. Vandergrift, and the general manager, Daniel O'Day, were both included in the indictment for conspiracy. The evening before the interrogatory, the producer's counsel received a telegram from the attorney general of the state, announcing that the pipeline people were complaining that the testimony which they would be called on to give on the morrow would be used against them in the conspiracy trial, as it undoubtedly would have been, and that he thought it only fair that their hearing be postponed until after that suit. And so the defendants gained time, the chief desideratum of defendants who do not wish to fight. Soon after, the conspiracy case was again used to excellent advantage by the standard people, in the investigation which was being conducted in New York before the Hepburn Commission. Mr. Bostwick, the standard oil buyer, whose order to buy immediate shipment oil only at a discount had been one of the oil men's chief grievances for a year and a half, was summoned as a witness. But Mr. Bostwick, too, was under indictment for conspiracy, and when the examiners began to put questions to him which the producers were eager to have answered, he asked, how can I, a man soon to be tried for conspiracy, be expected to answer these questions? I shall incriminate myself. He was sustained in his plea, and about all the Hepburn Commission got out of him was, I refuse to answer, lest I incriminate myself. This, then, was the first fruit of the producer's hasty and vindictive suit. It had shut the mouths of the important standard witnesses. Discouraging as this discovery was, however, there was no reason why the suits against the railroads should not have been pushed through, and the testimony the officials unquestionably could be made to give, now that Mr. Cassett had set the pace, had been obtained. But the producers' union had lost sight for the moment of the fact that the fundamental difficulty in the trouble was the illegal discrimination of the common carriers. The union was so much more eager to punish Mr. Rockefeller than it was to punish the railroads, that in bringing the suit for conspiracy it was even guilty of leniency towards the officials of the Pennsylvania. Certainly, if there was to be an indictment for conspiracy, all the supposed conspirators should have been included. It was by discriminations clearly contrary to the Constitution of the State that the Pennsylvania Railroad had made it possible for Mr. Rockefeller to achieve his monopoly in Pennsylvania. The Union had proof of these rebates, but they let off Mr. Scott and Mr. Cassett because they professed the greatest desire to get rid of standard domination, and were loudly asserting that they had been victimized and compelled at times to carry oil freights at less than cost. Evidently the fate of the settlement the oil men had made seven years before with Mr. Scott and the presidents of the other oil-bearing roads had been forgotten. Naturally enough, the railroads took advantage of these signs of leniency on the part of the producers and brought all their enormous influence to bear on the state authorities to delay hearings and bring about a settlement. The Pennsylvania secured delays up to December 1879, and then the governor ordered the attorney general to stop proceedings against the road until the testimony had been taken in the other four cases, that is, in the cases against, one, the United Pipelines, two, the Lake Shore and Michigan Southern, three, the Dunkirk, Allegheny, and Pittsburgh, and four, the Atlantic and Great Western. It was a heavy blow to the Union, for at the moment its hands were tied by the conspiracy case, as far as the United Pipelines were concerned, and the three railroads were foreign corporations, only having branches in Pennsylvania, and accordingly very difficult to reach. The testimony could have been obtained, however, if the Union had been undivided in its interest. It would have been done, of course, if the state authorities had been willing to do what was their obvious duty. But the state authorities really asked nothing better than to escape further prosecution of the railroads. The administration was Republican, the governor being Henry M. Hoyt. 
Mr. Hoyt had been elected in the fall of 1878, and so had inherited the suits from Governor Hartram. He was pledged, however, to see them through, for before the election the Producers' Union had sent him the following letter. Titusville, October 23, 1878. Henry M. Hoyt. Sir, during the past few months the Association of Producers of Petroleum, long oppressed in their immediate business and kindred industries by the persistent disregard of law by certain great corporations exercising their powers within the state of Pennsylvania, and daily subjected to incalculable loss by a powerful and corrupt combination of these corporations and individuals, have appealed to the executive, legislative, and judiciary branches of the government for relief and protection. The questions which they raise for the consideration of the authorities and the people affect not only themselves, but the whole public, not only the particular calling in which they are engaged, but nearly all kinds of business in the commonwealth and the nation. The legislature has not responded to the demands made that the provisions of the Constitution shall be speedily enforced by appropriate legislation. The present executive has caused proceedings to be instituted in the courts looking to relief, if it can be had by process of law, and these are still pending while others may be begun. In view of the grave duties which will devolve upon you, should you be chosen to the high office to which you aspire, in behalf of the Petroleum Producers Association, I ask from you a definite expression of your views upon the following subjects. First, will you, if elected, recommend to the legislature the passage of laws to carry into effect the third and twelfth sections of the sixteenth and the third, seventh, and twelfth sections of the seventeenth articles of the Constitution of Pennsylvania? Second, if such laws should be passed as referred to in the preceding question, will you, as governor, approve them if constitutional? Third, will you, as governor, recommend and approve such other remedial legislation as may be required to cure the evil set forth in a memorial to Governor Hartramp of August 15, 1878? Fourth, in the selection of a law officer of the state, will you, if elected, secure the services of one who will prosecute with vigor all proceedings already commenced or that may be instituted, having in view the subjection of corporations to the laws of the land. Very respectfully, A. N. Perrin, Chairman Committee. Governor Hoyt's answers were eminently satisfactory. There were provisions in the Constitution, he wrote, intended to compel the railroad and canal companies of the state to the performance of their duties as common carriers with fairness and equality, without discrimination, to all persons doing business over their lines. This policy is just and right. If called to a position requiring official action, I would recommend and approve any legislation necessary and appropriate to carry into effect the sections of the Constitution referred to. It would be my duty, if elected, to see that no citizen, or class of citizens even, were subjected to hardship or injustice in their business by illegal acts of corporations or others where relief lay within executive control. Any proper measures or legislation which would effectually remedy the grievances set forth in the memorial addressed to Governor Hartramp would receive my recommendation and approval. It would be my duty, if elected, to select only officers as would enforce obedience to the Constitution and laws, both by corporations and individuals, without fear or favor, and all such officers would be held by me to strict accountability for the full and prompt discharge of all their official duties. Governor Hoyt had indeed begun the suits, all of the testimony in regard to the Pennsylvania having been taken in his administration. This testimony must have proved to him that the transgressions of the road had been far more flagrant than anyone dreamed of, that they had amounted simply to driving certain men out of business in order to build up the business of certain other men. His evident duty, as his letter to the producers shows clearly enough that he realized, was to push the suits against the railroads, even if the oil men entirely withdrew. But instead of that it became evident in the spring that he was using every opportunity to delay. Indeed, one reason the producers gave for bringing the conspiracy suit was that it would give the state authorities a scapegoat, that they would gladly act vigorously against the standard 
if they were let off from prosecuting the Pennsylvania. Governor Hoyt now availed himself fully of the vacillation of the Union toward the railroads, using it as an excuse for not prosecuting the railroad cases. But if the producers were half-hearted toward the railroads, they were whole-hearted enough toward the standard. In spite of the fact that they had gotten in their own way, so to speak, by bringing their conspiracy suit, they felt convinced that they had enough material to win it on, and they sought the extradition of the non-residents who had been indicted. Early in June, Governor Hoyt was called upon to issue a requisition for the extradition of John D. Rockefeller, William Rockefeller, H. M. Flagler, J. A. Bostwick, Daniel O'Day, Charles Pratt, and G. W. Gertie. A full agreement was made before the state officials, but a decision was deferred repeatedly. Finally worn out with waiting, Mr. Campbell, in a telegram to the governor on July 29, threatened, if there was longer delay, to make his request for extradition through the public press. The answer from Harrisburg was that the attorney general was sick and could not attend to the matter. Mr. Campbell wired back that he was tired of addition, division, and silence, and he sent out the following letter. Fairfield, July 31, 1879. To His Excellency Henry M. Hoyt, Governor of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Sir, on behalf of the producers of oil, whom I represent as President of their General Council, I most respectfully ask a decision at your hands of the requisition on the Governor of the State of New York for the surrender of the officers of the Standard Oil Company, indicted by the Grand Jury of Clarion County, and now believed to be within limits of the State of New York. The case was exhaustively argued before you more than four weeks ago, and the great oil interest which I have the honor to represent has a right to a prompt decision on this vital question. If these parties, who for their own profit and its ruin control Pennsylvania's most valuable product, and compel its greatest carrier to undertake their warfare and to do their bidding at the sacrifice of its innocent stockholders, can, under the plea of being aliens, defy the law of Pennsylvania and laugh at our impotent attempts to reach them, the sooner it is known, the better. It is possible that if we are denied protection within the limits of our commonwealth, we may obtain justice by appealing to the courts of a sister state where at least the defendants will be obliged to admit that they are residents. Your obedient servant, B. B. Campbell, President of Producers' Council. The governor remained obdurate, nor was the request ever granted. In a message sent out in January 1881, Governor Hoyt gave a review of the case, as he was compelled to do, so great was the popular criticism of his course in not pushing the suits and in refusing the request for extradition, in which he attributed his refusal to the negotiations begun between the railroads and the producers' union. The writer has examined all the private correspondence which passed at this time between the litigants, but finds no proof of Governor Hoyt's statement that the union at one time ceased its demands for Mr. Rockefeller's extradition. The conspiracy suit had been set for the August session of the Clarion County Court. When August came, the Standard sought a continuance, and it was granted. The delay did not in any way discourage the producers, and when Mr. Rockefeller became convinced of this, he tried conciliation. Come, let us reason together, has always been a favorite proposition of Mr. Rockefeller. He would rather persuade than coerce, rather silence than fight. He had been making peace overtures ever since the suits began. The first had been in the fall of 1878, soon after they were instituted, when he sent the following letter to Captain Vandergriff, Captain J. J. Vandergriff. My dear sir, we are now prepared to enter into a contract to refine all the petroleum that can be sold in the markets of the world at a low price for refining. Prices of refined oil to be made by a joint committee of producers and refiners and the profits to be determined by these, profits to be divided equitably between both parties, this joint interest to have the lowest net rates obtainable from railroads. If your judgment approves, you may consult some of the producers upon this question. This would probably require the United Pipelines to make contracts and act as a clearinghouse for both parties. Very respectfully yours, J. D. Rockefeller. Captain Vandergriff handed the letter to the executive committee of the Producers' Union. 
it was returned to him without a reply. The producers had tried an arrangement of this kind with Mr. Rockefeller's National Refiners Association in the winter of 1872 and 1873, and it had failed. The refiners had thrown up their contract when they found they could get all the oil they wanted at a lower price than they had contracted to pay the producers' union from men who had not gone into that organization. The oil country was familiar, too, with the case of the H. L. Taylor Company, whose complaint against the Standard was referred to in the last chapter. Contracts of that sort were never meant to be kept, they declared. They were meant as SOPs, opiates. In November 1878, after the testimony which had been brought out by the suit against the United Pipelines had been pretty well aired in the New York Sun and other papers, and one or two private suits against the railroads were creating a good deal of public discussion, an effort to secure a conference between the representatives of the Union and the Standard officials was made. The Union refused to go into it officially. A meeting was held, however, in New York on November 29, at which several well-known oil men were present. It was announced to the press in advance that it was to be an important but secret meeting between the oil producers, refiners, and Standard men, that its object was to settle all grievances and to secure a withdrawal of the impending suits. As soon as the news of this proposed meeting reached the oil regions, the officials of the Union promptly denied their connection with it. Although these early efforts to get a wedge into the Producers' Union and thus secure a staying of the suits had no results, the Standard was not discouraged. It never is. There is no evidence in its history that it knows what the word means. Not being able to handle the Union as a whole, the Standard began working on individuals. By March 1879, the idea of a compromise had become particularly strong in Oil City. Indeed, one of the several reasons advanced for bringing the conspiracy suits was that such a proceeding would defeat the efforts the Oil City branch were making to bring about a settlement with Mr. Rockefeller. Accordingly, when it became apparent to Mr. Rockefeller in the fall of 1879, that the producers meant to fight through the conspiracy suit, though they might dally over the others, he notified Roger Sherman, counsel for the Union, that he wished to lay before him a proposition looking to a settlement. The President, Mr. Campbell, was in favor of receiving the proposition. "'I have no idea they will present anything we can accept,' he wrote Mr. Sherman. "'Still it will furnish a first-rate gauge to test how badly they are scared and the Standard was told that the Union would consider what they had to offer. But it is a serious question, this of settlement, replied Mr. Rockefeller. Our trial is set for October 28th. We cannot get ready for that and prepare a proposition, too. Why not postpone the trial? This was done, December 15 being set. But no proposition was made to the producers for over six weeks. Then they were asked to meet the Standard men on November 29 in New York City. Peaked at the delay, the producers informed the Standard that they could no longer consider their proposition and that the trial would be pushed. But again the Standard secured delay, this time by petitioning that the case be argued before the Supreme Court of the state. They declared that such was the state of public feeling in Clarion County that they could not obtain justice there. They charged the judges with bias and prejudice, declared secret societies were working against them, and called attention to the civil suits which were still hanging fire. Over this petition serious trouble arose in court. There was a wrangle between the judge and the Standards Council. The newspapers took it up. The whole state divided itself into camps, and the case was again postponed, this time until the first of the year. Postponement obtained compromise was again proposed upon the basis of abandonment of all those methods of doing business which the producers claimed injured them, and as a mark of their sincerity, the United Pipelines on December 24, 1879, issued an order announcing the abandonment of immediate shipment throughout the region. A meeting between the legal advisers of the two parties to discuss the proposed terms was arranged for January 7, 1880, at the Fifth Avenue Hotel in New York City, the very time to which the trial of the case for conspiracy had been postponed. 
It was hardly to be expected that when such negotiations were going on in New York, the trial in Clarion County would be pushed very briskly. It was not. There was a hitch again, and for the fourth time proceedings were stayed. The conferences, however, went on. These negotiations with the Standard continued for a month, and then, early in February, Mr. Campbell, the President of the Union, called a meeting of the Grand Council for February 19, 1880, in Titusville, Pennsylvania. For several weeks the oil regions had known that President Campbell and Roger Sherman, the leading lawyer of the Union, were in conference with the Standard officials. It was rumored that they were arranging a compromise, and it was suspected that the meeting now called was to consider the terms. Naturally the proposition to be made was looked for with suspicion and curiosity. The meeting was the largest the Grand Council had held for many months. It was supposed to be secret, like all gatherings of the Union, but before the first session was over the word spread over the oil regions that Mr. Campbell had brought to the meeting contracts with both Mr. Rockefeller and Mr. Scott, and that they were receiving harsh criticism from the Grand Council. The very meager accounts which exist of this gathering, historic in oil annals, show that it was one of the most exciting which was ever held in the country, and one can well believe this when one considers the bitter pill the council was asked to swallow that day. Mr. Campbell began the session by reporting that all the suits at which they had been laboring for nearly two years had been withdrawn, and that in return for their withdrawal the Standard and the Pennsylvania Railroad officials had signed contracts to cease certain of the practices of which the producers complained. The Standard contract which Mr. Campbell then presented pledged Mr. Rockefeller and some sixteen associates, whose names were attached to the document, to the following policy. 1. They would hereafter make no opposition to an entire abrogation of the system of rebates, drawbacks, and secret rates of freight in the transportation of petroleum on the railroads. 2. They withdrew their opposition to secrecy in rate-making, that is, they promised they would not hereafter receive any rebate or drawback that the railroad company was not at liberty to make known and to give to other shippers of petroleum. 3. They abandoned entirely the policy which they had been pursuing in the management of the United Pipelines. That is, they promised that there should be no discrimination whatever hereafter between their patrons, that the rates should be reasonable and not advanced except on thirty days' notice, that they would make no difference between the price of crude in different districts excepting such as might be properly based upon the difference in the quality of the oil that they would receive transport store and deliver all oil tendered to them up to a production of sixty five thousand barrels a day and if the production should exceed that amount they agreed that they would not purchase any so-called immediate shipment oil at a discount on the price of certificate oil four they promised hereafter that when certificates had been given for oil taken into the custody of the pipelines the transfer of these certificates should be considered as a delivery of the oil, and the tankage of the seller would be treated as free. Mr. Rockefeller also agreed in making this contract to pay the producers' union $40,000 to cover the expense of their litigation. In return for this money, and for the abandonment of secret rebates, and of the pipeline policy to which he had held so strenuously, what was he to receive? He was not to be tried for conspiracy and that day, after the contract had been presented to the Grand Council, Mr. Campbell sent the following telegram. Titusville, February 19, 1880. To His Excellency Henry M. Hoyt, Governor of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Sir, as prosecutor in the case of the Commonwealth v. J. D. Rockefeller, No. 25, April Sessions of Clarion County, I consent to the withdrawal of the requisition asked of you for extradition of J. D. Rockefeller at all, the same having been in your hands undecided since July last, and a noli prosequi having been entered by leave of court of Clarion County in the case, and I will request William L. Hindman, the prosecuting attorney, to forward a formal withdrawal. Your obedient servant, B. B. Campbell. The contract which was signed by Mr. Scott agreed, in consideration of the withdrawal of the suit against the road, to the following policy. 1. That it would make known to all shippers all rates of freight charged upon petroleum. 
this was an abolition of secret rates. 2. If any rates of freight were allowed one shipper as against another, on demand that rate was to be made known. 3. There should be no longer any discrimination in the allotment and distribution of cars to shippers of petroleum. 4. Any rebate allowed to a large shipper was to be reasonable. There were both humiliation and bitterness in the council when the report was read, humiliation and bitterness that after two years of such strenuous fighting all that was achieved was a contract which sacrificed what everybody knew to be the fundamental principle, the principle which up to this point the producers had always insisted must be recognized in any negotiation, that the rebate system was wrong and must not be compromised with. Hard speeches were made, and Mr. Campbell's head was bowed more than once while big tears ran down his cheeks. He had worked long and hard. Probably most of the members of the Grand Council who were present had a consciousness that no one of them had done anywhere near what Mr. Campbell had done toward prosecuting their case, and though they might object to the compromise, they could not blame him, knowing all the difficulties which had been put in the way. So they accepted the report, thanking him for his fidelity and energy, but not failing to express their disapproval of the reservation in regard to the rebate system. They ended their meeting by a resolution bitterly condemning the courts, the state administration at Harrisburg, and corporations in general. We declare that by the inefficiency and weakness of the Secretary of Internal Affairs in the year 1878, by the interposition on more than one occasion of the Attorney General in 1879, by which the taking of testimony was prevented, by the failure of the present government for many months either to grant or deny the requisition for criminals indicted for crime within the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, fugitives to other states, and by the interference of some of the judges of the Supreme Court, by an extraordinary and, according to the best legal judgment of the land, unlawful proceeding by which the trial of an indictment for misdemeanor pending in a local court was delayed and prevented, the alarming and most dangerous influence of powerful corporations has been demonstrated. While we accept the inevitable result forced upon us by these influences, we aver that the contest is not over and our objects not attained. But we all continue to advocate and maintain the subordination of all corporations to the laws, the Constitution, and the will of the people, however and whenever expressed. That the system of freight discrimination by common carriers is absolutely wrong in principle and tends to the fostering of dangerous monopolies and that it is the duty of the government, by legislation and executive action, to protect the people from their growing and dangerous power. And with this resolution, the Second Petroleum Producers Union, formed to fight Mr. Rockefeller, came to an end. By the morning of February 20, the oil regions knew of the compromise. The news was received in sullen anger. It was due to the cowardice of the state officials the corrupting influence of corporations, the oil men said. They blamed everybody but themselves. And yet, if they had done their duty, the suits would never have been compromised. The simple fact is that the mass of oil men had not stood by their leaders in the hard fight they had been making. These leaders, Mr. Campbell the President, Mr. Sherman the Chief Counsel, and Mr. Patterson the head of the Legislative Committee, had given almost their entire time for two years to the work of the Union. The offices of Mr. Campbell and Mr. Patterson were both honorary, and they had both often used their private funds in prosecuting their work. Mr. Sherman gave his services for months at a time without pay. No one outside of the Council of the Union knew the stress that came upon these three men. Up to the decision to institute the conspiracy suit, they had worked in harmony but when that was decided upon, Mr. Patterson withdrew. He saw how fatal such a move must be, how completely it interfered with the real work of the Union, forcing common carriers to do their duty. He saw that the substantial steps gained were given up, and that the work would all have to be done over again if their suit went on. Mr. Campbell believed in it, however, and Mr. Sherman, whether he believed in it or not, saw no way but to follow his chief. The nine months of disappointment and disillusion which followed were terrible for both men. 
they soon saw that the forces against them were too strong, that they would never in all probability be able to get the conspiracy suit tried, and that so long as it was on the docket the proper witnesses could not be secured for the suits against the railroads. Finally it came to be a question with them what out of the wreck of their plans and hopes could they save, and they saved what the compromise granted. If the oil producers they represented, a body of some two thousand men, had stood behind them throughout 1879 as they did in 1878, the results would have been different. Their power, their means, were derived from this body, and this body for many months had been giving them feeble support. Scattered as they were over a great stretch of country, interested in nothing but their own oil farms, the producers could only be brought into an alliance by hope of overturning disastrous business conditions. They all felt that the monopoly the Standard had achieved was a menace to their interests, and they went willingly into the Union at the start, and supported it generously. But they were an impatient people, demanding quick results, and when they saw that the relief the Union promised could only come through lawsuits and legislation, which it would take perhaps years to finish, they lost interest and refused money. At the first meeting of the Grand Council of the Union in November 1878, there were nearly two hundred delegates present. At the last one in February 1880, scarcely forty. Many of the local lodges were entirely dead. Not even the revival in the summer of 1879 of the hated immediate shipment order, which had caused so much excitement the year before, but which had not been enforced long because of the uprising, brought them back to the Union. In July the order had been put in operation again in a fashion most offensive to the oil men, it being announced by the United Pipelines that thereafter oil would be bought by a system of sealed bids. Blanks were to be furnished to producers, the formula of which ran. Bradford, Pennsylvania, 1870. I hereby offer to sell J. A. Bostwick X barrels crude oil of forty two gallons per barrel at X cents at the wells for shipment from the United Pipelines within the next five days, provided that any portion of the oil not delivered to you within a specified time shall be considered cancelled. This was a frightful uproar in consequence. The morning after this announcement several hundred men gathered in front of the United Pipelines office in Bradford and held an open-air meeting. They had a band on the ground which played Hold the Fort, and the following resolutions were adopted. Resolved that the oil producers of the northern district in meeting assembled do maintain and declare that the present shipment order is infamous in principle and disreputable in practice, and we hereby declare that we will not sell one barrel of oil in conformity with the requirements of the said order, and we pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor to resort to every legal means to use every influence in our power to prevent any sales under the said order and we also declare that the United Pipelines shall hereafter perform their duty as common carriers under the law. That night a battalion of some three hundred masked men in robes of white marched through the streets of Bradford, groaning those that they suspected of being in sympathy with the standard methods and cheering their friends. Again there appeared there that night all over the upper oil country cabalistic signs which had been seen there often the year before. The feeling was so intense and the danger of riot so great that twenty-four hours after the order for sealed bids was given it was withdrawn. The outbreak aroused Mr. Campbell's hope that it might be possible at this moment to arouse the lodges, and he wrote a prominent oil man of Bradford asking his opinion. In reply he received the following letter. It shows very well what the leaders had to contend against. It shows, too, the point of view of a very frank and intelligent oil producer. Bradford, Pennsylvania, July 30, 1879. B. B. Campbell, Parnassus, Pennsylvania. Dear Sir, your dispatch of yesterday from O.C. has only just reached me. As I cannot say what I want to over the wires, I reply by mail. You ask if the high-sounding wording of the Declaration of Rights of the producers made at their mass meeting held here on Monday, in which they pledged their lives, fortunes, and sacred honors, means liberal subscriptions to the council funds. I reply with sorrow and humiliation. I fear not. 
all this high-flown talk is bunkum of the worst kind. The producers are willing to meet in a mass meeting held out of doors, where it costs nothing even for the rent of a hall, and pass any kind of a resolution that is offered. It costs nothing to do this, but when asked to contribute a dollar to the legal prosecution of these plunderers, robbers, and fugitives from justice, whom they are denouncing in their resolution, they either positively refuse, say that the council is doing nothing, that the suits are interminable and will never end, that there is no justice to be obtained in the courts of Pennsylvania, etc., etc., or else plead poverty and say they have contributed all that they are able to. True, the producers are poor, and the suits and legal proceedings are slow, and there is much to discourage them. But I tell you, my honored chief, that the true inwardness of this state of affairs is that the people of the oil regions have by slow degrees and early stages been brought into a condition of bondage and serfdom by the monopoly until now when they have been aroused to a realization of their condition they have not the courage or manhood left to enable them to strike a blow for liberty. And these are the people for whom you and your few faithful followers in the council are laboring, spending, I fear wasting, your substance, neglecting your own interests to advance theirs, and all for what good, que bono? I fear you will say that I am discouraged. No, not discouraged but disgusted with the poor, spiritless, and faint-hearted people whom you are laboring so hard to liberate from bondage. As to the prospects of raising funds for the prosecution of the suits by subscription or assessments on the unions, I am sorry to say that I fear it is impossible. At least it is impossible for me to make any collections. And right here let me make a suggestion. I often feel that the fault may not be with the people, but with the writer. I would therefore suggest that you select from among the members of the council any good man whom you think has the power of convincing these people that their only hope of relief lies in sustaining you in the prosecution of the suits, and therefore they must contribute to the fund. If you will do this, I will promise you that he will be hospitably received and favorably introduced by the writer. But as for deciding on the unaided efforts of myself to raise funds, I fear it would be useless. I do not write this, my friend, with a view of throwing any discouragement in your path which God knows is rugged and thorny enough, but I must give vent to my righteous indignation in some way, and ask you are the producers as a class, nothing but a damned cowardly disorganized mob as they are, worth the efforts you are putting forth to save them. As for myself, a single individual, and I can speak for no others, I am determined to stand with you until the end, with my best strength and my last dollar. Now what was this loose and easily discouraged organization opposing? A compact body of a few able, cold-blooded men, men to whom anything was right that they could get, men knowing exactly what they wanted, men who loved the game they played because of the reward of the goal, and above all, men who knew how to hold their tongues and wait. To Mr. Rockefeller, they say in the oil regions, a day is as a year, and a year is a day. He can wait, but he never gives up. Mr. Rockefeller knew the producers, knew how feeble their staying qualities in anything but the putting down of oil wells, and he might have said confidently at the beginning of their suits against him, as it was reported he did say, that they would never be finished. They had not been finished from any lack of material. If the suits had been pushed, but one result was possible, and that was the conviction of both the Standard and the railroads. They had been left unfinished because of the impatience and instability of the prosecuting body and the compactness, resolution, and watchfulness of the defendants. The withdrawal of the suits was a great victory for Mr. Rockefeller. There was no longer any doubt of his power in defensive operations. Having won the victory, he quickly went to work to make it secure. The Union had surrendered, but the men who had made the Union remained. The evidence against him was piled up in indestructible records. In time the same elements which had united to form the serious opposition just overthrown might come together, and if they should it was possible they would not a second time make the mistake of vacillation. The press of the oil regions was largely independent, it had lost, to be sure, the audacity, the wit, 
the irrepressible spirit of eight years before when it fought the South Improvement Company. Its discretion had outstripped its courage, but there were still signs of intelligent independence in the newspapers. Mr. Rockefeller now entered on a campaign of reconciliation which aimed to placate or silence every opposing force. Many of the great tragedies of the oil regions lie in the individual compromises which followed the public settlement of 1880. For then it was that man after man, from hopelessness, from disgust, from ambition, from love of money, gave up the fight for principle which he had waged for seven years. The Union has surrendered, they said. Why fight on? This man took a position with the Standard and became henceforth active in its business. That man took a salary and dropped out of sight. This one went his independent way, but with closed lips. That one shook the dust of the oil regions from his feet and went out to seek God's country, asking only that he should never again hear the word oil. The newspapers bowed to the victor. A sudden hush came over the region, the hush of defeat, of cowardice, of hopelessness. Only the poor producer grumbled. You can't satisfy the producer, Mr. Rockefeller often has had occasion to remark benignantly and pitifully. The producer alone was not convinced. He still rehearsed the series of dramatic attack and sieges which had wiped out independent effort. He taught his children that the cause had been sold, and he stigmatized the men who had gone over to the Standard as traitors. Scores of boys and girls grew up in the oil regions in those days, with the same feeling of terrified curiosity toward those who had sold to the Standard that they had towards those who had been in jail. The oil regions as a whole was at heart as irreconcilable in 1880 as it had been after the South Improvement Company fight, and now it had added to its sense of outrage the humiliation of defeat. Its only immediate hope now was in the success of one of the transportation enterprises which had come into existence with the uprising of 1878 and to which it had been for two years giving what support it could. This enterprise was the seaboard pipeline which, as we have seen, Messrs. Benson, McKelvey, and Hopkins had undertaken. This is the end of The History of Standard Oil, Volume 1, recording by Tom Weiss, tomsaudiobooks.com.